Hey, this is Matt Cox, and uh, I'm going to kind of go over my story. I've gone over my story uh, before on Concrete and Valuetainment and Vlad TV and, and a bunch of other, a bunch of other uh, YouTube uh, channels, but I've never really gone over my story on my channel. And what I wanted to do was kind of go over the story almost, you know, not, I don't know if necessarily it's chapter by chapter, but... I want to go over it in a longer form than the typical 20 minute or hour or two hour, uh, you know, format. I wanted to go through it, kind of take my time and go through the story. And so uh, basically, if you don't know anything about me, I basically, I was, I was on the run for three, well, I was a mortgage broker. I started committing mortgage fraud. Uh, I ran a bunch of different real estate related scams and credit card scams. And ultimately I ended up going on the run and I was uh, kind of, you know, I was, you know, on the secret services, most wanted list. I was on the FBI's most wanted list. And I was, uh, I was on the run for three years and eventually I got caught and I went to prison. So that's essentially kind of, you know, this, this story and, and how those events unfolded. Uh, so I think I'll start with by saying, you know, that uh, I was raised in Tampa, Florida, and I was raised in, and I was actually raised in Temple Terrace, which is a separate city, but so it's kind of like almost like a, a suburb slash city of Tampa. I never really say Temple Terrace because nobody knows where Temple Terrace is. Essentially, it's Florida. I mean, essentially, it's Tampa. So basically raised in, in, uh, in Temple Terrace, and, and uh, you know, my, I was raised by a, a strict Catholic mother, uh, my dad was, he was never really that religious. Uh, my father had a, a, you know, he had an alcohol problem and I was, it's funny, like my mother, my, my mother and father, uh, my mother was unable to have children. She was, uh, she was back then they used to call it being barren. Uh, you know, she just, she wasn't able to get pregnant and they tried for, for years when they first got married and eventually they, they, they adopted, uh, I have a, a sister named Katie, and they adopted my sister Helen. Then they adopted my brother like a year later. They adopted my brother. His name is Mark. Then they adopted uh, Katie, which was my closest sibling. And then, you know, about eight, ten years went by, and my mother at the age of, I think she was 39 or almost 40, she went in for a hysterectomy. And back then, you know, back then you became, you were 40 years old and women were, you know, this is back in the 60s. They basically were, it was kind of standard. You were, you were in your 40s, you went in for a hysterectomy. So she went in for a hysterectomy and when the doctor opened her up, he noticed that her ovaries were spongy and he realized, hey, it, did we give this woman a, a pregnancy test? And they were like, well, no, she's not able to get pregnant. So they gave her a pregnancy test while she was sitting right, laying right there unconscious on the table, came back, said she was pregnant. So they stitched her up. And when she woke up, my, you know, she woke up and my dad was there and he said, uh, my mom said, how'd the surgery go? And, and he said, not as expected. So he said, you know, you're pregnant. And she was like, I came in for a hysterectomy. What are you talking about? And so whatever it was, you know, seven, eight months later, uh, I, w I was born. And so, you know, my brothers and sisters were adopted and I was a, a you know, whatever you want to call it, natural born child. And my, like I said, my father had kind of a, an alcohol, not kind of an alcohol. My father was a drunk. He had an alcohol problem. Like I'm beating around the bush. Like he was a drunk. Okay. So he had an alcohol problem. He had a problem with pills. Uh, he was narcissistic, extremely arrogant, overbearing. And I was, you know, not, I think not the son he wanted. Uh, you know, I grew up and I remember, you know, he, he would get drunk and he would call, you know, he'd call me and my brother stupid and say we'd never be anything. And then he would call my, you know, brother, my, my sisters, he'd call them names. And, you know, he was just a, a, a nasty drunk. And then he'd sober up and he'd be great for three or four months or six months. And he would, he would be great. And he worked for a state farm insurance as a manager. He was an amazing manager. He was a great salesperson, a great sale, a great manager, uh, hired, you know, trained uh, agents. And I forget what he had, like 25 agents. He was always winning awards, always doing well, made a, a great deal of money. And I think watching him, he was, he did so well that 
even when State Farm realized that he had a major drinking problem, you know, they they would send him to rehabs. Like they didn't fire him. He'd show up at a meeting drunk. And they wouldn't fire him because he he was one of the leading managers and had the was running one of the leading sales teams of agents uh, in the nation. So instead of firing him, they just kept putting him into rehabs and they'd sober him up and he'd be good for a year or two. And then he, or he really, they would think he was good for a year or two. The truth is he would still go on these, uh, these uh, benders. And uh, I, I remember one time they, one time they were going to get a divorce. Uh, my mom was wanted to get a divorce. My dad wouldn't stop drinking. He was just being a dick. And I remember he drove us out to the projects and told us the whole family and told the whole family that he could afford two of these houses, which really, honestly, looking back, wasn't true. Uh, but he was saying he could afford two of these houses and we would all live in the projects if my mom left him. <laughs> what a dick. Uh, and, you know, and I was a little kid, too. I remember he, he was like, and you guys will all have to decide who you want to live with. And I remember th- saying, my mom, mom, I want to live with mom immediately. Uh, really, you know, one minute I just loved my father to death and the next minute I just despised him. And he was just belligerent and he bullied my mother and all of us. He was just a dick. And so, you know, I just know I never lived up to what he wanted in a son. And although I was smart, you know, I I tested high on all the IQ tests that I took and all the oral exams that I would take, uh, you know, I, I did great. But as far as reading and writing, I did very poorly. I, I had a learning disability. He ended up putting me, they ended up putting me into a couple different schools for kids with learning disabilities. And, you know, I still just didn't do very well. Uh, eventually, I, I ended up graduating high school and I went to college. I, what did I get? I tried to get a business degree. I started with a business degree, but I remember I failed like accounting. No, I didn't fail it. I almost failed accounting too. I got like a C in accounting too. And I almost failed. To be honest, I really did fail it. I really got like a 68 or a 69. And the teacher said, let's round up so I don't have to see you next semester. And I was like, let's do that. And so he rounded up to like 70. And it was like, it was like one of the only C's I ever got. So I switched my, I remember thinking, well, I'll never be able to pass like micro economics and macroeconomics and all these other courses that you had to take to get a business degree. It was just like, that was just never going to happen. Uh, and what I did was I switched to art and I ended up getting a degree in art because I've always been very artistic. I graduated, I remember I graduated, so I graduated high school. Well, I'm sorry, when I graduated college, graduated college in like 95. And I was dating a chick that was working as a stripper. She actually, we actually lived together for several years. So we, we'd been living together a few years. Her name was Chrissy. And so I graduated. I, I first I went and worked for, uh, I went and worked for a company that was, a couple different companies that were uh, insurance companies as an insurance adjuster. So I, ultimately, I thought I was going to be an insurance agent, which I wasn't. I never did. Never That never happened. Uh, I kept taking the aptitude test for these companies to be an agent, and they kept, you know, the aptitude test was like, well, look, he's just not a good fit for being a salesperson. So I ended up being a, a, an insurance adjuster, and I did that for like a year or so, and then eventually I got laid off, and then I started working construction. I could barely pay my bills. And But my girlfriend at the time was working for a company called Eagle Lending. And Eagle Lending did subprime loans. You know, you have conventional loans. This is basically when you walk into Bank of America and they give you a regular type loan where the the, the Fed sets the standard. And so those are, those are conventional or um, they're basically, they're called conventional uh, loans. And so you, then you have subprime loans. So subprime loans are where the bank itself comes up with their own underwriting guidelines and it's not backed by the fed and this company did they did uh, subprime loans and she was actually doing okay at it she wasn't doing great but she had just started with the company and she had met the owner of the company which is a guy named kelly aarons she'd actually met him uh, at the strip club believe it or not because i know i know what you're thinking connor you're thinking i know that you meet a stripper at a strip club and you think, hey, 
this is the kind of girl that needs to be uh, working as a mortgage broker for my company. Well, believe it or not, that's really probably not true. So, uh, but he met her there and she was getting, she was in college and she was getting her degree in finance. So Kelly ended up hiring Chrissy to work for his company, Eagle Lending. And then when, you know, she came home and, you know, after working there for a while, she came home and she was like, look, you, you got to work. You got to work here. You got to come work at this place. So Christy was working for, for Eagle Lending. And so she, she comes home after working there for whatever, a few weeks. And she says, listen, you've got to do this. You have to quit this job. You're working construction. You, you have got to come work at Eagle. You got to be a mortgage broker. You'd be great at it. You were made for this. And I remember thinking like, I, I, there's no way I was going to be able to keep up with the paperwork. And I was like, look, I can't do the paperwork. I don't know. The learning disability, I barely read and write. And she said, no, no. She said, the processors, the processors do all the paperwork. All you have to do is take an application. It's not that hard. Uh, and she said, and you're going to be, you would be great at structuring deals. You're creative. You're smart. You could do this and you're personable. Uh, you're, you know, you can do this. And I, so I went, I met with Kelly and Kelly said, yeah, I'll definitely, I'll, I'll hire you. He talked to me for a little bit and he, they flew me up to, they flew me up to North Carolina for like a week and they put me through a training course and I came back down and within a couple of weeks, I, I was closing, I was going to close my first loan. My first loan, I had, I had run some ads. I had taken uh, called some real estate agents. I was putting out signs. I got this, this, uh, a girl that wanted to buy a house. I, I had a real estate agent. We found her a ha house. I got her the loan. I, I put together a loan package. And I remember I went into my manager's office and her name was, uh, her name was Gretchen Zayas. So I walked into Gretchen's office and I gave her the package and she had to look at the package right like you need w-2s pay stubs uh you need cancel checks or you need a verification of rent you need a verification of deposit like you needed all these things in the package before you could send it up to underwriting so they could look at it and determine if they're going to lend her your customer the, the month the loan so i get there and i i give the package to to gretchen and she opens it up. This is my manager. And she starts looking through the pages. Looks at one page and another one. And as she was looking, she's like, that's good. That's good. She took one page out and she put it to the side. And then she kept looking and looking. And then she goes, man, it looks perfect. And I was like, I looked at the one. I said, well, what about this? She goes, well, this is a ver your verification of rent. I went, right, right. And she said, you never looked at it, did you? And I went, N well, I mean, no. The processor sent it off. The management company mailed it back. She says she's been, she was at her last place two or three years. She paid her rent. She's like, she did pay her rent, but she has a 30 day late payment. So my customer had been 30 days late on one of her rent pay payments. And although she had caught it up and it was only, it was six or eight months ago, Gretchen said, because of that, she can't get the loan. And I was like, Oh my. And I remember too, listen, I'd been working there. So I'd, I'd already, I was all, hadn't really worked in three weeks. Like I'd been working, but they're not paying you. You don't get paid unless you, you close something. So I'd gone almost three weeks to a month without getting paid for anything. And by the time this loan, if it did close, I was going to be a month. It would have been a month since I'd been paid. So I'm behind on everything. Like I banked everything on doing well at this company. I was behind on my mortgage payment. I was behind on, how old was I? I was like 28? So I was behind on everything. I'm on my mortgage payment. I was behind on my car payment. I'm behind my credit cards. I mean, I got credit cards getting canceled. I mean, things are bad because I was thinking I am going to do great at this. I loved it. I loved the idea of it. And I could tell I was good at it. I knew I was going to excel at it. Well, I looked at the, I looked at the verification of rent. And I was like, oh man, I remember just thinking this is horrible. Like I'm going to, I'm going to lose everything. And I said, well, what do I do? And Gretchen goes, she pulled out a bottle of white out and she started clicking it like this. And I remember, I, you know, the old bottles, like that was before they had the tape ones, they had the bottle. And, she would go, tch, 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 tch. and I, I was like, and she, she gave it to me. She goes, if I was you, I would white out the 30 day late, make a copy of it, stick it back in the file, send it to underwriting and the loan's going to close. And I went, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, that's, that's bank fraud. Isn't it? And, and she went, well, yeah, but listen, the worst that's going to happen 
And I remember saying, I can go to jail. Like I'd never broken the law at that point. I'd never, I'd gotten a couple of tickets. Like I'd never been in trouble before. It, it, breaking the law to me at that point in my life, it was something I, I had never even considered. So uh, I was like, I could go to jail for that. She says, oh, listen, the worst that happens is under if underwriting catches it, then they'll deny the loan. Maybe if they think you're involved and you whited it out or you knew it was in there, they might fire you, but that's the worst that's going to happen. And, and she was like, if I was you, I'd do it. So I, I went and made a copy of the, I whited it out, made a copy of the verification of rent, stuck it, the copy, the altered copy in the, in the file and mailed it to underwriting. Four or five days later, I get a, an approval. You've been approved to close. A couple days later, we close. So within a week, I'm at closing. Got a check for like 3,500 bucks. And, and I was like, this is amazing. I just got 3,500 bucks. 3,500 bucks 20 years ago was a, a nice, that was like a month's salary. Well, I was working on multiple loans. Within a couple of days, I close another loan. Within a few days later, somebody else had a problem where they almost qualified for the loan, but they didn't. So the guy made like $42,000 on his, his W-2 said he made 42000 But if the W-2 had said he made 47000 I could get, the, get him a loan. So I cut and pasted, the, turned the five into a seven, altered all of the corresponding deductions on the W-2, put it in the file, sent it to underwriting. They didn't catch it. Next thing you know, and you have to think there's 30 pages, the d- different types of documents in these things. They're calling on, on as many as possible. What, what are the chances that they're going to call on the W-2 and that they were going to say, what exact, how much did he make exactly last year? Typically what they're doing, they're just looking at the ver- what's called the verification of, of employment for the actual numbers, and they're calling the employer just to say, does he work there? Has he worked there for three years or two years or whatever was on the verification of, of employment? If they say yes. Well, he's worked here for four years. Okay, perfect. Did you fill this this out? Yes, we did. Thank you. And that's it. The, but then they'd look at the W-2s for the actual numbers. And the W-2 had been altered. So that went right through. Loan closed. Boom. 3500 bucks. Next loan. That one closes. I closed four loans my first month. By the next month, I closed six loans. The next month, I closed eight, which was more than the, the manager was closing. By the next month, it was 10. Then it was 12. I think the most I ever closed was 12 loans in a month. Then Kelly ended up making me the manager from the Tampa office. He made me the manager of the Brandon office. You know, I never mentioned this in the, in the book that I wrote, but what actually happened was by this point, Kelly was sleeping with the girl that I was dating, the girl that got me, that I was living with at the time. So by this point, Kelly was now coming down and sleeping with Chrissy on a regular basis, and I had no idea. He made me the manager of the Brandon office. He made her the manager of the Sarasota office, and he bought her a house in Sarasota. So she, but he was basically the whole thing was like, "Hey, I'm a, I've got a house, I've got a rental property down there." But in reality, he bought her a house, bought her a house, put her down there, so she and I couldn't live together anymore. Because it was too too long of a, it was too much of a commute to do every day. It's like an hour and forty five minutes to two hours. So if a two hour drive every day to see each other, so she and I were still seeing each other. We'd meet in the scent in the middle, once or twice a week. But eventually, I figured out what was going on, and we broke up, which was not you know traumatic for her because she liked Kelly. And by that point, I think Kelly's wife figured it out. She had had a private investigator follow him around. And so within a month or so of me breaking up with her, Kelly's wife kicked him out of the house. He had three boys. So he ends up losing the wife, the three kids, moves in with Chrissy, divorces the wife. They get married. They end up having a kid. And they're still married to this day. So it's really a romantic story from her perspective. From my perspective, they're scumbags. But whatever. I mean, you know, it's promiscuous. Let's put that, yeah. All right. Uh, well, what ends up happening is at some point, the Department of Banking Finance and the FBI closed down Eagle Lending. I think it was for fraud, which I don't think had anything to do with me. 
uh, they end up closing that whole, that, that company down. Like literally like guys are showing up to, to the office one day and the doors were chained. And what, what had happened with them, the biggest problem was that they had lost a credit line. They had several credit lines and, and from banks and these banks and lenders had closed down the credit lines because of fraud and because loans were, weren't performing. So they closed them down. Department of Banking and Finance came in. They eventually shut them down. By that point, I had moved to another office, another lender, well, actually another mortgage broker. And I very quickly, it was only there like a month or two, and then I started my own company. And my company was called Consortium Financial Services. Uh, and I hired about a dozen guys to work there, uh, brokers, you know, like half, it was actually half and half, about half women, half men. And, you know, and listen, and we were committing fraud right away, right away. We're all committing fraud. It was, and it was, it was so overwhelmingly blatant, the fraud that I was, it wasn't blatant. Like it was blatantly obvious. It was just so, it was. It wasn't like a W-2 or a pay sub. They weren't, weren't, they weren't slight alterations anymore. By this point, I was doing things like, by this point, like I was, I was like making my own banks. So I was making online banks where you could go online and it looked like a bank. Or, and I had multiple cell phones. I remember you'd walk in my office and I had like a bank, or, or, or I had like six or seven, I had like a whole row of cell phones. So I've got cell phone. I got like six cell phones with little tags on them on who they were for and what company they were for. I was opening up different corporations so that I could verify people's employment. I would list like the corporation in, in the business directory. One of the things we would do, one of the things I would do is I would make, you know, I would make fake bank statements. And so I'd make, obviously I'd make the fake online banks and I'd make fake corresponding bank statements. I would also make bank statements for other, you know, let's say if I had a, a borrower that was with Bank of America, but they didn't have their down payment in the bank for 90 days, which you'd need to have it 60 to 90 days. What I would do is I would, I had blank cardstock for Bank of America in color, trim down the whole thing. So I could print, I could take your bank statements and I could retype your bank statements and put down that you did have enough money to close so let's say a lot of times like you're going to buy a house and maybe the seller was going to give you your down payment because you didn't have your down payment. So the seller's going to give the down payment. And this makes sense if you're buying, let's say, for the sake of argument, a $200,000 house and you need to put down $10,000. You don't have $10,000. If the seller only wants $190,000, he's willing to bring your $10,000 to closing because he, he just wants to get one ninety, dollars and you don't have your down payment. So he'll bring it because he's just going to get the money right back. Well, you're supposed to have that money in the bank. So I would, so if you had a bank account with Bank of America and you had some money in the bank, I'd, we'd have them either deposit the money in the bank or we'd show the money being in the bank for the past three months using fake bank statements and we'd send those bank statements to the underwriter. The underwriter would look at it and they would say, okay, looks like he does have the money in the bank. And then when you go to closing, the seller would then just take $10,000 and deposit and deposit it in the escrow company or the, t- the title company in escrow and then you would clo- that loan would close. He'd get his money right back, and the loan goes through. So we would do stuff like that, or we would say it was in your currently in your bank that you don't even have a bank account. I would say it was in the bank of Ebor, and I'd have bank statements. And if you called the bank of Ebor, we had someone that would answer the phone as with the bank of Ebor and would verify that you have the funds in the the account. Uh, you know, so that was some of the stuff I was doing. I had uh, canceled checks. I'll give you an example. If let's say you've been late on your rent a bunch of times, well, you don't have to give a, give them a verification, give, you don't have to give the lender a verification of mortgage, mortgage or rent. You don't have to give the, the lender a, a verification of mortgage or rent. If you can prove you've made your payments every single month via canceled check and canceled check is a check that's gone through your bank and they've got all the routing numbers and all the cancellation and everything on the check. So I actually dummied up canceled checks from like SunTrust Bank, from Wachovia, from uh, um, from Bank of America, from all kinds of different banks. I would dummy up what lo- appeared to be canceled checks that had gone through for $1,200, $900 every single month for 24 months. And all you had to do, all my borrower, my brokers had to do was 
put their customer's name at the top upper left-hand corner and their address on each check. So they would make a, a little label and they would glue it on there and then they'd fill out the checks and then they'd sign their customer's name or have their customer sign them and then they'd make copies of them and then they would send them to underwriting. Underwriting would think, oh, look, this is 24 months worth of canceled checks that I can see have gone through the bank for $1,200 uh, you know, January, February, $1,200. Uh, you know, January, February, March, April, May, every, you know, 1200, 1200, and you could see them. They look canceled front and back. Perfect. So that's what we, I mean, those are the kinds of things we were doing. It was just, it was just blatant. I mean, we're making, you know, every day, the, 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 um, the appraisals for the properties were all jacked up. I mean, we're, we're altering appraisals where I'm doing all kinds of stuff. Like I'm doing anything to get these loans to go through and the loans are going through. And the reason I would obviously do this is because, if you went, if one of some customer came in, he'd already been to a few different uh, brokers, or he'd gone to his bank, they turned him down. He went to a credit union, they turned him down. Went to another broker, they turned him down. Then he would eventually get to me, and I'd say, "Yeah, I can do the loan, but the broker fee is forty five hundred dollars, and your interest rate is whatever eight percent." Because what a lot of people don't realize is, let's say your interest rate is going to be. Five percent. I mean, I know interest rates are ridiculously low now, but back then they were like seven or eight percent. So let's say they're going to be your interest rate is going to be five percent. What a lot of people don't realize is, at that time, if you came in and your interest rate should have been five percent, but I told you your interest rate was six percent, and you said, "Okay, I'm cool with that." If I told told for every fifty basis points, or really it was to be honest, it was like thirty five basis points. So each interest rate is made up of a hundred basis points. So if I told you your interest rate was five, it's supposed to be five percent, but if I said it was five point three five, that means that I get one point on the back of the loan. So if the loan's a hundred thousand dollars and I tell you your interest rate is five point three five and you say okay no problem, I get a thousand dollars back because your interest because your loan is a hundred thousand dollars. If it's two hundred thousand I would get two thousand back. I get two point or one point. One point on a two hundred thousand loan is two thousand. So you would come in, guys. People would come in. I'd say, yeah, your interest rate six percent. They would say six percent, man. Uh, should be five percent. Everybody else is doing five, but yeah, but everybody else turns you down. I can do it at six percent. So I'm charging you forty five hundred dollars as a broker fee, and I'm charging you three points. So it's five, not not five. If I at five, let's say you're borrowing a hundred thousand, it would be. Uh, if you're borrowing a hundred thousand dollar loan, and I tell you your interest is five percent, I get nothing on the back. If I tell you it's five point three five, I get one point. If I tell you it's five point seven, it's two point. If I tell you it's six, you know six point zero five, which is three points, I get three points on the back of your loan, which means I get an extra three grand. So I'm charging you forty five hundred up front plus three point plus I get three points on the back of the loan. Your interest rate is higher. Uh, but you have nowhere you can go. I'm able to get the loan through because, because I'm I'm creating canceled checks. I'm saying you have your money in the bank. I'm altering your your W twos and pay stubs. So I'm I'm doing everything I can to get these loans through. And we would get caught all the time. Listen, we got caught one time where I had done owner occupancy fraud for this this person. Uh, there was a woman, uh, a guy I knew, a sheriff's deputy. Actually, he comes up again. So there was a sheriff's deputy. No, wait, this was a real estate agent. We'd done, so if, if let's say I'm going to buy, let's say I want to buy an investment property. If I want to buy an investment property, say I want to buy a duplex and I want to buy a duplex, the bank wants me to put down 20%. So if it's a hundred thousand dollar duplex, they want me to put down 20 grand. Well, if I say I'm owner occupying that duplex, which means I'm gonna, I'm going to tell the bank I live in the duplex, I'm going to move in there. Then the bank says, "Okay, well we'll lend you 95%. So you only have to put down 5,000 as opposed to 20." We had a real estate agent one time. She bought, I want to say she bought 6 or 8 owner occupied duplexes. Actually, I want to say it was 6. 6 owner occupied duplexes where she said, I'm living in each one of these duplexes. So obviously I couldn't send all those to the same lender because the same lender would say, well, there's no way you're occupying six duplexes. What I did instead was 
Well, I didn't do this. My uh, one of the brokers that worked for me, her name is Susan Barca, did this. She closed one du- or one of the du- owner occupied duplexes with, let's say, Bank of America. Another one she closed with, let's say, Household Bank. Another one she closed with. So she closed them with all different banks. And this woman showed up at six different closings like the same day at six different title companies and signed saying she's owner occupying each one of these duplexes. And she was a real estate broker. So she's a real estate agent and a real estate broker. She had, this is like, so this is like, this is somebody who clearly knew this was fraud. We close and let's say about two months later, I remember getting, I remember Susan came in my office and she said, listen, I've got a lawyer on the phone from, I want to say it was Washington Mutual or was it Washington Mutual? No, it was Union Planners. She said, I have a, I have a, a lawyer on the phone from Union Planners. And he said he has two, two duplexes that are both owner-occupied by the same borrower, and we did both loans. I went, what? So what had happened was one of the, one of the loans we had closed, let's say, at Oak Street Mortgage. Oak Street Mortgage ended up selling that loan. that They had a credit line that was connected to, that was all given to them by Union Planners. So Union Planners ended up with that loan. So Union Planners ended up with two of the same owner-occupied properties. And so this lawyer's calling up saying, look, you've committed fraud. You guys did two owner-occupied prop duplexes at that. Two owner-occupied duplexes with the same borrower using the same information at two different title companies. You clearly knew what you were doing. I remember he's telling starters talking about commit. He's going to call the the FBI. He's going to have me arrested. He's going to. I ended up convincing that guy to let us refinance both of those properties. And pay. He also took a short pay, so he took less money. They took union planners took less money than we even owed them, and they paid us a broker fee. So I convinced him to pay us a broker fee and take less money. They 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 took a hit of like thirty thousand dollars just to get rid. Of, ooh, sorry, just to get rid of these loans. Uh, you know, because they don't want. Here's the thing: like he started saying, "I'm going to call the FBI." This and I was like, "Whoa, whoa! You don't want the FBI showing up. The FBI is going to go through your files." For all the FBI knows, you guys did anything something wrong. For all you know, the broker that did this at my company was working with someone on the inside of your company. You don't have any idea that the can of worms you're about to open up. Like, be reasonable here. And the guy was like, I said, look, how about this? Let me just refinance him. He was like, I was hoping you would say that. And so he, he I convinced him. I'm like, yeah, the problem is I can't refinance it and pay off the balance. I said, I'd need a short pay. And he goes, well, how much would I have to reduce it? I mean, he immediately, he's ready to start reducing them. He reduced it, and I was like, the problem is there's closing costs. He didn't realize when I started talking about there's three or 4000 of closing, there's like $4,000 in closing costs on every one, on both of these loans. He was like, well, that's fine. We'll pay the closing costs. The funny thing is, you know, he didn't realize that, that those closing costs, a portion of those closing costs included a broker fee. So we got paid a broker fee again. Anyway... Uh, that loan, we got caught then. Um, God, I get caught, got caught all the time. Got caught one time. Um, one of my mortgage brokers, I got a phone call from a bank in Chicago called, um, it was called, uh, gosh, what was it called? Uh, Pinnacle, Pinnacle Bank Court. And I got a phone call uh, from them, from the, the owner of the bank. And what had happened was one of my mortgage brokers, a guy named Eddie LaFuente, God, he was a problem. Uh, he was always getting caught, jammed up, uh, and he wasn't even good for but maybe three or four loans a month anyway. So he he had basically taken the same canceled checks and submitted those canceled checks with all of his loans. So every one of his borrowers had the same Bank of America checks, twelve hundred dollars Bank of America. He like he didn't even order the try and try and order verify these people. He's just using all fake documents. Sent it to this company. It just so happened that the same underwriter got two of his files like two days in a row and noticed, hey, these canceled checks look familiar. She then opened up the file he had sent her the day before, and they were identical, except for the signatures and the, the you know it was filled. They were filled out a little bit differently. The names of the borrowers were different, but the the numbers, the the routing numbers, the the cancellation numbers, everything was identical. 
I mean, that's, you know, that's uh, obviously that's a problem. And they, they then turned around, they pulled all of La Fuente's files and realized that they had like a million dollars worth of bad loans from this guy. And then they kept pulling files and they had sold another million dollars to household bank. So I get a call from this guy, uh, uh, Gary, who owned the Pinnacle Bank. And he's like, look, we got $2 million in bad loans. We just sold a million dollars in bad loans that you guys had provided us. Now, keep in mind, a bad loan just means that it's got fraud in it. It doesn't mean that they're not performing. People are paying. They're just not, they're just, they have fraud involved in them. Uh, you know, fraud, there's some fraudulent documents, and those are just the documents that he could see. I mean, who knows what other documents were in there? I remember he said, um, Matt, listen, uh, you know, we, we got an issue. You got, you know, one of your brokers did this. And I remember I go, a rogue broker? He goes, because you, and Gary goes, because you wouldn't know anything about this. I said, I have no idea what this guy did. And I said, I'm just finding out about this. And he explained the situation. And I said, look, Gary, I said, if you're thinking at the end of this phone call that I'm going to cut you a check for a million or $2 million, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, I don't have the money. I can't do it. And he said, oh, I, I get that. I get that. He goes, look, I just want you to give me your word that if any of these loans come back on us, because lenders have what's called a, um, they have what's called a, a clawback clause, which means if fraud is found in, the, in a loan that they provided, then they have to buy that loan back. Well, he said, if we, we get hit with a, a clawback uh, on the clawback clause, you'll agree to help us get rid of the house or refinance it or whatever. Now, the likelihood that that's going to happen is, is it's, just, it's just it's highly unlikely that once these loans have gone from my brokerage business to the lender and from the lender to another lender like Household Bank, and that six months later they're going to get caught and they're going to notice the fraud, it's highly unlikely. So, you know, I, I was like, yeah, absolutely, no problem. I mean, what am I going to say? It's that or he says, okay, I'm going to call the FBI. Now, he didn't, he didn't want to call the FBI anyway because the FBI is going to come in and, and do an internal investigation. They're going to find at least a couple million in bad fraud and bad loans that have been sold. And then Gary's on the hook to buy all these loans back. And it would have been bad. So he says, look, yeah, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll help you get rid of the loans if they come back on your the properties or whatever. And he says, absolutely. He said, man, I appreciate that. No problem. He said, I don't worry about it. Uh, I'll take care of it. So he ends up selling the selling another million dollars to households. That's two million he knows of. And then I remember a week later he came down and took me and several of the guys out to to dinner or lunch. I forget which. I think it was dinner. And he actually got got a little drunk. And I remember he told me, "Listen, man," he said, "Matt, to be honest, he said I don't care if I don't care if all of these. I don't care how much fraud is." is in these loans. As long as I can get rid of them and they don't come back on me, he was, I could care less. And so, I mean, that, that, like that kind of, I think that lets people know, like that was the environment that was like fraud was not everybody was committing fraud, but it was, it was extremely prevalent and it was forgivable. Uh, especially the, the more, fraud I was caught with. If, if the lender caught me and I had a bunch of fraud with them, I had a better chance of getting, a, of convincing them to let me fix it. If, if they were, and especially if they were, so if they were going to lose a hundred or $200,000, they were definitely willing to bend over backwards to let me fix this problem. And that was the environment that I was working in. So, uh you know, so I, I was committing fraud. I owned my own mortgage company at this point. I had about a dozen brokers. Uh, by, by this point, this was, I would say this is 2000 and, well, I, I would say I was 30, how, what was this, 2000, 2001? I was 30, 31 years old, something like that, 30, 31. And, uh, you know, committing fraud on a regular basis and making good money. And, and I had was also flipping properties at this point. At this point, I started buying properties real cheap in an, in an area of Tampa, just out, well, an area of Tampa called uh, Ybor City. And I was buying properties for 40,000, 50,000, putting whatever, 20,000 in them and then selling them for 100,000. Make, you know, make a profit of like 20 grand, 30 grand, depending on the house. Well, I was also buying properties uh, and renovating them so I would buy them, renovate them, and some of them I would sell. I mean, I'm sorry. Some I would sell, some I would keep. I was also buying rental properties, and I would renovate those. By this point, I was married to a girl named Kayla, and 
we'd we'd had a, a I'd had a son uh, named Cass, and uh, and and what I'd done was. I bought about 50, we bought about 55 rental units over the course of a year. And what Kayla did was she managed those properties. That was her job. She raised our son and she managed the properties. She said she was a stay at home mom or property slash property manager. But you have to understand she didn't have a job. So one of the things I would do is, you know, obviously she would buy a property, we'd renovate it. She'd rent out, out the, the, uh, the units. And one, another one of the things I would do sometimes is sometimes I would go in and I would buy a property in my name and I would sell, I would renovate the property, get an appraisal and then sell the property to Kayla. Well, you know, Kayla never took my last name. So it wasn't Kayla Cox. It was, it was her maiden name. And so I could sell properties to her because the lender didn't know we were married because that's not, if you sell A husband and wife can't sell properties between one another. It's not an arm's length transaction. So that's an issue for lenders. The other thing is the reason I would buy the properties and sell them to her instead of just buying her, buying them and refinancing them was something called seasoning. Seasoning says that like you can buy a property for $50,000, let's say. Then you go and you put whatever, $40,000 in it. And now the property is worth $150,000. Well, you can't use the value of that property to refinance it you can only use the sale price of that property for the first year. So after a year, you can say, hey, it's worth, I bought it for 50, renovated it. And after a year, you can get an appraisal for 150 and refinance based on the value of that of the appraisal. But for the first year, you have to go based on the cost of the purchase of the property and the renovations. So instead of getting a, an appraisal for 150000 I can only go off of the 50000 I bought it for plus the 30000 That's not enough to refinance it, get my money back, and pull out any money if I wanted to pull out money. So what I did to get around that was I bought the properties in my name, renovated the properties, sold them to Kayla because Kayla isn't subject to seasoning because she's a new buyer. So I would do that. And then, of course, all of her documents were fraudulent. So her her W-2s and pay subs were all fraudulent. Everything about the file was fraudulent. She was real. She had perfect credit. But... That the, the entire kind of transaction was fraudulent. Well, I had been, so I'm running my mortgage company and, and not all of the loans going through were fraud. I mean, we were an FHA approved lender, a VA approved lender. We did conventional and we did subprime loans, but most of the subprime loans, almost all the subprime loans were fraud. And some of the, some of the FHA and some of the conventional. So I would say 60 to 80% of the loans going through that company were fraudulent. Well, one of the things that happened was I had bought some properties and I had sold them to Kayla. I think it was three properties. And at some point, somebody, some of the, a couple of the brokers that used to work for me, one being my ex, uh, my old mortgage, my old uh, manager. Remember the manager that had, I'd first committed fraud, showed me how to commit fraud? Um, she had come to work for me, and then she opened up her own mortgage company. Her name was Gretchen, and her her husband was Pete. So it was Peter. So it was, it was Gretchen and Pete Zayas. So they had come to work for me, and then they went and started their own company. Well, what I was doing was because I was buying these properties and renovating them, I didn't want to close the loan through my own company because once again, that's also a, not a non arms length transaction. So I could buy the properties, I could sell them to my my wife at the time in her maiden name, but I couldn't close those loans in my company's name. So I had those loans and I ran those closings through Gretchen Zaya's company. Well, at some point I'd done like three loans through Gretchen, her company. At some point, Gretchen and Pete got in trouble because they were, they were doing what's called a straw man scam. They'd met a bunch of guys that were buying houses and selling them to each other. So they'd find a house for, let's say, $500,000. And then they'd get it appraised at like $700,000. Which in that, ain't, in that range isn't that difficult to do. So the new buyer would qualify for a seven. So one guy has it for $500,000. He buys it. He sells it for $700,000 to some borrower. That borrower qualifies for $700,000. Because Gretchen is committing fraud. She's... 
she's creating a fraudulent, uh, a fraudulent, um, whatever, W-2s, pay subs, whatever she's doing, she's getting this guy to qualify for a $700,000 loan that he's not really shouldn't qualify for. So when the guy who bought it for 500,000 sells it to the guy who's qualifying for a $700,000 loan, now there's a profit of $700,000. Well, Gretchen was getting a huge broker fee plus a kickback. And these guys are splitting whatever, let's say there's 150,000 left over. They're splitting 150,000. They rent the property out and they're supposed to rent it out and have someone rent it. Well, what ended up happening was the one guy borrowed, he qualified for five or six loans. She did five or six loans for this one guy. He never makes a payment. Those loans go into foreclosure. They're what's called first payment defaults. And as a result of that first payment default, they, the FBI comes in and they investigate. They realize it's a fraud. They're all fraudulent transactions. And they realize that Pete and Gretchen Zayas are the ones who did the fraudulent transactions. They come into their office and they raid their office. They get all their files, including my ex-wife's file. That's what they told me anyway. The truth is, so I, I could call up or Gretchen and I get a phone call from Gretchen one day. She, I know she's in trouble. I had just refinanced her personal residence to get her the money to pay her lawyer. And as soon as I got her that money, she gave it to her lawyer. The first thing her lawyer said was, who did this loan? And she said, well, this guy, Matt Cox, is he committing fraud? She said, yes. He said, my advice to you is to wear a wire on him, get him to talk about fraud, get him busted, and then you don't have to go to jail. So rat him out. So the guy that just refinanced your house to get you the money to pay me, I'm telling you to now turn him into the FBI. Nice, right? Like that's, that's, uh, that's a good criminal lawyer. Um, and so what she does is she puts on, she wears a wire. She calls me up and says, look, can I talk to you? Can we have lunch? I want to talk to you about some, you know, about something. So I go, sure, no problem. So I drive out to this pizzeria and I meet her and Pete and I sit down and I go, Hey, what's up? And she says, listen, the FBI is asking about you. And I go about me. She goes, yeah, well, not so much about you. She said about really about Kayla, my, my wife. And I went, why? What about Kayla? She goes, well, you know, those three loans that you did through my company. And I went, yeah. She said, they're asking about those loans. They're saying that they know that Kayla, it, you and Kayla are married and that, or they think that you're married or whatever it was. Uh, they know the loans are fraudulent. And I went, are you serious? I said, what did you tell them? She said, well, we haven't told them anything. I said, I, you didn't tell them that the, that the W-2s and pay stubs are fake, did you? You haven't told them anything about the, the loan. Like I immediately start saying things that bury me. You didn't tell them we were married, did you? You didn't tell them like, I mean, I'm just bury myself. And I remember in the middle of the conversation, <clears throat> I remember saying, look, here's what you do. Tell them you never met Kayla. Say she called you on the phone. She gave you the information on the phone. She faxed over all the information. So like, I start coming up with this plausible way for them to deny that they really knew anything about the fraud. And then I would have Kayla just not talk to the FBI. And therefore, the whole the whole investigation should fall apart. You don't have anybody cooperating. Nobody met in person. Who knows who showed up at the closing? Like, we don't really know. Like, basically, they could blame it. Kayla could blame it on uh, Gretchen and Pete. Pete and Gretchen could blame it on on um, Kayla. Who knows what the processors and underwriters did? Like, there's too many people involved to, to indict someone. So that was my thought process. I was wrong, but... That was my thought process. So I started coming up with this plausible story to try and clear everybody or at least put enough confusion into the whole investigation that they don't pursue it. And while I'm explaining this, I remember Gretchen said, Matt, we can't lie to the FBI. And I went, what? What are you talking about? I go, you've been lying to them. I said, you just lied to them when, when you just went and signed, uh, refinanced your house because their house loan was all fraudulent. Like W-2s were fraudulent, the pay stubs, everything. I go, you just lied to them. You just borrowed like 70 some odd thousand dollars to pay your lawyer. That whole loan was fraud. You've been lying. And she, and so Pete stands up, like bolts up and he goes, we've never lied to the FBI. We may not have told them everything, but we never lied. And I looked at him and I was like, what the fuck is he doing? What are you? Who are you telling that to? Like, I know that's not true. Why would you say all, like, why would you, what are you doing? Like, you're not telling me. You, 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 
me and Gretchen know that's a lie. So I realized, oh, God, he's wired. And I was like, oh, my God. What's so funny about that is that the FBI agent was actually sitting, like, right beside us, kind of behind, you know, kind of. And I had, at one point when we first sat down, I go, hey, hey. I go, bro, bro. Because the guy, there was a guy, the guy that was sitting there, the FBI agent, had ordered a piece, a slice of pizza, and he had folded the pizza up, and the napkin was under the pizza, was wrapped around the pizza. And he was eating the pizza and the napkin. And so I go, hey, 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 bro, bro, bro. And he looked, and he, he, he kind of like tried not to look over. Like he was like looking like that. I go, whoa, hey, hey, hey. So finally he glances at me. I go, bro, you're eating your napkin. And he goes, what? And he looked and he goes, oh, thanks. And he kind of, gl- they all glanced at each other. And I didn't smile, like, <laughs> like a nervous smile. I didn't realize that was the FBI agent. That was, he's sitting there and they're recording it. So anyway, Pete stands up and goes, we've, uh, we've never, we haven't lied. We haven't lied. We haven't told them everything, but we never lied. And I was like, oh man. And I looked down, I realized like both their cell phones are on the table. They're both sitting there leaning in. And I was like, oh. Or why they're wired. And I looked and I said, wow. I said, I hope you get something for me. I hope you get something for this. And she looked at me and she was, she starts crying. She starts, tears start rolling down her face. And she said, I don't have to go to jail, Matt. She goes, I have a kid. I have a kid. And I, I go, I don't have a kid. Like she babysat my kid. Like we've been on vacation together. Like I go, I don't have a kid. I said, listen, I said, Tell the FBI agent I'll talk to him, but not to come in my office because when the FBI raided her office, everybody quit. I go, so, because they're all committing fraud. So I said, you tell him not to come in my office. Call me on the phone and I'll come down there and talk to him. So I stand up and I leave. I mean, but look, I drove back to my office. Within 10 or 15 minutes, my phone, my secretary goes, Matt, there's an agent, Scott Gale, on the phone for you, FBI. And I was like, holy shit. Pick up the phone. I'm like, hey, what's going on? He goes, hey, Mr. Cox, uh, I'm sure you know what this is about. I mean, he didn't even pretend like, he didn't even come up with a story. He knew. Like, it was like, he didn't even pretend like, oh, I just happened to be investigating. No, no, you know, like I called because they told me to call. He goes, look, uh, you, you know, I know you know what this is about. Why don't you, uh, when can you come down? I said, oh, I'll come down on Monday. Uh, yeah, I'll call you, to, give me your phone number and I guess phone number and everything. Well, I immediately go out and I, I, I schedule a bunch of appointments with lawyers. I end up with a lawyer by the name of Gary Trombley super uh, a high profile lawyer. I give him $75,000 and uh, to basically I go in and I explain to him. I said, listen, man, I said, he was like, well, you know, based on potential loss, you could be looking at three years. And I go potential loss. He was like, yeah, you could have lost. And he starts adding up the numbers and it doesn't even make sense. Like it's, bu- it's all bullshit. Like he's trying to scare me and he did scare me. But what he was saying was, look, these properties are worth you know, let's say 150,000. So that's a potential loss of 150,000. And I, he said, because, you know, if they went bad, then they have to, then they'll end up losing 150,000. I said, no, I said, that loss is offset by the property itself. And the property is worth 150,000. She borrowed 150. It's worth 150. We have appraisals on it. And he's like, that's not how it works. And I had read the example of potential loss. And I said, that's exactly how it, how it, it, how it works. And I read off the example. And he's like, Matt, 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 listen, Mr. Cox, that's just not how it works. Okay. Yeah, trust me. There's a half a million dollar potential loss. You could do up to three years, blah, blah, blah. He was full of shit. He's just trying to justify his, his fee. Because what happened was a few months later, when I come back, he says, well, I got them to drop the potential loss, uh, by, by offsetting the potential loss with the value of the home. And so the way it works is then he explained the same thing that I had told him I had read. It was like, bro, what are you doing? Like, this is exactly what the conversation we had before, only now he's making my argument. The point is, I pay him 75 grand. He, I plead guilty. I end up pleading guilty to, uh, I think it was wire fraud. So I pled guilty to wire fraud. Now, they wanted to charge my, my uh, ex-wife, or my sorry, my wife at the time, Kayla, and I told them that I would, the conversation was, Initially, the initial conversation was, he said, you should cooperate. He said, you should go in your office. He goes, is, is there any, anybody else committing fraud? I said, they're all committing fraud. And he said, he goes, you should go in the office, grab 10 or 20 of the most egregious fraudulent files from your brokers, bring them to the FBI, work with the FBI to 
get those those brokers busted, you know, it charged and indicted. And then he said, I might be able to get your charges dropped, you and your wife's charges dropped completely. Like it's called a it's called a pretrial intervention. So if you work with them, they won't indict you because I hadn't been indicted yet, nor had uh, my my uh, wife at the time. And I said, Nah, bro. I said I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to indict. I'm not going to get these guys messed up. I'm not going to. I'm not going to get these people. I'm not going to. I'm not going to rat out my friends. Like, like I totally still believe that there was like a code. Like everybody, like we were all kind of, kind of like criminals, and we were going to look out for each other. And I didn't realize how it worked. That really. Everybody rolls over on everybody. You know, I believed, you know, the Godfather in Omarta, and you don't tell on your friends, and you don't tell on the other the other criminals, and it just doesn't exist. So, but at the time, I was an idiot, and instead of look, had it been now and what I know now, I would have walked in there with a doll. I would have walked into our Friday meeting with a dolly, and asked the guys to help me load up all of the file cabinets, load up the file cabinets, walk back into the meeting and say, listen, I'm going to bring these to the FBI. And uh, I just suggest you guys all uh, get lawyers and cooperate because you're all going to be fucked up. And I would have left. But I was an idiot and I didn't do that. And I let myself get indicted. And I actually told, said, look, I will plead guilty. Indict me, plead guilty if you drop the charges on my wife. She didn't know anything was going on. She didn't know. So the... Lawyer goes back to the uh, to the U.S. attorney and explains that situation. He says, we believe that the wife knew everything. There's no way she didn't know this. But Co- we think Cox was orchestrated the whole thing, and we get him wanting to plead guilty to take the charge for his wife. There's no reason for them both to get in trouble. So we have no problem with that. And they said, of course, you know, they did say they could— that there could be no indictments if I would cooperate. And, of course, he said, well, he's unwilling to cooperate. He says that, you know— He's not going to do that. They said, okay, fine. Well, because there was no potential loss and no actual loss, I ended up getting three years. I pled guilty to wire fraud and got three years probation. I had to forfeit um, my license as a mortgage broker. Well, I was also a brokerage business owner. So that meant that I could no longer run my brokerage business. It couldn't be in my name. So I transferred the brokerage business into a one of my brokers, he was a, a CPA. He had, you know, that's not true. He was a, a tax attorney. He had a tax, he had a master's degree in tax. He wasn't a CPA. Uh, um, he was a, he had a master's degree in tax. Uh, and so he, uh, he was an accountant. Anyway, he, so I transferred the, the, the company into his name and he kept me on he paid me $8,000 a month because that's what my basic bills were. And at the same time that all of that happened, so when all of that happened, all this is happening, <laughs> my wife and I get a divorce. So we're in the middle of this whole thing. We start uh, the divorce proceedings. And by the time I'm now a felon, I've lost my business, although I still do have an income coming in. She got all the properties. I paid off all of her credit cards, all of her debts, all of her Everything she had, I paid her off. I paid $2,000 a month for child support, and she kept all of the properties and collected rent on those properties. So she was making, she was making over a hundred and something odd thousand dollars. Plus, you get that she got the, all the depreciation of the properties. So you've got a couple million dollars worth of properties that she's getting the depreciation on. So she's paying almost no taxes, and she's got a huge amount of money coming in. And I'm living off of 8000 a month, and my bills are outrageous. Anyway, I end up moving into this property in Ybor City. I had completely renovated. Property I'd bought for like eighty grand, And, you know, but I'm, I don't, look, I know it sounds like $8,000 is a lot of money, all right? But the life I was living at that time, you know, I'm driving a brand new Audi. I think it was an Audi Quattro TT. Those were like 50, 60 grand. Um, and it was a lease. It was like a thousand a month up for the lease. You know, I've got my, my property is I'm renovating a new property. I'm buying rental properties. I'm flipping properties. I mean, I, I was not, I was, I was, I was doing okay, I guess, but I wasn't making the kind of money I'd made when I was, when I owned the mortgage company and everything I'd basically made the mortgage company. I just handed over to my ex-wife. Uh, you know, I was able to see my son 
every other weekend. I got them like every Wednesday, you know, and that was nice. Uh, you know, I had a girlfriend I was dating. I dated, I was dating a bunch of different chicks. And that's really where this really went off the rails. Because now I, I at this point, I don't own the mortgage company anymore. I'm getting a salary from the mortgage company and I'm able to man, help manage it by, uh, by dealing with a lot of the paperwork and helping to train the brokers. But I now don't really have a, a full-time job. I mean, that's maybe 20 hours a week. And so what I decided was I was like, oh, I'm going to open a development company with this guy named Rudy. He's a real estate agent. He's actually still a real estate agent here in, in, in Tampa. He didn't talk to me for some reason. I don't know. He's kind of a dickhead. So especially for a guy who was committing just a ton of fraud. Uh, now he's, he doesn't want to talk to me because he's like, that was a horrible part of my turn. It was a horrible. It's funny. He says that was a, that was a horrible thing that happened, that whole fraud thing. And then I, I got talked to by the FBI and, and it was just a horrible part of my life. It's like, I'm the one that went to prison. Like you didn't get indicted. You're still a real estate agent. You didn't go to jail for, for 12 and a half years. Like nothing happened to you. You talked to the FBI and you were scared. So what a fucking jerk off that guy is. So what ended up happening was I met Rudy and Rudy and I and my, my other partner, his name was David, and another guy named Jonathan. We all decided to open up a development company and build, start building brand new like luxury lofts, which are like really nice duplexes in Ybor City, a shithole area of Tampa. But it was going, going through a lot of gentrification. There was a lot of money being dumped into the area. And so we decided to do that, but you know, we don't really have the money to do it. So I figured, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start flipping properties and committing fraud to raise the money to do this d development company. And in my mind, I was thinking I'll steal the money and invest it in a, in a, in a legitimate company. And that's just a really foolish way to think uh, but at the time because now all the money going into that company is tainted and as a result of that that company is completely a fraud is fraudulent and therefore able to be seized by the government if they could ever link that money to the fraudulent transactions so what i came up with i i sat back and i thought you know what i'm gonna do here's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna come up with a fraud that i can commit that's a massive massive fraud that I can commit that nobody actually knows a fraud has been committed. And that fraud included what's called synthetic identity fraud. And it was bank fraud and mortgage fraud and real estate fraud and credit card fraud all wrapped into one and really a, just a really amazing scheme that I came up with. And I, I hate to say that, and I know it sounds like I'm bragging and everything else, but listen, I got... You know, I, I've got, I've got, I've got professional FBI, Secret Service, um, professional white collar criminals, white collar experts. I got judges, lawyers, everybody. All of them are saying the same thing. It was a brilliant, it was a brilliant scam, and so basically, barely getting by on the money that I was making, and and I, ha I ended up with the, I had the kind of the train of thought that was, I'm now already a criminal, so I might as well start, you know being a criminal, acting more like a criminal. Like, like before I felt like I was doing a little bit, I was doing fraud, but it was, it was fraud for customers to get them into property so I could make large commissions. And, you know, what year was this? Uh, oh, so this is 2002. So by now I'm, it's 2000, it's like May, it's like mid 2002. And I was early 2002, mid 20, uh, whatever. First part of, let's say uh, 2002. And what I did was I decided I was going to open up a development company with a bunch of uh, some of my other, some of the other guys that I knew, some real estate agents and, and some business partners. And we were going to open up, but we didn't, we needed money to do it. And nobody had enough, a significant amount of money to open up a development company. And we wanted to, to build these new properties in Ybor City, which is like an area of Tampa that was going through revitalization. And what I decided to do was I, I needed to come up with a scam that was what I consider to be semi foolproof. So that I could basically steal from the banks and they wouldn't realize they'd, they'd been defrauded. So what I did was I decided I was going to start flipping properties to do that. I was going to buy properties cheap, fix them up, sell them, you know. And, but the problem with that is that, you know, the problem with that is you buy, if you buy properties in a cheap, cheap properties in a cheap area and then you fix them up and you sell them, 
you know, the problem is those areas don't appraise very high. So I have to fi- had to figure out how to get that properties to appraise high. And then the other problem is people that buy houses in crappy areas like that, they tend to have credit problems, you know, job, they have employment problems, they have rental history problems, they have credit problems, uh, they have down payment problems, like they have, they're, they're, a major, they're a major problem, like they'll quit their job four days before the closing, or they'll go out and spend all the money for their down payment or something, they just do stupid stuff, so they're a problem, and then they have bad credit, that's a problem, so I needed to get away, a, figure out a way around that. And what I came up with was creating my own borrowers and having those fake borrowers. uh, By the way, the other problem when you fix up a property, the other problem is you spend a lot of money renovating it. So I didn't want want to spend blow money renovating the properties. I wanted you buy them for 50. I didn't want to put another 30 in it and then sell it for 120. Or even if I could get it appraised high, sell it for whatever that. Why would I blow 30 grand? Why wouldn't I put five grand in it? So what, what fixed all these was creating synthetic identities. So what I did was I figured out how to create synthetic identities by using the social security numbers of kids that really hadn't been born yet. So, or, or hadn't been well, fake kids. So, you know, you get social security. I convinced social security to start issuing me social security numbers to children that didn't exist. And this takes place over long. Initially, it started where I just got social security numbers from kids that were like three or four years old. Like I went into my the file cabinets and found kids, people that had, were claiming their children on their 1040s, which I had copied their 1040s. So they'd be like, hey, I have three kids. Here's their socials. And I'm claiming them as dependents. So I would go in and get those like, oh, this kid's three, this kid's two, he's five. I'd get those numbers just to kind of play around. But ultimately, what I ended up doing was going to social security and convincing Social Security to issue me Social Security numbers for children that had never been born. So I would say, hey, I've got a 10-month-old son, and I'd provide a fake birth certificate and a fake shot record, and I would get them to issue me a Social Security number to a child that doesn't exist. And then I would take that Social Security number, and I would go and I'd apply online to a credit card company. Sorry, to a... uh, whatever, to a bank that issues credit cards, whatever. And I'd apply, and th- of course they would deny them. So I'd go online, they'd deny it. But what it would do is when I plugged in, I would give, so I'd say the kid was like 30 years old. So this 30-year-old kid, here's a social, se- this 30-year-old kid. Here's a 30-year-old man. Here's his social security number. Here's his address. Here's his job. And I would apply for, for a credit card. They would deny it, of course, but what that they denied it because they didn't know who the person was and he had no credit scores. But it would create a credit profile. And that credit profile would say that this person's name, John Doe, this is his date of birth, this is his social, this is his address, this is where he works. So now that's listed in in the credit bureau. I would then turn around and I would apply for credit cards with companies that also ordered secured credit cards. They would then say you're denied for the Bank of America Platinum Visa, but if you give us $300, we'll give you a secured credit card. So I would do that for this fictitious person, this synthetic identity, and they would send me a credit card. And I started making the payments on those credit cards. After six months of keeping the balances below 30%, of the available balance on the card, I, it would the the b- credit bureaus would generate credit scores. So after six months, these people would have they would have um, they would have uh, credit scores of like seven hundred five, seven twenty, six ninety, you know, six ninety five. Like they were all right around seven hundred. So my borrowers end up with seven hundred credit scores. My fake borrowers have seven hundred credit scores. At that time, you only needed a six twenty to get a loan. So to get ninety five percent financing, or eighty or ninety, whatever you want, you to get a loan you own on a, a mortgage. You only needed a, a six twenty or higher. My guys have seven hundred. So what I did was I went into Ybor City, and I started buying houses. 
So the way an appraisal works is this. Say I buy a house for in an area for, let's say I'm, I want to buy a house for $60,000. And let's say they, if you're going to buy a house or refinance a house and you want to borrow money from the bank, the bank sends out an appraiser. And that appraiser goes out and he looks at your property. He then looks at the surrounding properties that have sold recently that are the same square footage, um, that are the same type of house. Like if you have a, if you have a two-story triplex, you can't compare it to a single-story, single-family home. I mean, it has to be a single family. It has to be apples to apples. So what happens is these houses in Ebor are selling for seventy-five thousand if they're in good shape. So how do I buy houses for fifty thousand that are in bad shape in Ebor? Clean them up a little bit and get them to appraise at two hundred thousand dollars. You need comparable sales, right? So the reason Ebor City at the time was all selling for seventy-five thousand is because all the houses are selling. So there's no comparable sales for anything over seventy-five thousand. So I went in and I started buying houses for fifty thousand dollars in the name of fake borrowers, my synthetic identities. I would, and we also call them phantom borrowers. So that's what the, uh, the, the, that's what the, the newspaper started calling them, phantom borrowers. So I would go in and I'd buy a house for 50,000 and I would then go downtown and I would record the value of that home for, 200,000. So I would say that that this property that I bought for 50 had actually been bought for 200 or you know whatever on average 175, 210, 190. So now you've got one house in Ebor City worth 200,000. That's not enough to borrow against because as soon as the appraiser comes out he's going to say this house is worth two you bought it for 200 but all the other comparable sales are worth 75. So what I did was I bought one house for 50 and recorded the value at 190. I bought another house for 50 or 60 and recorded the value at 210. I bought, an, bought another house for 50,000 and recorded the value at 200. Bought another house, so I start buying houses and re- recording the value in the name of fake people. And the borrowers were names, they were names like, now there were some other borrower names, like there was a guy named Alan Duncan, there was one named Joel Cologne. So what I very quickly started naming them after characters on Reservoir Dog. So I, the movie Reservoir Dogs by Quentin Tarantino. So what happens is I was naming them like one of the guy's names was James Red. One was named Lee Black. One's named like Michael White. One is named like uh, David Silver. One was named William Blue. So one was named Brandon Green. So these, these and they all have credit cards. They all have perfect credit profiles. So they all have 700 credit score plus. Once they bought the, I bought the house, recorded the value, I would then clean it up. You know, I'm not putting in new pipes and new, new electrical. We're just painting, doing very basic painting, trimming the trees, cleaning the front yards, painting the outside of the house, and we're doing a horribly shitty cheap job. But the appraiser would come in, and he would look at the property, and he'd say, well, it's not a great property, but it's, it's okay. And he'd say, it's in a bad area, but man, there's comparable sales all over the place. Like that house down the street sold for 210. That one sold for 190. That one sold for 195. And I'd say, well, and I'd say, yeah, I bought this property for 190. How much can you get it appraised for? He'd say, oh, I can get it appraised for like 195. So this property that I bought for 50,000 and put 10,000 into is now worth $195,000. So James Red can now refinance the property he can get, let's say, a 90% of 195. So let's say that's 170. I don't know the exact number. So take 60,000 out of that because I need my my the money I put up back plus my renovations back. That means that after closing, you're making about a hundred thousand dollars. Well, James Red bought, borrowed about a million dollars in 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 real estate or in in, in mortgages. James Red borrowed a million. Brandon Green borrowed a million. David Silver borrowed a million. Lee Black borrowed a million. Well, so over the course of this starts going, starts happening in early 2002. And we start, and this is literally the first closing I had was a few, was like a month or so after I was sentenced to three years. So, I mean, I'm, I'm literally sentenced to three years probation. I'm now a felon. And a month later, we, did a, we did a house that was one hundred and fifty or one hundred and sixty thousand dollars? I borrowed like one hundred and ten, one 
110,000 and a guy named, I want to say it was Brandon Green. So we borrowed like a hundred, like, I'm sorry, we borrowed like $210,000 or no, wait, it was one night. So one, I think it was 196. I think I borrowed 196,000. It's in, it's actually, it's in my book. I have the exact numbers like in the book. I'm not going to look, find it. So there's like 190, 195, right around that. Borrowed $195,000 in Brandon Green, like a, within a month of me being sentenced. Uh, and then immediately turned around and borrowed money in this, in another guy's name and another guy's name. And, started, and, and so now I, I ended up doing like 109 houses in Ybor City. That's what the FBI said I did. It said They said I borrowed in excess of $11.5 million in, in mortgages. And, you know, and that once again, listen, got caught all the time. I got caught one time by a bank. What was the name of that bank? South Star Bank. They actually caught me red handed. Like they called the broker. They called the account executive. They called the broker. The broker came into my office and said, South Star Bank is calling. They're saying that this is fraud. I then call up the bank and talk to the owner of the bank, like the bank president and the head of their fraud department, which, which said he was ex, he was ex FBI. And I, and they sat there and they're, they're saying, look, you know, this, you don't even exist. Like I'm saying, I, I remember it was Alan Duncan. I said I was Alan Duncan and they're going, you don't even exist. Mr. Duncan. This is like, this is this whole, this whole loan is fraud. And the reason what had happened was that we were supposed to obviously start making a few payments. We never made the first payment on this particular one. I was I had given it uh, I had given money to to everybody that was involved, and Rudy was supposed to make the first payment, and he never made the first payment. He was just an idiot. This is one of these guys who like just can barely feed himself. Like he's a real estate agent, but he's just a constantly fucking. He's a fuck up. So very first payment, he never even made the first payment. So then I call up, and that sparked a whole investigation. And so I have to call them up, and I explain to them, look. Let me just pay the money back. And he's like, they were like, look, we're going to call the FBI and we'll get our money back when we sell the property. And I was like, no, 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 that's not true. And I had to explain to them that they thought they had lent like $150,000 on a piece of property that was worth $200,000. And once I explained to them that they'd lent $150,000 on a piece of property that was worth probably $30,000, maybe fifty, dollars they were gonna, about to lose a minimum, a minimum they were going to lose was 100000 once I explained that to them, they were like, okay, okay, wait a second. Let's talk about this. Can you give us the money back? Let's... So they let me send them the money back. They still didn't call the FBI. We just had an agreement. We just agreed, I'll send you the money back if you promise not to. You know, Because you keep in mind, if they call the FBI, I get caught. i got to pay them back anyway. So I was like, let me just put, send the money back. And they said, you send the money back. We'll consider this just a mistake. And it was a problem. And uh, uh, we'll cut. We won't. We won't contact anybody. We just want our money back. So I sent them back the hundred fifty thousand dollars. Loan was done. I, I mean that. Uh, you know, it, it was a done deal. But I got caught. I mean, I got caught several times, and I always just paid them back and got away with it. So, what's funny about this whole thing is that what I would do with these. The reason that most of the time I got away with it is this. Let's say I was Brandon Green. Brandon Green would borrow, let's say, roughly five or six loans, he'd get five or six mortgages and he would let's say, end up borrowing like a million dollars. We'd walk away with, let's say 600,000. Then we'd, we'd make a few payments and we'd let those loans go into foreclosure. When those loans went into foreclosure, the banks would foreclose on the property. They then put the house back on the market and then they'd sell the house and they'd take the loss. They would assume, Hey, we lent 150,000 or 180,000 on this house. We put it on, back on the market for two hundred thousand. Three months later, it didn't sell. We'd lower it to one fifty. Three months later, it wouldn't sell. We'd lower it again to hundred thousand. By that point, somebody would make an offer for sixty or seventy thousand, and they'd sell it. And they'd go, "Hey, we just lost almost hundred thousand dollars." But that happens, and they didn't think anything was wrong. The other thing was when the when they would start sending collection letters to the borrowers. I would then write a letter from my fictitious borrower's sister saying that, and I would, I would type up, I'll, I would take a, a, an article from the newspaper, like a 
a 30 car pile up on I-75 or something and somebody was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital and I would retype the article and I would put my borrower's name in it. I'd print it out on on newsprint, cardstock news, newsprint, and then I'd cut it out and I'd make a copy of it and then I'd highlight the name of the borrower that I'd put in the article and I'd send a letter with that, with that cl- newspaper clipping with the letter, with a letter from the borrower's sister saying that her brother had been in a catastrophic you know, accident and was life flighted to Tampa General Hospital and he was currently in a coma and that the doctors said, look, even if he wakes up from the coma, he'll never work again and that the lender should just go ahead and foreclose on the property. They would stop sending letters. I gave them a reasonable explanation as to why this person wasn't making the payment anymore and they accepted it. They'd then put the house, they'd foreclose, put the house back on the market, sell the house, take the loss, move on. I would also run up the credit cards of these guys. So once I loaded them up with debt, I'd then apply for a bunch of credit cards, get up $30,000, $20,000 or $30,000 in credit cards. I'd then go to the mall, run up the credit cards. So each one of these guys was worth, they, they'd end up with like a million, million, million and change in mortgages. They're worth $600,000, $700,000 uh, profit. And then the banks would, you know, they just cut their losses and move on. And it was, it was a great scam. You know, I mean, I shouldn't say that. I probably shouldn't say that, but it was a great scam and it worked really well. Remember Rudy and I would go to the mall and run up the credit cards and he would always be so nervous. Like I'd, we'd go buy like a thousand, two thousand dollars worth of clothes or whatever we were borrowing computer. I mean, we were uh, whatever borrowing, whatever we were buying, We'd buy a couple thousand dollars. Buying, we're buying Rolex watches and all kinds of just junk, and we're sort of buying stuff. And we'd get up to the counter, and he would always get so scared. And I'd pull out a credit card. He'd be like, huh, huh, huh. "What are you doing? What are you doing? What do you mean? What am I doing? I'm using a credit card. That's what we're here for." Oh, oh, oh. you know, we'd whoop. It'd go. What if they notice? What if they call the police? How are they going to call the police? It's my credit card. Like, I am Brandon Green. I'm Brandon Green. I ordered the credit card. They sent it to me. I activated it. I've been using it. Why are, who, who's going to call the cops? There's no Brandon Green. And he just was, some people are just not, they're not psychologically prepared to commit fraud and be under that high anxiety. It wasn't even high anxiety because there was just no chance that they were even going to, even if they got a phone call. By that point, I was making my own IDs. So by that point, I'd figured out how to make my own IDs. By that point, I'm making fake IDs and I'm going into the bank and I'm actually opening up bank accounts. All right. So there was just, there was just no chance that, that anybody was going to think that there was fraud that had been committed. Um, what was I going to tell you? Oh, so bank account. Sorry. Sorry. At this point, bank account. So the bank. So I would go into, I was making fake IDs and I would go in and I would open up bank accounts. So I'm opening up bank accounts using, like I would give the ID to the person at the bank and they would run my ID. There's a computer or there's a program, I don't know if they still have it, in where they would actually generate what your, what your Florida ID number should be. So I had the Florida ID number on my fake IDs and I would go in because these guys don't exist. They don't have an ID. And I would actually be able to open up a bank account in the name of some fraudulent person. And what's so funny is that the fake IDs were not great. Like they would grab them. Um, it's funny because I actually had like several, I've had people look at them like the FBI and stuff. They would look and they go, oh, they look, they look really good. But they didn't. I didn't think they looked, they looked good. But to me, they weren't like, they didn't look great. I didn't think. They looked good enough to fool people. So I'd give it to the bank. The bank would, sometimes they would actually take it and they would look at it like to see the hologram. Like I would freak out. I was like, be like, start sweating, like, oh my God. And they'd sit it down and they'd, they'd type in, they'd start the process of opening the bank account and they would say, Have you ever had a bank account before? Because nothing's coming up. And I'd say, Oh no, I haven't had one in like, gosh, uh, you know, it was in my ex wife's name or, you know, whatever it was. Uh, and they would open up a bank account for me. So I, I mean, I had bank accounts, I had credit cards, I had everything I needed to launder the money. And I had a full proof, foolproof scam. 
the only time, you know, so there was, so one time this happened, this is funny. So what's funny about that is that I would, so I've got the appraisals are working, like the appraisers working for me. I've got, um, I've got the whole thing set up where, where the appraisals are coming in solid. I've got my borrowers, which are solid, their credit solid, their employment solid, like everything's pretty solid and the loans are going through and then they're going into foreclosure. Nobody knows. This has been going on forever. Like at this point, I'm probably at 10 or $11 million we've brought in. I think by the end, the FBI ended up saying we did like 11 and a half million. My, this scam netted me 11.5 million is what they said. Over a hundred houses. Um, of the course of 18 months. So it seems like a lot of houses, but so, well, one time, this is funny, one time, and so many people knew what was going on. One time I, I had a guy named James Red that I was doing, the synthetic identity by the name of James Red. James Red um, had borrowed like five or six, no, like four or five houses at this point. He'd borrowed eight, nine hundred thousand dollars in mortgages. And, but what we were doing is once we put together a full package, we would run it through, through my old mortgage company. And we would close it at title companies where we knew, we knew the people at the title company. So I could show up at the title company and say, Hey, listen, my guy isn't going to be able to be here for the closing. Can I drive the package? the closing package out to him at his work and get him to sign. And the title people would let me do that. So I pick it up and I'd go sit in my car and I'd sign all the documents and I'd make a copy of his fake ID and the, the pictures that I was using on the IDs. Now, some of them I could, I would make a fake ID. If I was going to go use his credit cards, I'd put a, put my picture on it. But typically they were just pictures of people that I knew that had been arrested. So it was kind of a joke. So like, let's say it was some tenant that I knew that had lived in one of our places. So if it was, it was some tenant I knew that had been arrested a few times, I'd go on the Hillsborough County arrest website and I'd pull his photo off and I'd use his photo on the ID. Well, one of the guys, so what was funny was, uh, and, and then I, I put that on there and then I'd close the loan and I would keep using his picture. And then when the whole thing was going to go under, and I was going to run up his credit cards. I'd then switch the ID into my with my picture, and I'd go in and run up his credit cards for twenty or thirty grand. And you know, I do everything. Like my this chick I was dating, named Jan. I remember I put like a thousand dollars worth of new new tires on her truck, or I would you know you're paying for anything. Like somebody's like, hey bro, can, I need new furniture. Can you put like five grand on a credit card? Sure, no problem. I mean, we all have everything we want, so it was a lot of fun. So. Uh, what ended up happening was at one point, one of the title people figured out that the bar, one of the borrowers that was closing, that I was closing loans with at her title company was fake. Somebody had called her and told her, Hey, something's not right. Like, I think this is, I, something's not right. Like these people don't exist. I don't know what she knew or who told her. I never figured that out. But what happened was one day I got a, I got a phone call from a, a, a mortgage broker named Kelly Pruitt. And Kelly said, hey, listen, you know, Mary at like Island Title or Paradise, I think it was Paradise Title. At Paradise Title, Mary is saying that, that she, next time James Red does a closing with her, he has to show up. And she's like, we have a closing like in a couple of days. She's saying he has to show up. And she's like, He's, she's got to know. And I was like, I mean, okay. And she's like, I mean, Matt, what are we going to do? I said, well, I mean, if he's got to show up, he's got to show up. Normally, Mary would just give me the package and let me have somebody ha and bring it to James Red. But I was like, look, if she's saying he's got to show up, he's got to show up. And she's like, how? I mean, he's like a fake, he's, he's some paperwork and a fake ID. I said, no, it's okay. I said, I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'll figure it out. So I actually called this guy named Eric Tamargo. And Eric comes in the office. I said, Eric, can you come in? And Eric used to clean all the yards for us. He would trim the trees, clean out the yards of these dumps that we were buying and make the outside look presentable. He owned like a landscaping company. So he shows up and he walks in. And I know Eric. I've known Eric for a while. I knew his, uh, his 
ex-wife of the, uh, his ex-wife back then. Her name was Amy. She was an account executive that used to come in for one of the one of the um, one of the lenders, and so I that's how I knew him. And and they got divorced, and he was you know she's kind of a derelict at the time, and and you know he's doing cleaning yards and stuff. Uh, but he was also had a drug problem, and so he comes in. And I'm like, he's like, hey, man, what's going on, bro? Everything cool? I said, yeah, yeah, everything's cool. I said, look, Eric, I got to tell you something. And I said, can you sit down? He goes, sure. So he sits down. I said, look, you know all these houses we've been buying? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, let me tell you what we've been doing. We've been buying them for like 50000 recording the value at this amount. Okay. I said, you know how an appraisal works? And I explained it to him. He's like, oh, okay. I go, then we, we, re, we have somebody buy those properties. The people that are buying the properties and refinancing those properties are fake people. And I explained to him about how I made the fake people. And he was like, holy shit, bro. I said, right. And then we, we make a few payments and we let him go into foreclosure. So we, we load the guy up with a million dollars and then we just let him go into foreclosure. And he was like, oh my God, bro, that is what happens when the banks, the banks don't figure it out. Here's why. I explained that. He's like, man, this is brilliant. I said, right. I said, the problem is, Eric, usually I am able to just sign for, for these people. Okay. I said, well, this one title company, Paradise Title, they're having an issue and they want this guy, James Red, to show up. Okay, okay. And I said, so I need somebody to go in there and sign for James Red. And I looked at him and he goes, oh, man, who are you going to get to do that? And I went, well, I, I was thinking you, Eric. And he goes, me? I don't know. He goes, well, wait a minute, I can't do that. I go, what do you mean? He goes, you said you're using some scumbag's picture off the Hillsborough County website. You're, you're using some guy, some, some guy's mugshot. They're going to know it's not me. And I go, well, here's the thing, Eric. I said, for James Red, I used the photo of you when you were arrested for domestic violence when you slapped around your ex-wife and got arrested. You know how that, that's online. So I used that picture. So you are James Red. He goes, motherfucker. He sta- stood up. He's like, you fucking piece of shit. I ought to beat your ass. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, oh, Eric, just calm down, calm down. Listen, I go, the only reason I used your name was because I knew if it came to this point and somebody had to show up and sign for James Red, you were the only person I knew that had the balls to pull it off. And he looked at me. I mean, listen, it was such a bad salesman job on my part. And he looked at me and he goes, started shaking his head. He goes, yeah, yeah, you're right. You're right. And I said, bro, I know you can do this and you know, you can make this work. And he goes, yeah, bro. Uh, that's a big favor. I, he goes, Oh, I'm not going to do it for nothing. I said, no, of course not, bro. Of course not. I mean, I obviously I'm going to pay you. And I remember thinking if he asked for more than like five or 10 grand, I would just get an ID in my name and go to another title company and do it myself. But I didn't want my picture associated with this whole thing. So he sat there and he kind of rocked his head back and forth. I go, well, how much, Eric? And he goes, let me think about this. And he kind of thought about it for a little bit. And keep in mind, I've told him the numbers that we're borrowing. I've told him the numbers we're, we're kind of making. And he goes, you guys are making a lot of money, bro. I said, well, wait a minute, Eric. I go, a lot of that money goes back in the property. There's not a ton of profit here. And he goes, all right, right, right. Kind of thinks, and I go, how much, Eric? And he goes, man, I want $500. <laughs> right? Five hundred dollars, and I w- I literally almost started laughing. I had to cut. I was like, <laughs> I put my hand over my face, and I was like, "Are you serious? Five hundred? I mean, it was everything I give you not to burst out laughing, going, "Are you joking?" And he, he goes, "Yeah, bro, it's a big favor, bro." And I said, "No, it is, bro." I said, "Well, you got to sign before I give you that money." He's like, "No, I get it, I get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah." Listen, I make a fake ID with his with his picture, right? Like he's got a fake ID, but I had to. I, I it was all it was all just cut and paste. I actually had to make a fake ID. A couple days later, we go in to the title company. We walk in and he, um, I remember Mary comes out and she sees me sitting there and she goes, Mr. Cox, I don't know why you're here. I, I specifically told Kelly, I'm not closing another one of these loans unless um, James Red shows up. And so Eric stands up and he goes, I'm James Red. And she looks at him and she goes, um, hold, hold on a second, Mr. Red. And she goes and goes and grabs one of the last files we closed, which had a picture of his old driver's license. And she pulls the picture out and sure enough, it's a picture of him. So she sits there for a minute and she goes, you could tell in her head, she was thinking like, how did I get this wrong? Like, that's the guy, that's James Red. And she goes, she goes, 
uh, okay, well, Mr. Red, come on in. So we go in, and she, he signs the paperwork, and she starts handing out checks. Like, here's 30000 that goes to so-and-so. Here's forty five that goes here. Here's 10 that goes here. Here's five here. Here's 30000 Like, she starts giving us, giving me all these checks, and I'm like, okay, thanks, thanks, because I'm supposed to distribute the checks. And I go, okay, thanks, Mary. And we leave. Eric sees the checks. So we get in the car, and I start giving him, five, counting out 500 bucks. He's like, yeah, bro, you guys made a lot of money. And I go, whoa, whoa, I said, bro, you said 500 and on top of that, a lot of that money goes back into the scam. Yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, all right, that's cool. So I give him, give him the money. Like a week later, I call him back. I got another closing. I said, Eric, I need you to do another closing for me. Yo, bro, he's like, I've been thinking about that. You made a lot of money, bro. I'm not doing it for no 500 bucks. Nah, you made a ton of money, man. I, I'm not doing it for 500 bucks this time. I said, no, I totally get it, Eric. How much? Let me know what the price is. I get it. Uh, 500, if you want more than 500, just let me know. And he goes, yeah, let me think about this. Let me think about this. Yeah. Yeah, I said, how much, bro? How much? He goes, yeah. I'm, man, I want $1,000. $1,000. <laughs> oh, I mean, he saw me walk away with like 70 or 80 grand. He wants a thousand dollars. I was like, dang, oh, well, you got to do it for, no, no, I'll do it first. I'll do it for, sure enough, we meet again. He goes in, he signs for a thousand dollars. He le- I mean, sorry, he signs the whole thing. He comes back, gets in my car. I give him a thousand dollars. Listen, like a couple months later, like I'm like a month, month and a half later, I only ever signed for one loan ever. And that was also a James Red loan. I borrowed from um, SunTrust Bank. I borrowed $250,000 from SunTrust Bank. Walked in, fake ID. That's the only time I ever signed, ever showed up anywhere, ever signed anything was SunTrust Bank. SunTrust, sorry, SunTrust Bank. $250,000. Other than that, Eric signed for uh, James Red. And nobody signed for anybody else. I signed for everybody. I mean, nobody ever showed up for a closing ever. Oh my God, bro. I remember one time there was a girl named Kim. I went and picked up a package for Kim one time. So I pick up the package. I remember I walked to, to bring it to the, my, my borrower to sign. I walked around the building, got my car, which was parked right next to the building, right next to all these windows. I sat down. I signed for the guy. I listened to the radio. I make a few phone calls. I wait about 45 minutes in my car. Finally, I get up and I, I, I put the picture of the guy's ID on the front of the, the file. I walk back in and I, sign, I remember I handed it to her. And she goes, that was Joel Cologne, by the way. The guy's name was Joel Cologne. I hand her the file. She walks in. She goes, she, I remember she picked it up. She looked at it. She flipped through it. She looked at me and she goes, I like the way you put a picture of his ID right on the front. And I went, okay. And I remember thinking, that was weird. That's weird. And I went, okay, well, yeah. And she goes, yeah. She said, have I shown you my office, Matt? And I went, no. And she goes, come back. Come take a look at my office. And so I walk into the back. And I walk over and walk in the back of her office. And the window to her office, on the other side of the window in the parking lot, is my car. And she said, I've sat here for the past 45 minutes watching you sign documents. She goes, you listen to the radio a little bit. You made some calls. She goes, but you did not drive to this guy's office. And James, she goes, and, and uh, Joel Cologne did not sign these documents. And I was like, fuck. And she goes, what's going on? I said, listen, listen. I said, Amy, the guy told me to sign for him. He's busy. I actually have a power of attorney for him. But... The company, the, the the lender, sorry, the lender we were going through would not allow a power of attorney. So I have to, I had to sign. Somebody has to sign for him. I can't. He's like, I, I forget what I said. He's two hours away, or he's out of the state, or well, I forget what it was. But I said it's not a big deal. She was, well, I can't let you. I can't give you the checks. I mean, I mean, I can't. I got to notarize this. So I'm supposed to notarize. I said, look, his signature is identical. I said, here's his original statement. Like I start showing her pictures, and she's like, okay, I agree. You've got his signature down, but I need to talk to him. And I was like, um, hold on. I'll call him right now. So I call his phone number and it, it rings and it, it rings and rings and rings and goes to voicemail. He doesn't answer, obviously. Um, uh, it, it, you know, it, it goes, <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. 
She called him. That's wrong. She called him, and it rang and rang and rang and went to voicemail. And I know it went to voicemail, obviously, because his cell phone was sitting in my car on the other side of the window. And she called and left a message and called back and left a message. And I go, look, what she? And she goes, look, if I don't talk to this guy, I'm not letting you leave. Like, I'm not notarizing these things. And I went, shoot. I go, hold on. And I grab her phone. And I go, what's the number? She gives me the number, and I punch in my business partner's phone number, Dave Walker. And I answer the phone, and I go, hey, Joel, this is Matt. And he goes, um, he goes, oh, Christ, what am I, Joel, here? And I said, yeah, you're, I said, yes, sir. And he goes, okay, all right, what, what's going on? I said, so listen, I'm at the title company. I go, I go, Kim is here, and you know, I, she let me sign and everything, and I told her about the power of attorney, but the problem is she wants to talk to you to make sure it's okay that I sign because she has to notarize it. She wants to make sure that, that you okay it. And he goes, oh, Christ. He goes, put her on the phone. So I go, here, here's Joel. And she grabs the phone, and she's like, hey, Mr. Cologne, I just want to let you know. I'm at Kim's Goldsboro, and Mr. Cox explained the situation. But you know, you have to understand that I'm notarizing these, and I need to make sure that everything's okay. He's like, yeah, you know, it's fine. I told him. I actually signed a power of attorney, but he said there's some issue with the bank. And she's like, no problem. Okay, thank you. So I can notarize your signature. No, no problem. Still totally not right, by the way. She still shouldn't have done it. But she hung up the phone, notarized everything, gave me the fucking checks, and I left. I... I, I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous. The amount of, the amount of, listen, and this is the thing, like I could go on, like I could go on and on and how many times I got caught and just got away with it. Okay. So I'm going to explain it again. So what I did was I figured out how to get social security to, well, I started with just random, um, social security numbers and that didn't work out. Then I figured out that I needed a social security number that had never been used and it was hard to figure out well whose social security numbers are active that haven't been used and i actually had a client that had come in this is how i figured this out i had a client that had come in and she had she was making whatever she made like forty thousand dollars a year and i pulled her credit and her credit was perfect but then when she came in to provide all of her w-2s and pay stubs and stuff this is, by the way, this had happened like a year or so earlier where I figured this out. She had come in and she said, she provided me with her W-2s. And her W-2s, I noticed that the social security number on her W-2s were different than what she'd given me. So we asked her to come in and I obviously they were also different than the, um, the credit I'd pulled. So I asked her to come in and she sat down in my office. And I was like, look, I noticed that the, the W-2 has this SOCH, but you gave me this SOCH. And that's what I pulled it under, pulled the credit under, and it's perfect credit. But your W two has a different social. And she, I remember she got a little scared. She looked a little bit worried. And I was like, I said, listen, I promise you. I said, I'm not calling anybody. You're not in trouble. I don't care what you've done. I just want to know how it works because you have perfect credit. So, and I want to make sure. I said, but I have a feeling if I pull this social security number on your W two, which is probably your true social security number, you probably have bad credit. And she looked at me and she was like, I do have bad credit. And I said, okay, so what happened? What are we doing here? I need to know before I send it to the lender to, so I can figure out if they can figure out what you've done. Because I can't send these W-2s. I have to change the W-2s. I have to figure out what's happening here. So she goes, okay, here's what happened. She said, I was married and I had been using my husband. My husband and I had the, you know, she was using his, his uh, surname. And she said they got divorced. He stopped paying credit cards. Uh, they got evicted. She said, so when I got, got evicted with him, it showed up on my credit. All of my credit cards were horrible. So she had a friend that told her, why don't you use your sons or daughters? I forget which it was. But her child, who was like five years old, why don't you use his social security number with your name? And she went, okay. She said, I'll, uh, well, I don't know. I'll, I'll try. So she went and applied for, for an apartment using her maiden name, which she hadn't used in 10 years, and her son's social security number, but everything else was normal. Oh, and the new and another address because she'd been evicted. So she's staying with a friend or something. So because she had used a different date of a different address, a different name, and a different soch. 
even though the date of birth was the same and part of her name was the same, like her first name was still like, you know, Karen or something, it because of that, it created a the credit bureaus created an entirely new profile for her. It didn't attach any of those things to her old bad credit profile. But yet she could still use her driver's license because she had a driver's license in her maiden name. So she said, I pulled, she said when they pulled it, they said I had no credit. She said, so I put down like double the security deposit and I moved right into the apartment. She said, then I turned around and she said, because we had her husband or she or whoever hadn't paid their rent, their electric, their electric bill was, was bad and it was in collections. So she went to the electric company, got the electric turned on using the different SOSH. So she got everything turned on using this new SOSH and this new credit profile. She, she said, so she then went, whatever, like a month or so later, she said she turned around and she went and she got a car loan or something. Or did she get, no, she started getting credit card offers, pre, uh, pre-approved credit card offers in the mail because she'd moved into a new apartment complex and they had, and she had gone to, she'd gotten electric and all these other things turned on her name. So she suddenly got a few credit cards. So she said, I applied for the credit card. She said, and they gave her like a secured credit card from like, it was some of the first premier, first premier used to give you a credit card. Like everybody, if you had no credit, you just had to pay a fee. So she said, I got a first premier credit card. She said a couple months later, I ended up getting a, a car loan using that. So she said, eventually she said, I realized that I had perfect credit under that new Soch and her, her maiden name. So I was like, okay, so I just need to change the W2 so that underwriting doesn't notice that the W2s and your credit are in different, are in different uh, social security numbers. And when they pull it, they should have the same, same, uh, get the same thing I got. So that's what I did. And her loan closed. But then, but by going through that process, I realized I can basically make synthetic people. Like I can make people that don't really exist. So what I did was I figured out, I mean, eventually I grabbed a couple of just social security numbers. Like I went, I went in the, the, um, I went in the file cabinets and just grabbed some social security numbers from, uh, uh, from like, two, three, four-year-old kids that I knew weren't using the socials, and I started pulling credit under vi- different names, but just to see if it would work. And then eventually I was like, okay, so I, I, I figured out, guess what? If I use a fake name, fake date of birth, a real social security number, and an address, it'll create a fake profile. Of course, it has no credit. It's just a profile, but at least it exists. Then what I realized I could do was I could then get a secured credit card. So I'd put up 300 bucks and I'd go get a credit card from like Bank of America. I'd get one from whatever, First Premier Bank, from, you know, Capital One. So I'd get like three credit cards because the minimum that you had to have was three trade lines. So it's very easy to create, to get three credit cards using security. So I give them 500 bucks, 200 bucks, 300 bucks, whatever. And I get three different credit cards. I start making the payments. And what I realized was, well, and, and then I started making the fake names. So the fake names were typically, not always, because I had a guy named Joel Cologne. I had a guy named Alan Duncan. I had a guy named, I had a bunch of different ones. But I, I ended up making a bunch using the, the names from uh, Reservoir Dogs, which was like, you know, Mr. Black, was basically like Lee Black, um, Michael White, uh, David Silver, that sort of thing. Like like I just color-coded names, Branding Green, James Red, and and... And what I would do is I get the credit cards and after you, if you made the payments for like six months and you kept the balances below 30% of the available balance. So if it's a thousand dollar credit card, you don't ever go above two or $300. Then after about six months, all of these guys started getting credit scores at, at like 700 credit scores. And I had already figured out how to make like a fake ID. I figured out how to make a fake ID by taking my real ID and I just took sandpaper and I sanded off my basic information, like my name and date of birth and, and, uh, address. And then I would print the name of whatever name I wanted in reverse on a piece of really ultra thin transparency paper. I then take clear glue, a glue stick and I'd glue it over my license in reverse. So it's, 
So the name was in reverse, but it was ups- upside. But it was it was uh, inverted. So when you looked at it through the plastic, it looked per it looked normal, and it was and you couldn't scratch it off because it was in between the filament, right, the the transparency paper and the actual plastic. And it was glued on, so then I just trim off the excess and sand it down slightly on the edges, and it was perfect. I had a perfect ID. You could see the hologram and everything. I mean, it wasn't perfect, I guess, if you really looked at it. Although I, you know, listen, I, I had cops look at it and stuff. They were like, it looks good. I thought, you know, it was, it was okay, but everybody thought that was great. And listen, I opened dozens of banks using those, those different, those different uh, um, IDs, driver's licenses. My picture with the name, you know, James Red on it. Um, gosh, the first time I opened, I, I remember the first time I went and opened up a bank account with that was terrifying. Like I walked in, I have to walk in. Who was it? Oh, it was Joel Cologne. I, I had to open up. I had bought a house, renovated it, and what in the name Joel Cologne and was refinancing it to pull out a bunch of money. And I had to have a bank account because I had to have reserves in the bank. This was before I was actually making bank accounts or during that same period of time, or they were going to call the bank, I think. Either way, I had to, you know, plus I have to launder the money. Like these, I'm getting checks in the names of Joel Cologne or, or Lee Black, and you have to be able to deposit that. You know, you can only put so many in your, in, I can only deposit so many in my bank account before it looks odd. So you start needing bank accounts in different guys' names. So I remember walking into a bank one time and giving him the ID and telling him my name was Joel Cologne. And the chick, she looked at it, and she she typed the information in, and she went, huh, that's weird. And I was like, what's that? And she goes, have you ever had a bank account? And I went, no. I said, no, no, I haven't. And, you know, I'm a 32, 33-year, I'm like a 32-year-old man, 30, 33 years old at this time. So I'm 33 years old, never had a bank account. I said, I told him, oh, my ex-wife had one. You know, I always used hers. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one. Uh, yeah, I haven't had one in my own my own name in like ten years. Like, I have no idea. But I did know that they run everybody that goes through the banks. They ran them through either check systems or AccuCheck, and so I didn't know what came up. But obviously, it said I, I, there was no record of me ever having been pulled. No inquiry. So the woman gets up, takes the the card, the ID, and goes to the manager, and she gives it to her. And she takes it, and she looks at it, and I remember she held it up to the light and twisted it back and forth, like, and looked at each other, and then they looked over at me, and then she did it again, and she handed her the license, and walked back over, sat down, and started typing. And I go, everything okay? And I said, everything okay? And she was like, uh, she goes, yeah, yeah. She said, it's fine. I just needed approval because you've never had a bank account. So. And she just opened up the bank account. I gave her whatever, thousand dollars, five hundred bucks, opened up a bank account, walked out with some uh some temporary checks and a, a little deposit thing, and I have a bank account now. So when I refinanced that house and I got a check for whatever it was, sixty, seventy thousand, I went and I deposited the check and it went right in the bank account. Completely fake person. Um okay, so you know, what I did was I started making more and more of these guys. And these guys had everything. Like I had they would have a, uh, they had a job. I would go on SunBiz. I remember I'd go on SunBiz, which is the Secretary of State website in Florida. So if you have a register, if you have a, if you open a company, you're registered on SunBiz. So you can go there and you can just type in different names. And so I remember I started going with, the name I was using was Express Tax Services because there was a bunch of Express Tax Services. Like if you put an Express Tax Services, there were several that had this very similar names. And I took one and I just used the tax ID number and it was in Miami. So I went and I registered a DBA for Express Tax Services because this was like Express Tax Services of South Florida or something. I, I went and I just registered a DBA as Express Tax Services. And, that, and then I registered the phone number. So if you went and looked for the phone number, it would give you a phone number that would dial a phone w- that would send you to a phone that I had that was sitting on my credenza in my office. I had a bank of multiple, probably half a dozen cell phones. So one of those was Express Tax Services. It would ring. I'd pick up the phone and I'd, Express Tax Services, how may I help you? Oh, you're looking for 
Joel Colon? Oh, sure. Hold on one second. Or, you know, put him on hold or say, I'm sorry, he's not in the office right now. I can have him call you right back. Regardless, I, I like had a whole system set up. And I was creating these fake borrowers and borrowing money. And that system was going pretty well. I don't know if I explained this or not. I would, I would, obviously, I was buy these houses for like $40,000 and I'm recording the value. I already went over that. But once these guys would get like a million dollars in mortgages in their names, the, you know, you get to that point where you just, they're, they're just, they're overloaded with debt and their credit scores start going down. What I would do is I would, we'd stop paying. We'd stop paying on, on, you know, at some point you can't keep paying these mortgages. Once you've, if you borrow a million dollars and you've pulled out, let's say six or $700,000 and we've got six or 700,000, what we would do is you can't just keep using that money to make the payments. At some point I had to let these things go into foreclosure. So we just stopped paying. And when we'd stop paying, eventually the banks would start sending collection notices to all these guys' houses. And I would take the collection notices and I would write a letter from the borrower's phantom borrower's sister. And I would take, I would go into, let's say, the St. Petersburg Times or some newspaper article, and I would rewrite the article to include my borrower's name. So if someone, let's say there was a 12-car pileup, on I-75 or I-4, and someone was life flighted to Tampa Bay General Hospital, I would put my guy's name in for Tampa Bay, for the person who was life flighted to the hospital. Then I would write a letter from his supposed sister saying that, listen, I know he hasn't been making the mortgage payment. I know you guys are about to foreclose. You might as well go ahead and foreclose because the doctors told us that he's, well, he's currently in a in a coma, but the doctors told us even if he wakes up from the coma, he'll never work again. So he's not going to be able to make these payments. And I would send that letter along with a copy of the article with his name in it. So they would get the article and they'd look at it and they'd say, oh, wow, I see his name here. It's highlighted. And he was obviously in a car accident. And yeah, that's what happened. They would then foreclose on the property, put it on the market and resell it. Now they've obviously, they've lent, they think it's worth 200000 They lent 180000 they put it on the market. They might eventually, some at some point, sell it for ninety thousand, and they lost ninety thousand. You know, they maybe they sell it for eighty thousand. They lost a hundred thousand dollars. Now, since the value of the pro the area was going up, they would end up selling it for more than it was really worth, but not more than what they owed. And as a result of that, uh, they would stop looking. Like they wouldn't keep sending the letters. They would they they were given an explanation for why this person stop making the mortgage payments. And that's all they cared about. Like they just need an explanation. And that made, made sense because those things happen. Well, I was doing this all the time. Like I was buying houses, buy four or five houses, six houses in one guy's name, pull out, you know, borrow a million, million and change in mortgages on the guy. And then I'd, I'd get the money, deposit in the bank, pull the money out of the bank. It was, it was just going, it was just on and on and on. And and we were taking that money. We were reinvesting the money. We were buying more and more real estate. Like, and we're building new houses. I mean, I would started a development company. I ended up, gosh, I remember I had bought, at this point I was, at this point I was divorced from my ex-wife. My current, well, wife at the time, I guess, no, she would be an ex-wife then too. So got a divorce. After we got divorced, I bought a house for like $80,000 and I renovated the house. Well, I got an apartment. I remember I got an apartment. And I started dating. I remember I dated this stripper that was living upstairs. She was insane. I mean, just crazy. Her name was Danielle. Most strippers are crazy. So what ended up happening was I... I bought this one house and I was living in an apartment complex and I was renovating the house and and, and I was renovating it. I remember I needed to borrow more money on the house. Like I'm dumping a ton of money in this house. It had a, it was a four, had a four car garage. It had two apartments. It had a one bedroom that was a one bedroom apartment. That was 2,200 square feet. Like that's a huge, that's a huge one bedroom. Hardwood floors. I mean, I was just decking this thing out. And I, at one point I needed it more money. And I had been, I started dating this other chick named uh, Connie Wick, and she was a manager of a lawyer's title on, in Tampa. And I went to her and I was like, Connie, I have a question for you. And she was like, yeah, what's up? 
I remember when I went on, I went on a date with her too, bro. I took her to see Les Miserables, which is a, a, a musical. She loved it. I mean, listen, Toll, like, if you, if you want to, you have a chick that you want to date and you bring them to a musical, like, it's over. I mean, you might as well just drive straight back to your fucking house. I mean, it's, it's a panty dropper like you can't believe. Because most guys won't do that. Like, women want to go see, like, a musical. They want to do those things, but guys won't bring them. Like, that's, like, you know, that's, like, for most guys, that's weird. That's gay. I don't want to be sitting through some bunch of people singing or whatever. But I'm telling you, if you go to see one, they're awesome. And if you're with a chick, it's over. Like, you just, you get to do whatever you want. So, I brought her to uh, Les Mis, and then we went, I think we ate at, like, Ruth, Ruth Chris, went back to her place. I mean, just, like, pulled up to her place, and she goes, do you want to come in? I mean, she was just like, just come in. Like, you, you and I both know what this has been an amazing night just come in so go in there you know uh gave her the best four minutes she's ever had in her life um and uh we're laying in bed and i was like listen i remember she told me we're laying in bed and she she said she started laughing and i was like what because she knew i'd been indicted and i was already on federal probation and she said um god she remembered she's like i remember we got subpoenas for your stuff before you got in trouble, like the FBI came in, subpoenaed your stuff. And like, we were all like freaking out, like, oh my gosh. And all the girls at her work started calling me Darth Vader. And when they would, she was like, they were free. They were like, you're going out with Darth Vader tonight. And, and she was like, oh, he's not that bad. She, they were like, I'm telling you, he'll pull you over to the dark side. Like this guy's doing all kinds of fraud. Um, and we were laying in bed and she was laughing about it. And I said, you know, it's funny that you say that. I said, I have a question for you. And she goes, what's that? I said, I bought this piece of property for about 80 grand. I've dumped a hundred and something thousand in it. I need to borrow some more money on the property. How can I borrow more money on that property when I think it's only going to appraise for a couple hundred thousand? And she looked at me and she was like, well, I don't know. Um, what do you owe on it? I was like, well, you know, I, I owed a couple hundred thousand. I said, but I need to borrow more money. How can I? I said, how does the lender know that? there's a mortgage on the property. And she was like, well, I mean, they pull, they pull the title work. They have, she goes, they have us pull the title work. And when we go downtown, if the mortgage shows up, I go, yeah, but when the mortgage, how do I get rid of a mortgage? So they don't see it. And she went, well, I mean, when a mortgage is paid off, it's satisfied. And I went, well, how do they know it's satisfied? She goes, well, because the bank, when the bank gets paid, they send a, this one-page document that says it's a satisfaction of mortgage. Like it says that the mortgage that was taken out by this person on this date for this amount and, record, and recorded in the official record book on this page with this instrument number is hereby satisfied, like the person paid us. She goes, and then it's notarized, and the, the president of the bank or somebody signs it. And I go, what happens to that document? And she goes, well, it's typically mailed back to the, um, you know, to the bank to show it was recorded. And I'm like, okay, who, how do they know where to mail it though? And she goes, well, cause they say in the upper left-hand corner, like, Hey, it was prepared by bank of America. And when it's after it's recorded, mail it back to bank of America to this address. And I goes, is it one address? And she goes, well, no, there's bank of America's everywhere. I mean, who knows? It could be any number of addresses. And I went, okay, so let me get this straight. You're telling me that I, if I fill out a one-page document with the correct information on it, I can get public records to record it in public records to show that, the, that a mortgage that's currently recorded in public records was satisfied. I can then have it mailed back to an address that isn't necessarily even the bank's address. And when you go to search it, you're going to see the original mortgage and a satisfaction, and you're going to list on the title you're going to list that there is no mortgage on the property. She goes, right, because I, there's a satisfaction saying Bank of America paid it off. I go, even though they didn't. She goes, right. And I said, okay, so Bank of, she goes, as long as you keep making your mortgage payment, Bank of America doesn't realize that, you, that they no longer have a lien on the property. They think it's still there. They didn't get a, sat, a satisfaction. Of course, if they got the satisfaction, they'd realize right away, we didn't satisfy this. But that doesn't happen. So, okay. So I was like, okay, cool. And so I went downtown and I pulled 
I pulled the mortgage on my property and I went down and I saw her and I gave it to her and I said, can you prepare a satisfaction of mortgage for this? And she was like, holy shit, you're seriously going to do this? I go, absolutely. And she said, I mean, I can show you, I can fill one out, but I'm not going to notarize it. And I went, that's fine. I said, I can, I can get a notary. I had already called like Office Depot, um, uh, uh, what was the other one? Staples. I'd already called several comp- several places and I'd ordered notary stamps in different names. And so I pay for the stamp. I go in, I, I didn't call. I went in, I, I filled out the paperwork. This is my, here's my name. Here's my notary number. Here's this, here's that. Here's when it expires. And I said, I need a stamp. And then they would order it. And then I would just, they'd call you a couple days later, or I'd just go in a couple days later, and I'd say, hey, is my stamp here? And they'd go, sure, and they'd give it to me. They wouldn't ask for ID or anything. I had one place, I had like four or five places I ordered stamps from. One place asked me, the guy goes, do you have, a, you have your ID? And I was like, nah, bro. I mean, I came in here a couple days ago. He goes, yeah, well, I need your ID. I said, oh, I don't have it on me. He goes, yeah, man. Uh, I said, well, I'll go get it, and I'll come back. He goes, okay. So I left. I got his name. I left, and I called down there and said, hey, when is this guy you know, is this guy there? And they said, uh, yeah, he's there. I called a little bit later and they said, oh no, he's off. He already left for the day. Okay, great. So then I went back in to the next person that was there and I said, hey, I need my notary stamp. And they didn't ask for an ID and they gave me the notary stamp. So I end up with multiple notary stamps. And I, I just, once Connie filled out the, showed me how to do the satisfaction and she filled it out, I notarized it. I signed, signed it, went downtown and recorded it. I had it mailed to an abandoned house instead of mailed back to the, the, the mortgage company who had lent me the money. I just had it mailed to an abandoned house. So a couple of days later I drive by there. Boom. I got the, I've got it. So now when I went to go borrow more money and the title company pulled the title on the house that I was using as collateral to borrow the money, there's no mortgage showing up. So I borrow another $175,000 or something like that on that house. It was worth maybe 200000 at the time. It was still being renovated. But of course, the appraiser that I was using didn't say it was being renovated. He said it was in perfect condition because we're ordering whatever. I mean, you know, this guy's doing how, fuck, 10, 20 appraisals a month for the company that I used to own, but I'm still basically running in, in a way. I mean, he's going to, obviously, he's going to do what we ask him to do or what I asked him to do, because otherwise I could yank 20. If you're being paid $400, three to four or $500 for an appraisal and you're getting 20 of them and you're, so you're making five to $10,000 a month off of this one lender or this one mortgage company, you're going to pretty much do what I ask you to do. So, and he was a cool guy. And so he said that the house wasn't being renovated, took a bunch of good pictures, said it was in perfect shape. And he said it was worth, I don't know what he said it was worth two, two fifty. So I borrowed another one seventy five. I then satisfied that loan and I borrowed two mortgages at the same time on the property. I borrowed a million dollars on this one piece of property and renovated that property. It was in great shape, built a concrete block wall around the whole thing, restuccoed the building new. It was, it was, it was a hard, put hardwood floors, the whole thing, great kitchens, the four car garage. It was great. Great. Uh, at that point, I really had that scam down and I really knew the paperwork. I I remember by the second or third time I walked in to see Connie to ask her to fill out the paperwork. She was like, I'm not doing this. She's I'm not doing this again. I'm not filling this out. But by that point, I already understood public records fairly well. I'd been down there several times. She and I had had a bunch of conversations and I dated her on and off for a couple of months and, I was sorry. Then I stopped dating her. I started dating a chick named Jana. Jana was a, owned a, she owned a gym, like a little fitness gym in a strip mall. She it was a nice little private gym and she was a, she was a personal trainer. She was in amazing shape, like blonde hair, blue eyes, a tiny little waist abs in um, like, I never should have been dating this chick. She was that good looking. She was that over the top good looking. And she had been dating a chick. When I say the chick she was dating was, she'd been dating some other chick. So she was a lesbian. She'd been with this other girl. They'd been dating for, I forget, like four or five years. They'd broken up. And my house, by the time, that's right, when I finished my house, so when my house got finished, there was something called a tour of homes. My house was 
was um, one of, there was like six houses on the tour of homes. And what happens is they sell tickets and people get to walk through your house. So they had all these nice houses in the Tampa Heights area, which was an area that I had moved into, which was booming. It was just, it was right next to Ybor City, which is where I was doing my scam. So it's convenient for me to be next to my scam area, the area I'm what they call farming. So I'm jacking up the prices of this area. I live right next to that area. I ended up buying my house and about four, three or four other houses that were on that street. Like on my one little block, there's maybe eight houses and I own five of them. Well, I ended up dating this chick, Jana, who had walked, she was walking through the tour of homes. She went on the tour of homes and as she was walking through my house, she, she actually stopped me and she's like, oh, you, you own, this is your house. You own this house. I was like, yeah. I remember I painted a bunch of murals on the walls. She was asking about the murals and she said, I would love to buy a house in this area. Do you know who owns the house across the street? And I said, yeah, I actually own the house across the street. And it was being, we were in the middle of renovating it. And I wasn't using it like as a part of a scam or anything. I was just renovating the house. Like I was all, I'm always, I was always renovating something. I was always doing something. Like I'm always doing like five things, right? So, so at least something every, if you're doing five or six projects, at least every one month or so, something hits and you make a nice little chunk of change. And so I was renovating this property. And I said, yeah, I'm renovating it. She's, oh my gosh, I would love to talk to you about, about possibly buying it. And so we started talking and, uh, I got her phone number and I said, yeah, that's cool. I said, well, give me a call. And she got my phone number. I said, give me a call. We'll, we'll have to talk about it. Cause there were so many people, there were like a thousand people or so coming through the house. So I'm, I'm talking to other people and she leaves. She called me later and asked me if I wanted to have dinner. So I said, yeah, absolutely. And I was just thinking at first I thought she was interested in me. And then I, I talked to a buddy who told me she was a lesbian. And so we end up going to, uh, I think it's called Samurai Blue in Ybor City. But when we got there, I realized she was flirting with me and I, I told her I could get her the house. That's probably why she dated me, just because I could get her the house. But it worked out for me because I started, you know, started hitting it and it was amazing. Never should have been dating th th this chick. She was so smoking hot. And uh, you know the worst thing about her? She just had like no sense of humor. Like I'm big on sense of humor. Like a big part of my personality is that, you know, I'm funny. I'm entertaining and funny. She didn't find me entertaining entertaining at all she didn't find me funny at all not even remotely um uh, impressed by my by me at all but she did want to get in the house and what a great trade-off i mean it was, a, it was a good deal for me and we started dating so i obviously wasn't dating connie any, anymore i was dating Jana. oh gosh 33 by this point mm -hmm. by this point i'm on federal probation did I tell you that? Did I ever say I was on federal probation? Like I'd been arrested and everything. Yeah, I was on federal probation. And I was dating Jana. And then Jana and I broke up. I got her into three properties, by the way. She made money on every single property. One of those properties she bought, renovated, sold it, and made like $80,000 on the property. And this chick's never seen that much money in her life. Oh, and all fraud, by the way. Every loan was fraud. I had to make fake, fake, um, fake ten forties. Everything. Her credit was crap. I mean, I had to do. I had to fix everything. I had to get her a new credit profile. I mean, it was just, it was just completely. I had to wipe her credit, and get a new credit profile, get her secure. I basically had to create a synthetic identity that matched her identity to get her into these properties. But it worked. She made a bunch of money. You know, so. God, I was buy her, buying her stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, and I genuinely thought that like, like at the time I would have told you this chick really likes me, but really I'm just paying for everything. So, uh, it was a trade off. Anyway, then I started dating and then I started dating, uh, I started dating this chick, Allison. Listen, do you have any idea how many properties I owned at that point? I owned a fucking shitload. We owned a ton of properties. And you know what? It, when I say we, I mean me, Dave Walker, a guy named Jonathan Krieg, who was an investor, and a guy named Rudy. Rudy, I had met through an investor named Kelly. Kelly was in Tampa, was in Ybor City, and she and her husband, her name was Hal, were buying properties and renovating them. And I remember Kelly had come to me and she said, 
I'd already got her into a bunch of properties. And she was like, she's like, Matt, listen, she said, I need to buy that. I want to buy this, uh, this property. And all of her loans are fake or all fraud. So I was like, okay, well, what's, what's the problem? She goes, well, it's a five unit building. And if you know anything about, uh, real estate, if you've up, you can buy residential real estate or res, you can get a residential loan from one to four units. But if you get five units, it becomes commercial. Well, that's a completely different animal altogether. I didn't do commercial loans. And she was never going to qualify for a commercial loan. And I didn't know enough about commercial loans. And, and basically, there was no comparable sales for the, for the property. So the property can't even qualify for a commercial loan. So she calls me and says, look, I want to buy this bar. I'm going to get this property. The problem, and I need to pull out money so I can do the renovations. I was like, how much do you need to pull out? And she was like 80000 to do the renovations or whatever it was. And I was like, man, but by this point, I'd recorded the value so many. I'd recorded the value of so many properties, like all the properties in the area were now starting to really record, like, like really come in high. So there, the whole area ballooned up. I mean, people are buying properties left and right, left and right. And, and guys are starting to pay ridiculous prices. Like I was started off on buying properties for $40,000 and got people, let's say there was some guy trying to sell a property for 50. I'd be, I would go to him and say, Hey, I'll buy it for 40. And they'd go 40. Oh, I want 50. And you'd go 50. You're crazy. Like I'm not paying you $50,000. I'm buying the same size properties for $40,000 and they're in better shape. I don't know. This actually happened. Well, all the properties, even the shithole started selling for higher and higher because we'd done, we'd recorded so many that the, the value in the area was shooting up. And I remember I went to this one old man and I asked him and he wanted 50 and I said, I'll give you 40. He said, no. So a couple, about four or five months later, I go back to him. I said, look, I'll give you, I'll give you the 50 grand you want because there was the, 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 the availability of properties were, were drying up. And so I said, I'll give you the 50 grand. He goes, now nah, I want 60 grand. I went 60, I'm not giving you 60 grand. Three months ago, you wanted, you know, three or four months ago, you wanted 50. Nah, nah. So I said, nah, man, forget that. Forget it. So I leave. A couple months later, I, there's so few properties. Like, we're now really starting to pay ridiculous prices for these for these just shitholes. And I go back to the old guy. I said, man, I'll give you 60 grand. He goes, man, I want 80. 80? How do you figure 80? Less than a year, you're telling me your property doubled? And he goes, he looked at me and said, have you seen what properties in this area are selling for? That house over there sold for $200,000. I'm like, no, it didn't. Like I bought that house for 50 and recorded it at 210 or 205 or 200, whatever it was. It was just like, you know, but what happened was I was, I was working against myself. I was creating these ridiculous comparables that now people that had houses that you couldn't even live in thought they were worth 90 or 80,000. So we're, we're still buying properties, pulling out properties. Uh, I had met Rudy because Rudy was the, was the guy selling this piece of property that Kelly wanted to buy. So Kelly wants to buy this property. And I said, well, what's the problem, Kelly? Why can't you qualify for it? What, what's it? She goes, well, it's a five unit. So I said, okay. She said, um, you need to call the real estate agent. He was selling the property. I said, okay. So I said, I'll call him. And she goes, listen, he's a real jerk. And I went, I said, what's his name? He is Rudy. So I call him up and I said, Hey, listen, I'm the, so Kelly says, look, can you call this guy and arrange it so that I can walk away with money? I mean, which by the way, it's just completely illegal. Like you're buying a piece of crap property that this guy was selling for like, like a hundred grand or something. And I'm getting, going to get it. I'm going to get the value recorded. I'm going to get it the sale. It's going to go through at like $240,000 so that she can one, bring a down payment, which she's going to get back and two, pull out like 80,000 so she can renovate the property. So I call the guy up. And I say, listen, I need you to do this and do this. I need you to get me a, uh, an appraisal for this. And the guy says, listen, man. He said, um, I've already had like three or four contracts in the last few months fall apart because you understand this thing is a commercial building, right? And I was like, yeah, I understand. I said, it's a, it's a five unit. And he goes, right, but it's, it's five units, so it's commercial. And, it's, it's, and I was like, okay, so it's, it's not, it wasn't zone commercial. But he said, it's a five unit, so you can't get a residential loan on it. I said, I understand that. And he said, well, how are you going to get this chick a loan? She said, you got her a bunch of them, but those are all houses or duplexes. I said, yeah, I'll be able to get her. I'm going to get her a loan on this. He goes, how? You have to get a commercial loan, and there's no other commercial properties in the area that you can compare it to. I said, because I'm going to get her a residential loan. And he goes, you can't get a residential loan on a five-unit building. It has to be four units or less. I said, right. 
I'm going to have the appraiser say that it's four units. And he goes, you have an appraiser that will do that? I said, I mean, I had two or three appraisals that would do that, appraisers that would do that. And he went, okay, are you, and you're sure about that? I said, absolutely. I said, so you need to write up. So I explained to him, write up the contract for $240,000. I needed him, then I had him go back on MLS and say, the pro, take it down, relist it at two hundred and like fifty thousand, and say that the property had recently been completely renovated and gone from a five unit to a four unit. I then met the appraiser out there and got him to say it was a four unit building and that the fifth unit, which was a little tiny efficiency, was actually um, a utility room where all of the electrical and junction boxes and everything were, and it was also storage. It was a storage unit where all the, they also had all the electrical. And there was a fifth, fifth uh, meter and I had him say that that meter was the house meter which ran the sprinkler system and all the lights. There was no sprinkler system. There was no exterior light system either, by the way. <laughs> and the security cameras. Why not? So we, he does all of that. I get an appraisal for 250000 We have a sales price for two two forty. She gets a loan for like 80% or 80 or 90%. She gets the down, her down payment back plus the money back. She ends up walking away with like $80,000. She then renovates the property and actually renovates the property and, and does a decent job. It was such a shithole. Um, even when she was done, it was still pretty bad. So, but that's how I met Rudy. So I, I, so I now I know Rudy. Rudy has an investor named Jonathan Creek who lends money to flip properties. We start having our not, or oh, I'm sorry, we start having this guy Krieg lend money to our fake people to buy even more houses. So that's how it's like. It's, it just keeps ballooning up and ballooning up and ballooning up, and these houses are just going left and right, left and right. Um, they're, they're, we get some guy, he buys five houses, renovates it, gets a million dollars, pulls out six or $700,000, makes a few payments, lets them all go into foreclosure. We'd bought a property for like $30,000. I mean, what? It was just a dump. And we bought this property and we got it appraised for like 180 or 190,000. I don't remember the exact number. I actually have all those numbers in, in, in my book. Like I have the, actually the time, the everything, but we bought the property the name Alan Duncan, and we brought, bought like six properties, I think five or six properties in this guy's name already. Well, you know, I would get money out. So let's say, let's say we bought the property for 30000 cleaned it up a little bit, got some, a decent appraisal, and then, you know, we go to the closing, we rent it, we, we refinance the property in the name of Alan Duncan. He gets a, a check, you know, he gets a check. And, uh, and we would cut it up into different entities. Like some people like Rudy might get some money. Dave might, we might have a couple corporations get money. We might have we, all kinds of just the money would never go to one person. It was always being divvied up into multiple different people or and identities. Uh, what well, identities? Uh, well, yeah, sometimes, sometimes it was being divvied up into, uh, um, into uh, uh, people that didn't even exist. Like sometimes I'm cutting checks to, to to other phantom borrowers and depositing the money into their bank accounts, which is probably one of the reasons I got hit with money laundering. So uh, at one point we had closed a loan. We borrowed like 140 or 150 thousand on a property we bought for like 30. So it wasn't even a big loan. We made maybe 90, 80 to 90 thousand. Uh, that we'd walked away with. And one of the checks, the, one of the biggest checks went to Rudy, one of my, one of my, you know, business partners gave him the check. And I said, listen, bro, I said, you're getting the check, but you got to make the payments on this thing for the next two, three months until we let them all go. It's like, we're going to make like three payments to let them go. We'd already had a bunch of other properties we'd been making payments on. So, you know, it's time to start letting these things go. And so he was like, okay, no problem, no problem. And, a month or so went by. So the first payment's basically due. Well, what ended up happening was I get a phone call from the uh, from the mortgage broker that had done the loan for Alan Duncan. She knows he's fake. Her, her name is Kelly Pruitt. She knew the loan was fake. She called me up and she said, "Listen, Matt, I got an issue." And I was like, "What?" She said, "I just got a phone call from the from the bank's rep, their their account rep." She said, she tipped me off that, and said that they were looking into the loan. 
And I went, why? And she goes, I don't know. Apparently, she said, you guys never made the first mortgage payment, which means it's a fir- what's called the first payment default. Any type of first payment default means they automatically review the the loan for fraud. So I remember I was in my apartment. I remember I ran downstairs and open, yanked open the, uh, Rudy's door because Rudy rented one of my apartments in my building. I yanked open his door and he was like, oh, what's going on, bro? And I said, did you make the fucking payment for Alan Duncan's property on, I think it was 15th Street, on 15th Street? And he went, oh, is that due? And I was like, Jesus Christ. I was like, yeah, it's due. And he's like, oh, I'll put it in the mail right now. Well, I said, well it's too late. Now they're, now they're, they're looking into it like they know something's up. So I drove back. I drove, we, we all drove to the office, and we open up the file and review the file. And I remember just looking at it thinking, of all the files that they could have been suspicious of, like this is like the worst one. I'm like, like there was very little um, subterfuge, let's say. I, like I took, I just took no real precautions. At this point, I was so cocky. Everything had been working so flawlessly that I, I didn't even, I wouldn't even really, like money was going directly into everybody's account. So Rudy's got a check. I've got a check. Dave's got a check. Like every single player has a check. And it was just like, this is just the worst. You know, you know exactly who's making the money. And so I was like, this is, this is messed up. So I called, I got the phone number for the, to the bank and I called the bank and I put them on speaker and uh, the secretary or whoever, somebody answered, and, you know, you went through the prompts, but I ended up getting a secretary, and I said, look, I need to talk to, and I forget who the, the guy's name was, like the head of the bank or something, or the head of the fraud department, I forget who I asked for, and because he was the person who had been, who had been one of the people who had been calling, and I said, uh, hey, and they said, who is this? So I said, this is Alan Duncan, and they said, well, he, they're in a meeting right now, and I said, look, I assure you, you want to interrupt them, they want to talk to me. So she, I said, interrupt the meeting. She goes, are you sure? I said, absolutely, I'm 100% positive. So she comes back, and next thing, or she didn't even come back. I just immediately was in the meeting. Like, they transferred me to there, and they picked it up. They put me on speakerphone. They were like, hey, Mr. Duncan. And it was, a, I remember, it's a small bank. It was called, um, I want to say South Star Bank in, like, Georgia or something. I forget exactly where it was. Like, South Star Bank, and they said, they put me on speaker, and it was like the, like the, one of the, he, one of the he, owner of the bank, um, the head of security, which what he, he ended up saying he was ex-FBI and like some lawyer. And they were like, we were just having a, we were just having a discussion about you. And, they, and I said, oh, okay. And they said, especially since, you know, based on everything we can determine, you don't even exist. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, listen, um, I said, I understand you've got some issues. And they said, we don't have some issues. Like your social security number. We're wa- they were waiting for social security to call them back. They said, we don't, we don't think, your social security number has just only been around six or eight months, you know, nine months, something like that. They said, so you've only, you're, you're less than a year old on your credit profile. Your, your driver's license number has never been issued. Your, we contacted like one of the banks. That bank has never issued a bank. You don't have a bank account there. Like they start dismantling, telling me all these things. And they said, as far as we can tell, you don't even exist. And I was like, okay, well, what are we getting at here? Like, I, I can, obviously there's an issue. They go, oh, we're going to call the FBI. I said, okay, listen then. They said, because you're not Alan Duncan. There is no Alan Duncan. I said, yeah, all right, so listen, what's the bottom line? You just want to get your money back, right? Let me give you the money back. Because I told you I'd been caught before when I owned the mortgage company. I'd been caught with fraud. They'd always let me pay them back. And I said, let me just pay you back. You know, what do I owe you, $140,000? I could cut you a check and they were like, oh, no, no, we'll get the money back when we foreclose on the property. They said, what you need to be concerned about is you go into prison. And I was like thinking, oh, this is bad. Like they, they, they weren't even the least bit concerned about getting the money back. But as they were talking, they were basically mocking me like, oh, you're going to prison. You need to be worried about going, spending the rest of your life in like an eight by eight concrete box. I remember they kept saying that. And at one point I realized that, that, they thought they were going to be able to get they their, get their money back when they sold the property. Well, the property is worth thirty grand, and they thought it was worth like one ninety or one eighty, and that they had a loan on it for one forty, but it was worth one eighty or one ninety. They figured when we sell it, we'll recoup our one forty. And so I said, "Okay, fellas, I think I understand what the issue is here." 
I said, you think that your $140,000 loan is attached to a property that's worth $190,000. They said, yeah. And I said, they said, yeah, we know it is. I said, no, 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 no. I said, you're about to lose $100,000. I said, let me explain why. I said, do you have the appraisal there? And they said, yeah, we do. They opened the appraisal. And they said, look, we even had the appraisal reviewed, which was a common thing. You, let's say I send the bank a, my own appraiser. They would do what's called a desktop review or even a drive-by review where they send their own appraiser out there to look at the property, but he never goes in. That's why I would clean up the outside. So if you drove by, you never got out of your car, it looks fine from the street. Well, they said, uh, we, I said, well, you, that property's worth about 30 or 40 grand. Like, what are you talking about? They said, we had, our, we had it reviewed. And I said, let me explain why. I said, open up the appraisal. Look at comp number one. Comp number one, I explained to him, is, a, is owned by a guy named James Red. Comp number two is owned by a guy named uh, Lee Black. Comp number three is owned by a guy named, you know, um, like, like uh, David Silver. This is going to, if you want to, well, it's not going to catch it. You know, th this is owned by a guy named David Silver. And I said, and I explained to him that I bought the property for 30 grand and I recorded the value at 190. And then the, one of the other comparables, I recorded at 210. Another one I recorded at 195. So I explained what I did and why their appraiser when the, he did a review, didn't catch it because the comparables are true. They're real. They really appear to be legit. So they now were like, they were just like, holy shit. And I said, so when you foreclose on that property, you go to resell it, you're going to realize that the inside of that property is gutted. You can't live there. It's ra raining inside the house in the back room. It's a complete shithole. You're going to fucking end up, you're going to, you guys are about to lose $100,000. So even if you sell it and make, sell it for 30 or 40, you're still, you still, oh, you still have $100,000 left on that loan. And then they were like, remember the owner said, well, we'll, uh, uh, we'll recoup that money when the FBI catches you. And I was like, no, that's not true at all. I said, let me explain why. I said, first of all, you already know my name's not Alan Duncan. The bank accounts where the money went are all forged, are all fake bank accounts in different fake people's names. None of those names lead to me. They're all synthetic identities. So I explained that they're all how I made the synthetic identities, how I have the fake driver's license, how this. I said, you've got a grainy black and white photograph and a, and a surveillance footage of me from 30 feet away. I said, I promise you, even if the FBI tracks all that money back to those accounts, the money's of the money has been drained. There's no money left. The accounts were open in fake people's names. The bottom line is I said, you're about to lose 100 grand. I said, and you're going to have nothing to even try and track me down. I said, I go around the country doing this. This is my job. This is what I do for a living. I said, if you want to get your money back, I said, we need to d agree that you're not going to contact the FBI and I will give you your money back. Which is, you know, they could have gotten the money back and still contact the FBI. But the truth is nobody wants to contact the FBI. Like no bank, especially no subprime bank, wants the FBI looking into their files. So I remember they put me on hold and they came back and they said, so you still have the 140000 I said, I can get you the one forty. They said, you get us the one forty. we will not contact the FBI. We'll just consider this, uh, you know, a, a, a bad error on, on your part and no harm, no foul. And so they told me exactly what I owed them because I owed them a per diem for the amount of money that I owed for the uh, payment that was never made, plus I owed a yield spread for when they, uh, w what they would have made. Like, I pay them exactly what they're owed. They're owed, like, 143000 and change. I go get a bank, uh, a cashier's check, and I send them the cashier's check. And that was it. So I pay them off. They never contacted the FBI. And I remember, I remember with Rudy, we, were, we had just mailed the check. And we were, we were walking, and I took all the IDs and everything, and I threw them in a garbage can. He's like, "What, bro? What are you doing?" And I was like, "Bro, it, it's it's no good." No, wait. We first went to the the mall and ran up all the credit cards. We first went to the mall, ran up the credit cards, and then when we were leaving, I threw them all out. And he was like, "What are you doing?" I said, "Bro, I said they're no good now." First of all, the guy's already got a thirty a thirty day late on his payment. So that's probably going to be reported. And the guy already had four or five mortgages, and we borrowed a million dollars, and he was just shot. You know, plus, I'm not, I can't borrow any more money in this guy's name. These people are out there, and they know what's going on, and I, I just can't show up anywhere. So we shut that whole guy down. But that was totally Rudy's fault. 
for never making the payment. Uh, what else? What else? So that, yeah, that was the one time, man, let me tell you about being scared. My heart was racing. And they were so, like, they, they really had me. I just totally bluffed them. Because if the FBI had shown up and actually traced any of the money, all that money went to our bank accounts. Like, I'm acting like they went to synthetic identities, accounts, and there's no trail. And, but it was a complete trail back to Rudy, me. Hey, Jonathan got a check. Everybody got a check. Dave got a check. Yeah, it was, uh, it, that would have been a bad, that would have been a bad situation. I don't even know if I want to get into the, the, at that same time, I had bribed a politician. I wanted him, we owned a bunch of vacant lots in the area. We wanted him to renovate the whole, we wanted him to, sorry, renovate, rezone. The, we bought a bunch of single, a bunch of vacant lots in Ewer City and Tampa Heights where they were single family homes, but we wanted to build like triplexes and quadplexes on them. Which, so if I buy a property for, let's say I buy a, a, sing, a, a vacant lot for, let's say, seven or 8000 but if I could get it rezoned, it was zoned single family. If I can get it rezoned multifamily and I can build a three unit, well, that, that, that lot now, instead of being worth, let's say, 7000 it's now worth like twenty five grand or twenty grand or whatever. So it's worth a lot more money. So we were going to have him rezone 100 vacant lots that we owned in Ybor City. And he, this guy was running for... He ended up running for, uh, he ran for city council. And we were, oh man, I'm leaving out a bunch of shit, bro. So, well, what we did was, He came to me one day. He was out. This guy was out passing out signs, like putting signs in people's yards. And he saw, and I saw him, and I, I was like, hey, what's up? And he was like, hey, you know, look, I'm, I'm, I'm running for city. Was it? Yeah, city council. I'm running for city council in District 5, which was the Ebor City District. And he said, um, you know, I'm looking for support and donations. And I was like, well, you know, he was running as a Republican, too. And I was like, okay. And he said, yeah, I'm trying to. I think he was. He said, what do you do? So what do you do? He said, I, he said you own this plot property? And I said, I own this property. I own that property. I own that one over there. I own those two down there. And I own this one here. I said, I own about six over here on this street. Sorry, I said, I own about 100 properties in this area. And, and it, you know, that keep in mind, it was over 100 properties that we were doing a scam with. But I also own a bunch of other just properties, rooming, houses, stuff like that. And so I was like, yeah, I own property on Jefferson Street, on Columbus, on so I name off on Amelia. I start naming them all off. He's like, okay. He's like, he's man, I'm I'm very very pro developer, especially in my area. I said, okay, well. I said, all right, well, what's it going to cost take for you to you to win? He said, you know, these campaigns aren't run off very much. He said, ten fifteen grand. He said, uh, I'm raising money right now. I've got a few thousand dollars, and I went okay. And I said, so how much is it to win? And he said, well, I mean, I think I'll probably win if I come up with the, enough money to run ads and do this and that. I end up sitting down with him like the next day with uh, Dave, my uh, partner, and I think Rudy was there. And we basically say, look, what if we help fund your campaign? Here's what we, and I said, here's what we want. And I said, I explained about the vacant lots. And he said, oh, yeah, I can do that. I can get all those rezoned. He said, well, how much are you planning on, on giving us? on giving me for the camp for my campaign. I said, you've got a couple grand, right? Right. What do you got? A couple grand is you said you can run it off of what? 15 grand. What, what is it? He said, well, 20 grand would be perfect. He said, I've already got a few thousand. I said, okay, well, I'll get you another 15 grand. And he's like, really? And I said, yeah, I remember the next day I tried to give him like cash and he wouldn't take it. He said, no, I need this in Checks of like 500 bucks for corporations, $250 for individuals. I mean, I spent the day driving around going to all of Dave's, my former Dave's current employers, getting them to write checks for $250. My family wrote checks for $250. Uh, corporations, like I'm going to buddies that own corporations. I was giving them 500 bucks, telling them to cut me a check for $500. There, so I get this guy like, I get him 15 grand. Um, Pro, it, what happens is ultimately uh, he run, he has a there's a runoff like he doesn't win it's a tie 
So he needs to, then there's going to be another run, a runoff. So he and the, just he and the one other person that tied with, they're going to run off and he's got to try and get it. So then I give him 7,000 in cash because he needed like 10. He's like, I still got a couple grand, but I need like 7,000. I said, here's 7,000. I give it to him. Named Michael White. One of my guys was named Michael White. Michael White, that identity, I'd set my friend Travis, I have a buddy named Travis, he had set up a scam with my help in Orlando. And he was buying houses in the name of Michael White. And he was refinancing those houses and pulling out money and depositing it in the bank. So that whole scam is going right there. It's a couple hundred thousand dollars so far that we've been pulling out. So I was dating this chick, Jana, and we ended up getting into an argument. Um, she started, actually, it wasn't even an argument. She started sleeping with this girl, this other chick. So she's cheating on me. So my lesbian girlfriend is cheating on me with a chick. Fucking humiliating. I know it. I know it's humiliating. Anyway, so she's banging this, this chick. I was banging the proper term for a, a two lesbians having sex. Banging. I can't imagine there's any banging going on. She's subtly... Um, I'm not sure. I, I'll ask... Uh, I'll find a former uh, lesbian and ask what the proper term is terminology is so they're sleeping together and um and so oh it's was, it was horrible bro i go into it in here it's hilarious it's hilarious i can't even get into it but i go into it in my book it's it's so bad um i even remember one time that Jana showed up and i was dating this chick allison and Jana bangs on the door one morning and allison comes out wearing just a t-shirt one of my t-shirts and they get into this fucking screaming match with each other and i'm just like what is happening i got two i got the lesbian chick and I got this chick. Oh, one time I was banging. That's not true. I wasn't banging because I never slept with the chick. Okay, so one time I started seeing this chick who was a um, a, buck, a, a, a Buccaneers cheerleader, a black chick that was a black Buccaneers cheerleader. I mean, like, you can't imagine how good this chick looked. And so we go out. We go to sushi. We go back to my place. We're about to have sex. And Jan and I had broken up, but she still had a key to my house. She comes in. I remember I'm about to have sex with this chick. And I hear this, dee dee. And it was the alarm system. And I'm like, <gasps> and like, we're, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm like, she's spreading you. I'm on top. I'm, 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 I'm about to. And I'm like, oh, oh. And she looks at me. It's just like, she's like, oh my God, is that the girlfriend? Like, cause I, I, you know, she knew we were broken up, but she's like, oh my God. And I was like, um, hold on. Cause I thought maybe it's Rudy. Because Rudy had a key. So I jump up and I run into the kitchen and I'm Jana already had this chick's purse dumped out. She was dumping out all of her stuff and opened up her wallet and saw that it was a it was, it was a black chick. And she goes, a black girl? A black? She, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I was like, hey, 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 now calm down. I said, listen, you, you can't even, you can't be coming in here. Like you can't. Um, I, I, I mean, and I was, listen, this chick's standing in the middle of the kitchen with a bunch of knives around her. And I, I mean, I just remember thinking she'd kill me. She'd kill me and this chick. Anyway, the black girl grabs, she's, she gets completely clothed, says, just give me my purse. I want to leave. I gave her the purse and she, she took off. It's a little bit more complicated than that, but that's the simple version. And I remember she took off. Gianna goes. Did you sleep with her? Did you fuck her? Did you fuck her? Because Jana's still there. She's not leaving. And I went, yeah. I said, I, I said, no. I said, okay. I said, about that much. And she goes, what does that mean? I said, I mean, I was, that's what was happening. I was this far in when, you, when the alarm system went off. And she goes, did you sleep with her? I went, well, no, you ruined it for me. And I mean, she just was furious, bro. It was so bad. Um, and uh, yeah, she ends up spending the night. So, but then she catches me. Then another, she didn't even catch me because we weren't even dating. She just kept chasing these chicks off. So then it was this, then this chick, Allison. Allison knew what was going on because Allison was helping me run a scam in uh, Palm Harbor, which is basically like, let's say St. Pete. So isn't Palm Harbor in St. Pete area, basically, roughly? Kind of Clearwater. Like, yeah. yeah. So let's just say whatever, Palm Harbor, Clearwater area. I had renovated a house. I, I mean, sorry, renovated a house. I, we, she and I rented a house, satisfied the mortgage on the house, and we were refinancing the house. We transferred the warranty deed into 
the name Rosita Perez. Allison had the name had uh, had a, a, an idea name Rosita Perez. So she's renovating the property, or sorry, refinancing the property multiple times. She goes to a couple closings. She signs. She ends up signing. Uh, she ends up signing several mortgage for several mortgages and gets the gets the payment. But one of them, that place wouldn't give her the money. They said something's wrong. You don't look like your ID. But it was actually her and the ID. What she had done was she got the picture of the ID with black curly hair. She had gone out and dyed her hair and had it curled. So she gets the picture of the ID with black curly hair. But then when she, a week, two weeks later when we go to the closings, she changed her hair back. So now it's brown and brown with blonde highlights and it's straight. So she doesn't look anything like the picture anymore. It's still her, but it just, the, just doesn't look like her. So they said, yeah, just, we, we think there's an issue, so we're going to make some phone calls. So Allison comes out without the check. She said, yeah, listen, these people are freaking out. Like, they, they didn't want to give me the check. They, they said they were going to make some calls. They end up calling around. They find out that they, they figure out pretty quickly that it's not, it's not her. So that's an issue, right? So they're calling around, and, and they eventually figure it out. And uh, it's complicated to understand how they figure it out, but they figure it out. But we did have a check. We had one check. So Allison and Travis decide they're going to deposit the check into a bank account that Travis has. So he deposits it. Um, And we have to wait for the money to to clear, which was going to take, you know, back then it's not like now where it's like the next day it's cleared or half of it's cleared right away. And then the next day it's cleared. Like this take, this used to take like 10 days. Well, and you know, look, you, you got to understand how many properties, you know, how many we were refinancing and pulling out money and letting go. And it was a juggling act. Well, like 10 days later, Travis go, drives to Orlando to pull out some of the money because we deposited a check for like 100 grand or something. Well, that check had been red flagged because the title company had tracked down um, the, had tracked back to uh, the other title company. The two title companies figured out what, something was wrong. They got together and figured it out. They put a, then they tracked where the lender, the money was for the lender. It would lent the money. They put a, a red, a red, a notice. They red flagged the, the check. So when the check went through, they didn't give her the check. They just called Travis. The, the bank called Travis and said, Hey, hi, um, Michael White. We would like to for you to come in. We need you to sign the back of the check again. We need to witness the signature, which was weird. So I remember calling Travis and said, "Hey, man, what's going on? Are you going? You're going to the bank?" He's like, "Yeah." I said, "What's up?" He said, "Yeah, I'm going there, but they 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 said that they need to witness me signing the back of the check because it's such a large check." Well, look, I've 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 signed backs of checks for two hundred thousand dollars and deposited them. Nobody ever said you had to witness a check. Like, it was just totally weird. And I went, nah, bro, something's wrong. Don't go to the bank. That whole thing, we got to scratch that whole thing. Well, Allison was there going, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Well, she's desperate for the money. And I'm like, no, it's not fine. Something's definitely wrong. Travis says, yeah, bro, I'm going to go in. I'm, I'm good with the guy. Like, the owner, like, I mean, the, the bank manager, like, I'm cool with him. Like, he's, he's, like, cool with him, like, what? You say hi to him? Like, he's not going to tell you that you're committing fraud? Like, he's not going to, he's going to let, let it go? This is the dumbest thing ever. Anyway, Travis walks in the bank, and so he walks in, and he's like, hey, I'm going in right now, and I remember I was yelling at him not to go in, he hangs up on me, he's like, yeah, it's fine, bro, calm down. He, he walks in, and then I never heard from him again. I called and called and called and called, and later that night, I called his cell number from like a pay phone. No, I called his real number, not, I was, was calling, um, I was calling his cell from my phone, wasn't going through. Then I call the Michael White's cell phone from a payphone, and an officer answers. And I'm like, "Hi, is Michael White there?" And they're like, "Who's this?" And I was like, "This is, you know, you know, whatever, Brandon, you know, Brandon Green or whatever." I said, and he said, uh, "This is Officer, you know, this is Officer Dunn with the, you know, whatever, Ultimate, you know, Police Department or whatever, whoever it was." And I was like, "Oh shit." And he said, how do you know Mr. Uh, how do you know Mr. White? And, he, and I just hung up the phone. I was like, he's been arrested. This is horrible. So 
Travis was in jail. I had to get him out of fucking jail. I had to hire a, I remember, I had to pay like $15,000 to get a lawyer. Had to get him, one, get him out of jail. Two, pay fifteen grand to get him a lawyer. Then he starts coming around saying, hey, Matt, I need money. I mean, obviously, we're not doing the scam. I need money. Like, um, they're going to shut off my electric. And, and, and you know, can you give me some? Sure. How much do you need? Oh, $1,000 for this? No problem. A couple weeks later, hey, bro, I need like two grand for that. No problem. I'm cutting him a check for two grand. I mean, he starts just milking me for money. I gave him twenty five grand to start a lawn. I mean, not a lawn care, a, uh, a tree trimming business. So he buys all this equipment. I ended up getting him a. I bought him a, a a Dodge Ram. I bought him the tree trimming thing. I bought him the. I mean, listen, I bought him so much stuff. <laughs> so desperate for him to not cooperate against me. But the truth is, he was already cooperating <laughs> with a task force. He got himself out of, like, he got out, like, the next day on bond because he told them, this is what's happening. This is a guy I'm working with. And it wasn't hard to convince them that there was a scam. He said, look, go to Hillsborough County property appraiser record and look. Look up the name James Red. Bam. Five houses in the name James Red. All of them in foreclosure. You know, or Brandon Green. All of them in foreclosure. You know, um... Uh, Lee Black, all of them in foreclosure. You know, uh, David Silver, foreclosure. Um, it's funny because, like, that whole thing was unraveling. And I knew it was unraveling. Like, every time I saw him, I could just feel that it, I knew it was coming down. I just knew it. Uh, God, I was, yeah, it was definitely coming down. That is, it's funny because of all the loans... I only went in I only went in and signed one time. I signed for a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar credit line for James Red. Now remember Eric Tamargo had gone in a bunch of times and signed for Red. I didn't want to keep calling him because he he was figuring it out pretty quickly that he wanted more and more money. So I just went in one day to Sun Trust and I signed for like a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar credit line on a piece of property that I bought. And at, at this point, you have to think the houses we weren't recording the value of the houses at two hundred thousand anymore. We're sell, we're recording the values of the houses now at like three hundred thousand, three fifty. So we're buying bigger and bigger. We we had switched to quadplexes. So quadplexes and duplexes and triplexes, and they're massive. And so we're we're recording the value at two, three hundred thousand. This is twenty years ago almost. No wait, no. This is almost twenty years ago. Almost twenty years ago. So you have to think if these houses are worth three hundred thousand then, that would be like a six hundred thousand dollar house now. And so the kind of money, you know, if you say, Oh, you have a million dollars back then, it was like 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 two million dollars now. So I so that was like a half a million dollar credit line. So we get I get this two hundred fifty thousand dollar credit line, and now I've I'm definitely involved. Like you could definitely see where I went in. Where before I was very remote. Yeah, some money went into my bank account here. Like you know, it it, it would not that they couldn't have, they would have, they would have buried me anyway. I mean, it was done. I was done anyway. But, and I knew when things were coming down, I knew it was bad because I knew that the, the judge, you know, I knew, I knew I was doomed. Like if that judge saw me again, he was going to hammer me. I knew you you go in front of a judge again, twice. It ain't good. They're not happy with you, especially since he didn't give me any prison time the first time. Uh, yeah, that's when one day. Yeah, one day, uh, I realized that that Travis is definitely cooperating and that things are coming down. They're definitely coming down on me. So, yeah, at the same time, so at the same time, I had met a chick. I, I was dating, like, I was, I'm dating a bunch of different women. And I met a chick by the name of Rebecca. Well, Rebecca was, um, she was a train wreck, bro. Like she had a kid, uh, she had just moved to the area. She worked at the dog track um, from Vegas. She'd been lived in Vegas, moved to the dog, dog moved to St. Pete, lived at the dog track. I met her on Match.com. We've been out a couple of times. Like we, like she's driving across the bridge to Tampa. You know, we'd slept together. I don't know a dozen times, like over the month or two, like we're not even serious. It's not like it's just even like a serious relationship. Like I'd known like a month, 
month and maybe two months. Not even two months, bro. It was like a, like a month and a half. I barely even know this chick. And uh, I remember she, like, you know, she knew that I was, she knew I was on federal probation. She knew that I had done some stuff. She knew, like, we'd gone to a couple of movies. We we went to, um, God, did we see, like, Matchstick Men? And we had talked about scams. And she kind of knew that I was, uh, a questionable character well so we're dating and it's okay it's going okay well what happens is in the midst of this whole this chaotic situation which is super high stress bro like i mean i'm i'm taking like xanax i'm i mean i'm having panic attacks like i'm at this point i'm i'm taking paxil which is a anti uh you know for anti-anxiety like i'm 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 like desperately trying to keep my anxiety in check I got I got Jana chasing chicks off. I got Allison, you know, she's getting a divorce from her husband. I got to move her into an apartment. I mean, I've got it's just total chaos. And um at this point I'm going into banks pulling out money, They're going to actually go into closings. I mean, I just had gotten so cocky and sloppy. And then one day I'm at I'm at work. I'm sitting at work at the development company and one day, this sheriff deputy walks in. His name's Steve Sutton. I had done about a million, maybe $2 million worth of loans for him. And they were all fraudulent. And so he comes walking in full in his full outfit. This is at like 4 o'clock. And he comes walking in. I, I, I He goes, hey, Matt, can I talk to you? And I went, yeah, what's up? He goes, can I talk to you outside? I went, sure. So I walk outside. I'm like, yeah, what's up? And he says, um, oh, you know what it was? I already, one of the reasons I knew for sure that things were going bad was that there was an there was a a reporter by the name of uh, Jeff from the St. Petersburg Times had started calling around asking questions. So title company people were calling me saying, "Look, I just got a phone call from some guy at the St. Petersburg Times asking about this guy James Red or asking about Lee Black or asking about." whatever, Michael White, you know, like they're, they're like naming off phantom people. And I'm like, Oh shit. Then the, um, there was a, a subpoena that was served to one of the title companies and they called me and said, look, we got a subpoena. We're not supposed to tell you that we got the subpoena, but I'm letting you know, Matt, we're friends. I wanted to let you know, we just got a subpoena. I'm just like, Oh man, this is bad. So, and that was from the, the uh, task force. And and so, oh my god, sorry, I need more coffee. So what what happens is Steve Sutton walks in. So I already know things are bad. Steve Sutton walks in and he says, "Listen, man, can I talk to you outside?" And I go, "Sure." So we walk outside. And I said, "What's going on, Steve?" And he says, "Look, I used to date this chick. I used to date this chick that works for the Tampa PD." I said, "Okay," and he was a sheriff's deputy. And I went, "All right," and he goes. She came to my house this morning, like six, seven o'clock in the morning. And she said she had been working on a task force. I said, all right. He said, the task force was investigating the arrest of a guy named Travis Hayes in Orlando. And I went, okay. He said, he's cooperating. He's been cooperating with the task force and they've completely put this whole thing together. And they know that you're running a, a massive, massive fraud. And they're going to come, they're going to arrest you. And I was like, well, when? And he said, well, not now, but like yesterday, they handed the task force over to the FBI. The FBI is going to come arrest you in the next couple of days. This is like a Thursday. And I was like, okay. He said, she told me because my name came up about it. And she knows that we're friends. And she told me to stay away from you because not to talk to you on the phone, just to stay away from you. I said, all right. He said, um, what are you going to do? I said, I mean, I'm leaving. And he goes, what should I do? I said, just tell him that, tell him that I arranged all the loans for you. And you don't know anything. Like I, I wanted to buy this house. He arranged some loans and that was it. He arranged the loan for me. I, I showed up at the closing. I signed paperwork. I mean, how am I supposed to know what he was doing? I don't know. I said, you should be fine. I said, I'm not going to be here to tell him any different because I'm going to leave. And he said, all right, man, good luck. So we shake hands, he leaves. I walked inside. I remember I went to Allison. I said, Allison, I wrote a check right then. I need you to go get $8,000 out of the bank right now. 
I started writing people checks left and right, left and right to go, go cash checks at different accounts with it. By the next day, I had gotten out $80,000. That was all I could get out. You know, I mean, it seems like a lot of money, like, but if you've got millions of dollars in the bank, millions of dollars in real estate, you've got like, basically I had like a, I had like a couple, like I had like 20 or 30 minutes left in the banking day and I had the next day and all I could get out was that. And I remember I had this one account. So I had got, I had student loans, like $30,000 in student loans, which I'd never paid off because they're at like 1% interest, right? So you, you just make, you don't pay off a 1% interest loan. It's free. So, uh, it's like free money. And I, I was so tired of making these little $120 payments. I had just paid off. That was like, like literally the night before the loan, the check had gone through. I paid off like 30,000 and I was like, Oh my God, <laughs> this is 30 grand. I could have gotten out anyway. So I, uh, out of my personal account, right? So I got out as much money as I could, as quickly as I could. And that night I didn't want, I remember thinking, I don't want to stay at my house. So I started packing my bags. So I'm stuffing a bunch of duffel bags full of clothes and computers, everything I could think of. And I remember I was supposed to go out with Rebecca, Becky, the chick I'd been dating, supposed to go out with her that night. Totally had blown off her phone calls, everything. She drove across the bridge, came to my house, walks in. And I remember when she came in, like, like just walked it. Like I thought, I thought that was the FBI. I thought they, I like, oh my God, they're, they're here. She walked in and she was like, what are you doing? Like, she sees me. I'm panicked. I'm stuffing. She's clearly, I'm going somewhere. I said, hey, uh, I'm, uh, I'm leaving. She goes, where are you going? I said, I'm leaving. I said, look, I'm be honest with you. I said, look, I was running kind of a, a scam. And I just tell her what happened. Bam, bam, bam. They're coming to arrest me. Like, any time now. And I, she said, you're just going to leave? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, well, I want to go with you. And I went, what are you talking about? We don't even know each other. Like, what are you? What are you talking about? Like, you've got a kid. You've got, like, you got a kid here. You got family. You've got, you don't want to go with me. I mean, we don't even know each other. And she goes, we're in love. And I was like, yeah, I listen, I don't know about that. I like you. I don't know about being in love. I said, look, you know, and she goes, look, no, she, she's, I said, look, you've got, you're a stable person. You're a normal person. She goes, I'm not a normal person. She said, listen, she said, let me explain something. She goes, I've, I, j- I've just claimed bankruptcy. I've been married. She'd been married twice. She, I've been married twice. She said, my son is, is he's failing school. He's been caught outside uh, for curfew. He's been picked up for cur- you know, breaking curfew several times. She was he's smoking pot. I can't control him. She said, I'm sending him back to live with his father. She said, I'll be here. I'll be all alone. He's going, he was going back in like a month anyway. She goes, I'll send him back and I'll come with you. And I go, are you, are you insane? I go, That's crazy. You don't up and leave somebody for someone you just met a couple of months ago. And she was like, I don't care. I'm in love with you. I want, I said, look, this is never going to become love for me. And she went, listen, she said, can you get the money? And I, and I went, yeah. Cause I told her I was going to, she goes, what are you going to do? I said, I got like 80 grand. I'm going to go commit some more fraud and I'm just going to start pulling money out of houses. And I'm just going to, you know, get a bunch of money and try, maybe leave the United States. And she went, can you get the money? And I went, yeah. She goes, how much money are you planning on getting? I go, I don't know, a few million dollars invested in real estate and just kind of kick back the rest of my life. And that's the best I've, best hope I've got. And she said, if you can get the money, I don't care if this ever turns into love. I don't care if it's love. I want to come with you. I'll help you. And I was like, what are you doing? And she goes, she goes you don't even know. I said, that you're, you got to break the law. She goes, listen. She said, do you know why I'm in St. Pete? And I went, why? She said, because... I was embezzling money from the law firm that I used to work w- w- for. She said I was embezzling money to pay my my um my gambling debts and she said my boss, the lawyer I worked for found out about it and he didn't call the police because I was sleeping with him and he didn't want his wife to find out. So instead he called his client, one of his clients which is a huge company that owns a bunch of casinos and a dog track in Tampa. And it was the furthest place he could send her to get her out of Vegas. So one, he said, you don't owe me the money you stole. I'm giving you some money. We're going to move you to Las Vegas and I'm done with you. And she, he moved her to Las Vegas. She started working for the dog track and he quashed the money that 
he owed her or that she owed, sorry, quashed the money that she owed him. And I remember thinking to myself, you're a lying, cheating, thieving, degenerate gambler. I mean, she really was like the perfect partner in crime. I mean, all of those were attributes for as far as I was concerned. Like this is a, this is a, a you know, this is a, um, <laughs> this is a, a, an, an insane chick that will do anything. And she's desperate to come with me. And I was like, you know, look, I was nervous and I was scared and I was afraid. And I, 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 I was desperate and I didn't know what the future held, but, but I didn't have to be alone. And that was a huge burden to take off on my own and just do it by myself. So I'm supposed to steal millions of dollars, just me, nobody's help. That's a tall order. I'd had lots of help before. So I wasn't sure I could do it by myself. I, I was pretty sure. But, you know, it's easier if you have somebody else to answer, help answer the phones and help do things. And she wanted to come. So I was like, all right, let's go get your stuff. So we went and we got her stuff. Over the course of the weekend, we ran up all of my credit cards, all of the synthetic identities credit cards, bought a new vehicle, bought like a $100,000 Audi, traded in my Audi, got a $100,000 Audi, got a temp tag. Um, I remember I told the guy, I want a brand new tag and I want, the, or I, I want a, another tag and I want the tag in the dealership's name. And I want you to keep it the dealership name as long as possible. Because that way, if they see the dealership, they run it. They just not, it goes to the dealership, not me. So they don't know who's in the car. And so I got this Audi, and uh, God, it was an A, was it an A eight or something? It was fucking. This thing had like four hundred and something, four hundred and eighty horsepower. Or something. It was outrageous. It was a four door. So, so I forget the exact Audi it was. But it was a great Audi. So we packed it. I mean, this thing was packed full of stuff. Like we bought as much stuff as we could. Got eighty grand, but I don't want to spend the eighty grand when I can run up my credit cards. I ran up. I remember I'm, I, I left. I must have owed American Express thirty or forty grand. So. Ran up the credit cards. We got like probably close to 70, 80,000, maybe a hundred thousand dollars worth of just stuff. Look, it got so bad by Sunday night where she's buying like purses for two thousand dollars, shoes for fifteen hundred bucks. I mean, it's just ridiculous. We're buying watches. We got like multiple Rolex watches, diamonds. I mean, it's just ran them everything up. And uh yeah, we get in the car and we leave Tampa. When we left Tampa, I wrote a letter to my parents and my ex-wife. Because you have to think, well, oh, we put her son, she put her son, I didn't put her, she put her son on a, on a plane going to Vegas and I wrote a, a letter to my ex-wife because I was leaving my son because I kind of figured, look, I end up in, if I was going to go to prison no matter what, my son was going to, he was never going to see me. My ex-wife wasn't going to drag him to a prison to see me. So I just got in my car and we left. And we, uh, yeah, we took off. We got into a huge fight, huge argument, not a fight, a huge argument on the way to out of town too. Um, like she, I realized during that argument, she was just insane. And uh, I should have turned around right then, but I didn't. I said, okay, you know, we argued. I tried to turn around. I started to turn around and she begged me not to turn around. And uh, we ended up going, we ended up going to Atlanta. So, we wrote a letter. I, I wrote a letter to my ex-wife uh, regarding, you know, just basically uh, um, to my ex-wife and to my son. I wrote a letter to my mother and father. And this becomes important later because I addressed the letter to George and Margaret Cox, which is my mother and father. And I'd signed it, you know, Matt. So, and I just, just basically the letter, I don't know if I want to, did I mention that the letter I just basically just said, explain to them what happened and what was going on and that I was not sticking around to go to federal prison. And that was just, wasn't something I was interested in doing. Um, you know, I intended to run. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just, I'm too cute to go to federal prison. And the only, the only, the only things I knew about federal prison was I'd watched a movie called, you know, Shawshank Redemption. And I'd watched uh, a movie called uh, The Animal Factory, and all all the movies I'd seen on fed on on if, sorry on just prison in, prisons in general. Not a good situation. I'm not a big guy. I'm five foot six, weigh 160, 170 pounds. I'm I'm just I'm just 
I'm too cute to go to prison. It's just not going to, it's not going to end up well for me. And I know that. So we're, we're on our way to uh, Atlanta and we get there and, you know, we had no, no credentials, right? Like I had a, a fa- I, had a, I had some fake, some IDs, I had some, some IDs, but they were fake IDs that I basically had created myself. So very quickly we rented, we rent an apartment and we moved out of that apartment and moved into, well, first we rented, first we stayed in hotels for whatever, a week. Then we rented an apartment using a fake ID and, you know, I had no credit, but I was able to show that I had, obviously I was able to show that I had four or five years worth of uh, rental history and, um, well, of employment. And I had several years of rental history. And even though I had no real credit, I did have an ID. And so I simply had to put down double the security deposit and we rented a place in a midtown in Atlanta. So it was right on Peachtree. Uh, and so we rented this, uh, this apartment and immediately we went to, within days. This was, this was in, I don't know if I mentioned this, this was in December, early December, 2003. So we immediately go to, I didn't want to get a driver's license in Georgia because in Georgia they take your fingerprints. And although I, I knew they didn't run them, they keep them on file. I just didn't want it. I just didn't want to give them my fingerprints. So we went to Alabama and I had stolen the information of a guy by the name of Scott. So I'd taken this guy Scott's information, who I'd done a loan for. He was a, he was actually an account executive that I'd worked for, and I had kind of tricked him into telling me what his mother's maiden name was and where he was born, and I'd ordered his birth certificate, and I had a copy of his social security card, and so I went to Alabama, and I made a fake lease for an apartment in Alabama, which was actually a UPS box. So I went into the DMV, in Atlanta and I got them to issue me a driver's license in his name. So it's got, it's, it's Scott, but it's my picture and it's a valid driver's license. I then came, went back to Atlanta and then we rented a house, you know, cause the whole purpose of going to Atlanta was to try and get some money. I mean, I had like 80 grand in cash and we had a bunch of stuff, but we didn't have jobs and we couldn't live the way we were living, we, we wouldn't last very long in Atlanta on 80 grand. So I ended up, I rented a house from a guy by the name of Michael in Alpharetta, Georgia, which is just, just outside of Atlanta, just like a, kind of like a suburb. So I, I rent this house. The house is worth about 190, 200,000. And this is like almost 20 years ago. And you know, I don't know what that house would be worth now, probably whatever, three, 400,000 at least. So we rent this house and I go downtown to Fulton County, which is the county that holds public records for, for Alpharetta. I go downtown and I check the, I end up checking the, uh, uh, real estate public records and I see that Michael owns the property. Well, Mike had two mortgages from Bank of America on that property. And w- so what I did was I prepared a satisfaction of lien or mortgage. So it's the same thing. Satisfaction of mortgage for his first mortgage that he had on his house and his, his uh, second mortgage because he had a first and a second mortgage. So I prepared the a lien on, or a satisfaction of lien or mortgage on those, and I I typed it out and printed it out and signed it. I ordered a notary stamp, went and picked up a notary stamp. So I I had a notary stamp. I signed the witnesses and signed from whoever was, you know, supposedly from Bank of America that had satisfied. You know, I just made up some name, and then I recorded it. The reason I didn't transfer the property into somebody else's name is because public records was so far behind in Fulton County. It was actually like 10, like 10 to 12 weeks behind. So once I recorded that document, it was going to take almost three months before it showed up in the system. 
So I would have first had to have recorded that. Then I would have had to transfer the title into somebody else's name. I mean, it, it would have just been a real issue. It was easier for me to simply make a fake ID that I, I used a child's social security number and I created kind of like what's called a, it's like a synthetic identity. It's kind of like a shadow. Um, how do I explain this? It's, a, it's, like a, it's like a separate credit profile for a real person. So I used some of his information, but I did. I used his part of his name. I changed it slightly, and then I didn't use his date of birth, and I didn't use a lot of. I didn't use a lot of his pertinent information. So I cr it created a completely different synthetic identity, but I was still able to use the driver's light or the fake ID that I'd made. And and then basically, I opened up a few bank accounts in his name. I opened up a few corporate accounts. Uh, well, you know, we we opened up a corporation. We opened up some corporate accounts. We then opened up some accounts in the name of Scott Becky. I ended up getting Becky another, uh, another a fake driver's or fake uh, identity. She opened up a few bank accounts in her name, and we basically just we just had to sit back and wait. We had to wait about three months for all of this to take for the for that whole scam to mature, and for the new satisfaction of mortgages to get recorded in public record. You know, the thing is, but the thing is, is like it, sitting around waiting was a problem because then we ended up burning even more money. You know, now we, we ended up, you know, Becky, by this point, I realized Becky's got some, some mental problems. I didn't really know her when we took off on the run. And I realized right away she's, she's got, a, she's bipolar. She has bipolar condition. She didn't really know it. Like she knew something was wrong. Uh, and, and, you know, at, at this point she told me, we were, we had been talking and she'd explained to me that she'd been divorced several times and that several guys that she had dated had, had just left her like in the middle, like she would come home. She said, I, I like on a couple occasions, she'd been living with someone came home. And when she came home, the guy was gone. Like she, the guy had cleaned out the apartment and just left. And, you know, she was like, I was like, wow, you sounds like you've dated some, some real jerks. And she's like, I know. Right. But the truth is, is like, she's been divorced three times. She's had multiple guys just leave her and all the divorces, the guys just like left, like they just, they just took off. And it was like, that's weird that they would just ever, that this, that's your, the, that's the cycle with you is that you date some guy and then he just takes off on you. And that's strange. But, you know, after looking at it, it really wasn't that strange. Like after dating her, I started realizing she put me in a in a a, a, a fight or flight mode constantly during these fights. Like she would get so erratic, and, and these arguments would get so, you know, hyped up where she was just screaming and hollering, and and like she'd get the you know to the point where you think the cops are going to get called, or you think she's going to physically attack you. And all I wanted to do was leave. Like, I don't want to hurt her. I don't want to get into a physical confrontation with her. I just want to leave. And she was blaming me for everything. I mean, everything was my fault. Uh, I'd ruined her life. And I'm like, you begged to come with me. You wanted to come with me. I told you what was happening. You knew what was happening. Like, you you asked to come with me. Didn't matter. It was my fault. Uh, I hate you. And then... Ten minutes later, it was, I love you so much. I, I never want to be without you. You're the most amazing person I've ever met. I'm so lucky to be with you. I mean, it was really insane. And, and you know, just mentally, she was just so fucked up. You know, not that I'm the, the, the picture of mental health. Uh, but compared to her, I was. Uh, so we're waiting around. We're, we're, we're doing stuff like we're going on vacations. We're going like we're... we're we're flying all over the place and we're going to like, like parts of Bermuda or the, um, wait, we went to Jamaica, we go to Jamaica. Oh yeah. That, that's the thing. By this point I had gone online to steal identities. I had placed ads in like the flyer newspapers, which would be like, what would the equivalent would be, um, what is it now? You put go online, you put, uh, these, Like the free publications that you can put stuff for sale. Um, wow. Yellow pages or something? I don't know. 
Oh, gee, like now you're telling me if you want to sell your house, where would you put? If you want to sell something, you would put, or if you want to buy something, you would put it at, fuck, I, it's, it's Craigslist. Oh. Jesus. So you, it would be like, like you put a, like a job out. I put like an opera, I put something out on Craigslist, let's say, but it was called the flyer. They don't think they have the flyer anymore. It, you'd, I would run an ad in the flyer and I'd pay a couple hundred bucks and it would run a little ad that would say good credit, bad credit, no problem. So good credit, bad credit, no problem. Free loan applications, call now. And it had my phone number. So then I'd run this ad and I'd get like 50, 60 calls a day. So I'm answering the phone and I was, what was it? It was, uh, I was calling it um, like United Capital Mortgage or something. I United Capital Mortgage, help me help you. And they'd say, hey, I'm calling on your ad. Uh, I was, I'm thinking about buying a house. And I'd go, okay, uh, well, um, do you want to fill an application out now or do you want to fill one out? Um, do you want to do it online? You can do it online. Of course, you can't do it online. I didn't have a website or anything. And they go, uh, they all always said, no, nah, man, I'll fill it out now. I'll fill it out now. And, and I'd say, okay, sure. So we take an application. They would say, yeah, bro, uh, problem is, dude, like I got like a, you know, I got bad credit. Like I got some credit, a repo, and I got some bad student loans and I would I would I'd say that's pro- bro don't even worry about it we got a program for that we to- I can totally get you in a house let's go ahead and take an application let's get you sorted out and let's get you into a pro- get you into a house as soon as possible I definitely can get you a loan you know it didn't matter what they said I was going to tell them we have a program for that oh I just had a foreclosure I'm in for they could say I'm in foreclosure I'd say bro don't worry we got a government program for that we can totally get that taken care of not going to be a problem I can get you in a house I'm just trying to get them to give me their information so they would fill out the application, you know, they'd give me their name, date of birth, everything. And I just ask a couple ex- extra questions, which, which would be like, where were you born? What county were you born in? They'd say, you know, Hillsborough County. What's your mother's maiden name? They'd say, oh, her name is, you know, Jennifer Smith. Okay. And, and now I have enough to steal their identity. Like just by telling me their full name, what county they were born in and their mother's maiden name, I can now, and their date of birth, I can steal your identity. So they would give me their information. I'd say, okay, great. Look, I'm going to go ahead and pull your credit and I'm going to give you a call back. It'll probably be later today or tomorrow. Then I would, after, by the end of the day, I would pick out the ones that I liked. Like I like this guy. He's about my age. This woman's about, about Becky's age. We'd have four or five different names. And then I'd take all of the paperwork and I'd call a local mortgage company and I would say, hey, I have... 50, you know, some odd applications. Do you guys want to, you know, I'm with a mortgage company. We're, we we only take so many per month. We're at our quota. I'd like to go ahead and give these to you. Just take the applications, pull these people's credit and call them back. So I'd, I, I'd send over the applications. I'd actually fax them. I don't think people use faxes anymore, but so I would actually, you know, it's like a scan document, whatever. So I'd fax over the, all the applications to them. They would then call, pull these people's credit and call them back. So the people get their credit pulled and they don't ever think anything's wrong. Like they get a call back from a mortgage company that says, yeah, that the guy that initially you called on and took it, the application, that's a more, a guy that generates leads for, you know, for us or whatever. And they call them back and it totally makes sense to them if they question it at all. I talked to a guy named, they'd say, I talked to a guy named John on the phone. He took my application. Who are you? Oh, my name's Nancy. And I'm calling you back We, I, with this mortgage company. We pulled your credit and we can get you a loan. Or we can't get you a loan. We pulled your credit and you're horrible. Now it's Nancy's problem to tell them that they they can't get a loan. Either way, I have the information that I wanted. So out of like 30, 40, 50 applications, I would, have, I would cherry pick five or six people that were close to my age. And I would then order their documents. So I'd go online and I would order their birth certificates and their social security cards. And sometimes I'd register to vote in their name. And then I'd order their high school transcripts. And now I have enough information to steal your identity. I could go down to, I would go to whatever. I'd go to South Carolina, North Carolina, Alabama. There's plenty of state, Florida. Go into the DMV. I'd have to show proof of residency. So I would register to vote in that state and I'd get a a voter's registration card within a couple days and I'd get the voter's registration card or I would get a lease agreement. I'd make a fake lease agreement, fill out the lease agreement for some local UPS store, go open up a box at the UPS store in case something gets mailed there for these guys and I'd get mail there. 
So on the on the the lease looks like it's an apartment, but it's actually a UPS store, so you can mail stuff there. I would then go into the local DMV, say, "Hey, my name is." For instance, one of the first ident- identities I did was uh, Michael Shannon. No, a guy named uh, Michael Eckert. So I went and I would go in and get a driver's license in the name of, let's say, Michael Eckert's name, and I would give them. Like I did this actually, I think in. North Carolina, because I relocated at some point later in North to North Carolina, and would go went into North Carolina, gave them Michael Eckert's birth certificate, social security card. Now that's my proof of that's those are my two primaries. Then you need a secondary, which is really your social security card also works as your secondary, um, and then I would give them a voter's registration card. Or I would give them a lease agreement proving residency. And they would say, okay, go ahead and uh, wait over here and stand in line. And 30 minutes later or 20 minutes later, they'd call you up and they'd type all the information in. And they have you stand in front of the, you know, stand in front of the little background. They take my picture and boom, they give me a driver's license or an ID or whatever. And multiple times I had to take driver's license tests. You know, they make you take the written test. So, which isn't written, it's obviously on a computer. But the point is, is that I would get that ID. So in Michael Eckert's name, I got Michael Eckert's name. I think I got a passport in his name. So Becky and I had a passport, had our passports in two fake names. And we went to a few different places. One of the places was, I remember Jamaica. Remember Jamaica because going through uh, w- cause when we came back from Jamaica, I was so flipped out because I was thinking that Becky, because she'd been smoking pot, the ho- she smoked dope the whole time we were there because there, she's a big pot fan. So the whole time she was stoned that we, when we were in Jamaica. And I remember on the way back think, telling her, if you put anything in your fucking luggage, like you're trying to bring anything back, like that's going to be a problem. No, no, and she kept joking with me that if they if they asked to look in her luggage just to run, and I was like, this, it's not even funny. So, so I remember going through. I remember we got into an argument waiting in line in, uh, um, in cus- at customs, and I went to the bathroom, came back, and she'd already gone through the line. So by the time I got there, they were like, "Okay, are you traveling traveling alone?" I said, "No, I'm traveling with another." With um, this, and I gave her her name. I forget it was it was something else. I, anyway, uh, Grace Hudson or something. So I gave her 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 name that she was using, and they were like, "Where is she?" I said, "I don't know." When, I don't, she was in line. I went to the bathroom. Now she's gone. They were like, "So you didn't stay in line with her?" I go, well, "No, I didn't stay. I went into the bathroom, came back." Like it was a big issue, standing there at customs with this fucking dude. And anyway, he let me through because she had gone all, all. She'd already gone through. Just, just she was just such a jerk off. All right, so, you know, we're, we're basically doing anything to burn time. We're going mountain climbing, we're going hiking, we're going indoor mountain climbing, we're doing all kinds of stuff, skydiving, like we're just, we're just doing anything we can to burn off the time. We went to Disney World for a week, and we drove to Orlando and went to Disney World for a week. I mean, we're just doing anything. We went to, oh, we went to New Orleans. No, wait, did we didn't go to New Orleans then. You know what we did? We ran another scam, and we went to Tallahassee because public records in Tallahassee was only like a week behind. So I remember we rented a house in Tallahassee from this guy, and it was in his ex-wife's name, and he was helping her out. So we rented the house, and we got two loans on the house for like fifty thousand a piece. So we're going to get like a hundred thousand dollars, and we got, and so Becky go- goes. And I had originally wanted to do the loan. Do the, do, I was going to transfer the deed out of this woman's name into my name. And Becky was saying, no, no, it's better off if I just pretend to be her. We'll, get, we'll make a fake ID in her name, and I'll be her. Just satisfy the loan, because that way she's owned it for like 10 years. It looks, more, it looks more reasonable that you're refinancing a house that's been you've owned for 10 years than one that you bought a week or, a week or two ago. And that does, but it had never been an issue. But she wanted in on the whole thing. She wanted to like do her part. So I said, okay, no problem. 
and I was going to do like three or four loans. But we didn't. We only needed a little bit of money at the time because we were running low. What we ended up doing was I I went and I satisfied the mortgage on this woman's house. This woman had a mortgage and she had like two judgments on her. So I satisfy both the judgments and the mortgage because it's the same basic document. So I satisfy all of these this stuff on her house. And now Becky owns the house. The name woman's name was Teresa Knight. So she owned the house in the name Teresa Knight. We then I then applied for like three, two or three different mortgage with hard money lenders and they were going to lend her money. So she's going to get like, she like, I think it was two. I think it got down to like, she was going to borrow two different mortgages for like fifty five, fifty six thousand dollars $56,000 each mortgage. So she goes to the one closing. We go to the closing. She gets the 50 some odd thousand dollars. And the next day we were going to do the second closing. And on the way home, we got into an argument. I remember in, in like in my book, I go over what the argument's about. Um, it's, it, it literally, this was the argument. I'm, I'm going to explain this. This is how fucking insane this chick was. The argument was this, that as we're driving, she goes, Oh my God, we just made like $56,000. And we, I think the check was for like, we think we borrowed like 60 and she walked away with like, let's say 56, I think. So she's like, Oh my God, we just made $56,000. That took like less than a month. She says, that's $56,000. And I went, well, yeah, I mean, less expenses. And we're driving and she goes, what? I go, well, less expenses. I mean, gas, car payments, driving down here, you know, spending, you know, this, you know, a couple of hotel nights, like we stayed in the hotel, that's, you know, food that we could have been eating. Whole, like there's, there's expenses, but yeah, it's roughly 56,000. I said roughly, but less expenses. And she goes, you're fucking sucking all the fun out of this for me. And I went, well, what? And she goes, I mean, what it, it less expenses and I went no I'm not saying we didn't make money I'm saying yeah we made money I'm saying but it's not fifty six thousand dollars it's fifty six thousand dollars less about four or five hundred dollars in expenses so it's but yeah you're right it's about fifty six thousand fifty six thousand and she goes she's you know what I want to go home let's just go let's just go back to let's just go back to Atlanta and I went well, no, no, we, we have to close the other, the other lo- loan is tomorrow. It's, it was for like 60 grand. I go, it's like 60 grand tomorrow. And she goes, I said, we got to close tomorrow. And she goes, no, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I said, I go, Becky, I go, it's $60,000. What do you mean? It's 60 grand. And she goes, less expenses. And I go, what the, what the fuck does that mean? What, what the fuck are you saying? I go, it's, it's 50, it's 60 grand. And she goes, I'm not doing it. It's too risky. I go, it, whoa, 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 whoa. I said, it's not too risky. It's already gone through underwriting. It's already, we've already talked to the guys. It's ready to go. We're ready to close. Like they, they've already sent the money. We just have to go pick it up. And she goes, well, I'm not doing it. I said, well, you know, if I'd known you were going to go tits up on me at the last minute, I said, I'd have just done it myself, which was my original plan. She goes, forget it. Let's just go. We get into this huge argument. And, but she wasn't, she wouldn't budge. And so we end up driving back to Atlanta and never closed on the second loan. And that's just what a psycho this chick was. Then, oh, and then so now we've got like $55,000 extra. You know, we've spent probably 30000 in the last few, last mo- couple months. And she says, I remember she goes, she wanted a boob job. So she's like, well, I, I, I want to get a boob job. I'm like, well, why don't we get a boob job with the $60,000 that you left in, in, in Tallahassee? Like the money you didn't get. Why are we getting a boob? Why are we paying for plastic surgery for you with the, with the money that, that you did get, which you left the rest of the money? I'm like, why are we still splitting the money? You left your money. And so, you know, we get into this huge argument. She, she ends up getting a boob job. She got, she got a boob job, liposuction. She got a tummy tuck. She looked amazing. She looked amazing afterwards. It, it, around the same time, I ended up getting, I ended up getting a nose job. So I got a nose job. I got hair, uh, uh, two hair transplants. So like they take the hair from the back of your head, they take the follicles and they re-implant them in the front of your head. 
So you know what you could do? You could put up like a picture of my old mug. My mug. I'll show you the mug shot where I'm like balding in the front, and then you could take a picture of me now. Well, they know what I look like now. You see the the wanted poster? Like if the so yeah, they they redo that. Uh, then I got what's called a mini facelift. They go in behind your ears and they suck out all the junk in your neck. And so I did all this stuff. Uh, got rid of my my love handles. Got what's called gynecomastia surgery because I used to work out all the time. I had um. I had what they call bitch tits, which is a gynecomastia. It's like you get a growth in your, you've seen older guys that have this growth in their chest, right? Like a lump. So they went in and they cut that out. Um, I got some work done. Uh, and so now we're still in Atlanta waiting for, for the satisfaction of mortgages to, to take place. What did we do in Atlanta? Oh, I know what it was. We, sorry. So while this whole time, while we're still screwing around waiting, once we get the 50 some odd thousand, so now we got like maybe, we're still only have probably 80 or 90, probably we're still back at like 90,000, maybe, maybe 90,000, maybe a hundred. And I remember we went to New Orleans. So when we go to New Orleans, oh, oh yeah, this is the other thing. Before we even went to Atlanta, I'm sorry, before we even went to Tallahassee, to borrow the fifty to sixty thousand, whatever it was, before we even went there, the St. Petersburg Times came out with an art article called "Dubious Deals," and this is a, a newspaper in Tampa. It's now called the Tampa Tribune, or is it Tampa Times? Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Times, I think. So they had come out with an article called "Dubious Deals," where this guy Jeff Testerman had he pieced together all of the all of the different um, synthetic identities, the reservoir dogs, th- synthetic identities that I had been using, he pieced all of those together and came out with, came up with this article which explains that there's this guy, Matt Cox, who's currently on federal probation. He drove up the prices on all the in, in this area. He borrowed a bunch of money. Like he's he's quoting law enforcement. He explained he like blows the whole thing wide open. So every couple of days a new article's coming out because now people are talking Law enforcement's talking. They're looking for me. I'm wanted. I'm now on the run. Like, there's all these articles that start coming out. And then we just went to Tallahassee and just stole some more money. And now we're in Atlanta. Well, while we're in Atlanta, these articles are coming out. There's an article. There was a whole series around the same time, in the first six months to a year that we're gone. Whole, a whole series of articles that come, came out in the uh, Chicago Tribune called The Fugitives. Um... Well, we ended up going to New Orleans, and while we were in New Orleans, we just just for like a week or two, I remember we were in New Orleans. We went on a bunch of ghost tours. We hung out. We This was before Katrina. We hung out, went on some ghost tours, uh, you know, rode the trolleys, went to some bars, you know, did the whole New Orleans thing, went to a bunch of museums. Turns out that there's an artist by the name of Matthew Cox the U.S. Marshals had gotten a tip that there was an artist named Matthew Cox that was having an exhibit in New Orleans. Not on, we stayed on Royal Street, right? Because there's Bourbon Street, Royal Street. There's like one street over. Like literally about two to three blocks from where we stayed was a, um, a gallery, an art gallery that was having an exhibit, like a two or three week long exhibit for a guy named, an artist named Matthew Cox. While we're in New Orleans, the U.S. Marshals sent two U.S. Marshals to the gallery to show the gallery owner a photograph of me, my wanted poster. And he said, no, that's not Matthew Cox. That's not the Matthew Cox that I own. I mean, just completely by coincidence, this is what happened. I found this out five or six, year, five or six years later when I ordered the Freedom of Information Act. I found got the U.S. Marshal report that explains that they flew out there went there, the the whole Matthew Cox thing. So I thought that was hilarious or interesting because, I mean, for all I know, we passed right by these guys. They were a couple of blocks away. We were all over that area going to museums and bars and just hanging out. So what, what ended up happening was we then we go, back to, um, we go back to Atlanta. By this point, we now have the, the satisfaction of loans that I had created were now had now shown up in public record. So now I own that house 
in Atlanta in the name Michael Shanahan. I own his house free and clear, and I have a driver's license in his name. I have multiple bank accounts in his name. I actually, by this point, I have credit cards in his name. I have a social security number in his name, not with his social on it, but the social of a, a you know, a, a kid. Um, so I have a social security number in his name. So I have everything I need in his, that I need to close on his house. I then get three hard money. I call three hard money lenders in the area. Just go online and I look them up and find three guys. One comes out at, let's say, 10 o'clock in the morning, looks at the house and says, Oh, Michael, uh, yeah, this is, a, this is a nice house. This is worth about one ninety, two hundred thousand. dollars I'll lend you 150000 on it. I go, okay, great. We schedule a closing at his title company. Around 2 o'clock, another guy shows up, walks around the house, says, yeah, nice house. This is a nice house. It's worth about one ninety, two hundred thousand. dollars I'll lend you one fifty on it. I say, great. We schedule a closing to close on his at his title company. Fourth guy, uh, third guy comes Comes out, whatever, around 4 or 5 o'clock that day. Looks at the house. Everything's great. He's going to lend me $150,000 on it. Schedule another closing. So within a week, now they, they all go to, so they all send an abstractor down to public records. They look at the title. And the title is in the name. The deed is in the name. Mike. I have an idea. It's Michael. I'm in the house. He sees me living in the house. I don't live in the house. I tell him I don't live in the house. I mean, I tell him it's a rental. I'm going to do repairs, put hardwood floors in, put a pool in, put a new roof on. I'm going to do an addition. You know, I tell him I'm going to do all this stuff. Tell him it's a rental property because I can't say I live in the house because if you go in the house, there's nothing in the house except for some bedroom furniture where we're what we're using. I'm like, I didn't furnish the entire house because it doesn't look right. I, I mean, because I'm not, first of all, I'm not going to blow $30,000 on new furniture for a place that I'm going to abandon in a month. So, all of these guys are ready to lend me money on this house. And I'd say a week later, by this point, they've called my employer, which is a telephone number that goes to Becky. So Becky's answering. They might have asked for W-2s and pay stubs. I doubt it. They were hard money lenders. They typically don't. They'd pulled my credit. I have a couple credit cards that showed up, but there's no real credit. It's brand new credit. And if they asked, hey, what's with this credit? Like you only have a couple credit cards that have only been up, open for a month or two. I'd tell them, well, I mean, I had a bankruptcy like 10 years ago, and I haven't really reestablished credit, and I'm just now trying to reestablish credit. And they go, oh, okay, that makes sense. And it does make sense. So we schedule the closings, and I go to the, I go to the title companies, and I close, let's say I close one on, you know, one on a Monday, one on a Tuesday, and then another one on a, on a whatever, Wednesday or Thursday. Not that I couldn't close them all the same day. I'm just saying that within the same day or a few days, I close them all about the same time. I get the checks issued to me. I then turn around and I go deposit all the checks into, into different bank accounts. Well, what I usually did was, instead of having them give me a check for 150000 what I would typically do is I would say, I'd go to the title company, I'd say, hey, listen, I, own some, I owe some general contra- some contractors and I, I owe different people some money. Can you take my $150,000 check, can you break it apart and give me one check for 29000 to this guy? One check for 7000 to this guy. One check for 14000 to this guy. So I would ask them to break up the checks. And um, you know, that's what I typically did. So usually they would do that. They wouldn't have a problem with that. I remember this one title company, they had an issue with that. They were like, oh, we don't know. That's against policy. So they just gave me the check. So I went to their bank and I asked their bank, can you break up this check into different cashier's checks? And I remember the woman gave me a hard time. Like, this is something like I didn't put in the book, but I remember she was like, I'm sorry, that's against policy. We don't do that. I went, okay, well, I remember going, well, the check is good, right? She goes, yeah, it's good, but we don't break up checks into cashier's checks. Like, you don't have a bank account here. And I was like, okay, well, but the check is good. Right. I said, so if I came in here with cash and gassed you to give... If I asked you to buy a cashier's check or a cashier's check with cash and I didn't have a bank account, would you then give it to me? She was like, if you came in with like $2,000 and wanted a cashier's check, I said, yeah. She goes, yeah, we would do that. I said, so what's the difference? This is a check to your bank that you're saying is good. And she was like, I'm sorry, it's just not policy. We just don't do that. I went, but if I wanted to cash this check, you would have to cash it. And she looked at me and she went, well, I mean, it's $150,000. And I was like, right. 
but you still have to cash it. She goes, well, we couldn't cash it at this, at this branch. You'd have to go to a cash transaction branch. And I said, great, can you set that up? And she went, well, why don't you just deposit? I said, I don't want to deposit. I want cash or I want the cashier's checks. I want one or the other. She goes, well, we can't do that here. We have to schedule it. I said, well, then schedule it. And she goes, well, I would have to call down there. I said, so call. And she went, are you serious? I said, yes, ma'am, I'm serious. And she goes, okay, well, I'll schedule it. I'll, I'll, when do you want it? I said, tomorrow. She goes, I'll schedule it for tomorrow. You can go get cash tomorrow. I said, great, tell them I'm going to want it in nickels, dimes, and quarters. And she looked at me and she goes, you must be joking. I said, no, ma'am. I said, and when they ask, why are we counting $150,000 in nickels, dimes, and quarters? You can tell them about your strict adherence to policy for not cashing, putting, for not cutting this up into cashier's checks. And she just looked at me. I said, or you can just give me the cashier's checks. Because I said, well, I'm getting one or the other. And she looked at me and she went, what were the names you want the cashier's checks in? And I said, okay. So I gave her like the name Scott Cugno. I want a check for Scott Cugno in the name and for $29,000. I want another check cut to this guy, to this girl, to this guy. And these were all names of people I had IDs in. So... Um, she cuts up these checks and we, so Becky and I spend the next week going around cashing these checks and depositing this. So we deposit some of the checks, we cash some of the checks. So I'm at this point, I'm, I'm acting as Michael. Well, I end up, I have a check in the name Scott and I have a real ID in Scott's name for 29,000. So I, I, instead of depositing it in his bank account, I remember Becky and I, we went to the bank and I walk in the bank and I said, Hey, look, I need to cash this. And the guy goes, the, the cashier looked at it and she goes, well, it's $29,000. And I went, right. And she said, um, I mean, why don't you just deposit it? And I said, I, I don't have a bank account here. I have a bank account in Florida in a small local bank in Florida. I don't feel like back then they would hold your checks for like 10 days in out of state banks. And I was like, I don't feel like having it held. I just want the cash. And she goes, well, you're going to have to talk to the manager. So I go, okay. So I walk over and I sit in the manager's office and it's a little glass cubicle. You could see the whole bank. I said, okay, no problem. So I go and I sit there and he comes over and he says, okay, why don't you just deposit in your bank? And I explain to him why. And then he goes, okay, um, well, we have to look into this. And I said, that's fine. And he goes, can I have your driver's license and a, two forms of ID? Sure. I give him my driver's license and I give him a, um, a credit card in the name for Scott Cugno. It was a debit card. So I give him a debit card, and that, so it says Visa, and I give it to him. He comes, so he walks in the back to check it out. And I remember my phone rang. So my phone rings, right? And I look at my phone, and it's a phone number that I don't recognize. No, 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 wait, wait. The first phone number I looked at. So I look at my phone, and it's Becky. She's, she's sitting in the car. And I look at the phone, and I go, huh. So I pick it up, and I go, yeah, what's up? And she said, what's taking so long? I go, I don't know, the guy's being an asshole. He won't give me the money. He's, he's running a check right now on, on the whole thing. And she goes, oh my God, get out of the bank. Get out of the bank. And I go, no, I'm not going to get out of the bank. I'm just, I just have to wait. I have to run a, she has to run a check. Like the, it, it, like the check is good. The check is good. My ID is good. Everything's real. So I just have to wait. She goes, oh my God, I'm so nervous. I go, calm down. I, and I said, look, if the cops show up, call me. And I'll run out of the bank and you can meet me at the, behind the Publix, like in, in the same shopping plaza. She's like, all right, hang up the phone. A couple minutes later, the guy comes back and he goes, um, why do you, I have a question for you. So why do you want cash? And I went, why do I want cash? I said, I want cash because I work for a construction company and we cash guys payroll checks. And so I'd like to have the cash on hand to cash their payroll checks. And he went, okay, okay, that makes sense. And he walks off. Phone rings again. It's Becky. She's screaming and hollering. A couple minutes later, the guy comes back and he goes, I have a question. He said, who gave you this check? I go, the guy's name is Michael. And I, he goes, why did he give you the check? And I, you know, none of this is his business, by the way. So I was like, I look, but it, well, they weren't hard questions. And a normal person would just answer the questions. They wouldn't get pissy with them. I, you know, I just, be, you know, they would just be like, oh, well, this. So he goes, why did he give you the check? And I went, my construction company that I work for, we're doing an addition for him. And he owes us this money on a draw. And he says, okay, okay. And you own the construction company? I said, I own part of the construction construction company. He goes, okay, okay. He goes, yeah, that makes sense. And he gets up and he walks away. So then my phone rings again. Becky's screaming and hollering, get out of the bank, get out of the bank. I said, it was the cops here or something? She's like, no, no, just, I just, I'm feeling nervous. You got to leave. I said, I can't leave. Like, I can't leave the bank. 
If I leave the bank, I'm leave, walking away with it. He's got a check for $29,000, my ID, and my, my visa, my debit visa. Like, I can't leave. They'll call the cops for sure. I have to play it out. So I hang up on her. A couple of minutes later, he comes back. He asks another question. He leaves. And the fo- my phone rang again. Only this time, my phone rings, and I don't recognize the number. So I go, huh. So I pick up the phone. No big deal. I pick up the phone. I go, hello? And this woman says, hi, uh, is this Michael? And I, and I go, yes, because I would used the same phone number for most of these guys. So although I'm in the bank as Scott, the phone number is for, is, it could be Scott's phone. It could be Michael. So I go, yes, who? I go, who's this? She goes, this is Kimberly from um, SunTrust, SunTrust Bank, South Trust. I don't know. She says, this is Kimberly from SunTrust Bank. We have, uh, we have someone in the bank uh, by the name of Michael, no, by the name of Scott, no, trying to cash a check. We're just calling to verify that the funds that you had, initially issued the check and that it was okay to cash the check. And I went, um, yeah. She goes, can you verify the amount? I said, yeah, I believe it was for $29,000 even. And she goes, oh, okay. That's all we need to verify. Thank you. I, so it's, it's good. I said, yes, it's good. Scott, I issued it to Scott Cugno. It's fine. She goes, oh, okay. That's fine. Thank you. So go to hang up the phone. I said, how did you get this phone number? And she says, oh, I got the phone number because we called the title company where the check was originally issued from and they gave us your phone number. If they had called information or anybody, they could have gotten the real Scott, the, uh, the real Mike, but they didn't. They happened to call the title company who gave, them, who gave them my number. So I just got lucky. So I hang up the phone. I wait and a couple minutes later, still took this guy five minutes. The, the bank manager comes over with this woman and says, um, Mr. Cugno, uh, we're going to go ahead and uh, cash the check. And they count out $29,000. He counts it out twice. And then when I'm done, I sco- when he's done, I scoop up the money, put it in an envelope, put it in my pocket, stand up. And just as I was leaving, he says, um, Mr. Cugno, I'd like to mention something. I said, sure, what's that? He goes, I feel very apprehensive about this transaction. And I go, really? I go, what is it exactly? And he goes, you know, I can't put my finger on it, but I just feel like something's wrong. And I go, huh. I go, well, I'm sure it'll come to you. And I turn around, I just walk right out of the bank. Listen, that dude, about a week later, I know the Secret Service showed up and said, did you cash a check for $29,000 from this fucking guy right here? Like completely not the guy. So I remember I got back into the car. And I closed the door and I was like, oh my God, and I'm laughing. I go, they just cashed a check for 29,000. They this. And I told her about the phone call. I told her the whole thing. She's like, you got so lucky. Well, there used to be a program called Masterminds. So it was like a true crime program about guys that they would say were like master criminals. And I closed the door and I, and I'm sorry. And so I'm like, oh my God, you can't believe this. Boom, boom. And she's like, what? Oh my gosh, you got so lucky. I said, listen, I said, when they do the, when they do the, the episode of masterminds on me, I said, that's going to be in the episode. And she goes, oh my God. She just started laughing. We backed out and drove off. And that was the only check I ever cashed for more than basically $10,000 because that was what, you know, there's something called a cash transaction report. They have to fill out or a suspicious activity report. That trans is the only time I ever got a CC, uh, a CC, uh, CTR is filed on me, and I got a suspicious activity filed on me. Out of all the millions of dollars that I of checks that I cashed, that's the only time I ever got a cash transaction report and a suspicious activity report filed on me is because of that one thing. But I drove off. We spent, we cashed three, three hundred and fifty, four hundred thousand dollars worth of checks in the um, over the next week or so just depositing them, cashing them, depositing them, cash them. Sometimes they would go, sometimes the bank would get like, like I would be cashing what I would, we would deposit a check into one of the IDs for, um, for that Becky had. And I would go in and cash a check for like eight grand. And then they would call her like, they go, Oh, hold on a second. They'd walk in the back and call her and be like, listen, some guy's here trying to cash a check for $9,000. 
and she has a new account. It's only been open three or four months. So they, and they would say, you know, he's trying to cash a check for $9,000. Here's his name. Did you write this check? And she was, she'd go, yeah, I wrote the check. That's fine. That's so-and-so. I wrote him the check. They go, oh, okay. She'd be sitting in the car verifying the, that she'd written the check. They'd cash the check and I'd leave. That was happening every single day for a week or two. Um, at the, so at the end of that scam, we'd pulled out four hundred and four hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I'd say about four hundred fifty thousand. And at that point, we we kind of we had built up some additional identities and started a new a new we'd we'd set up uh, set up like a safe house in Charlotte, North Carolina. At this point. And so we had a whole life kind of set up, like a, we had an apartment rented, we we were, um, we had furniture bought, like we had this furnished apartment completely in this, God, right downtown Charlotte, like on the, like, I forget what floor it was, whatever, 10th, 11th floor or something, I forget, but I mean, it was a real nice condo downtown, it was an apartment building at the time, and it was, but it was, they turned it into condos, but super nice, um, right downtown, um, beautiful fucking, beautiful place. God, it had, that thing had to be 14, 1,500 square feet, two bedroom, two bath, concrete floors, um, stainless steel appliances. I mean, just a place, high ceilings. It was great. So we had set this whole thing up, and we're still in, in Alpharetta, Georgia, basically Atlanta, Georgia, cashing checks. And we, we have a, lot, a little over 400,000, four or five, no, about probably close to 500,000 at this point. Four, 450, 500,000 in cash in a duffel bag. And it's sitting in... I remember it was sitting in the back of the vehicle. We bought a new, oh, by the way, we bought another vehicle. We took the Audi and we dropped the Audi that we had been driving just before we took off. It had been housed in the garage. So just before we took off, we went and we put the Audi in a police station parking lot. So I parked it in a police station parking lot and I left. We went to, went and got like, like, um, some Lira and we bought, printed out a brochure for uh, for like a, a, a hotel in Spain, right? Like a, some Spanish hotel. And we left the brochure in the uh, in, wedged between the car seats and we left a couple of lira laying in the back and then we got a sp- um, Spanish for dummies book and stuck it in the trunk with, with some other just random junk that you would leave in a, in a car you're abandoning, right? So we just left some random bullshit in the car and... And then left it in the police station parking lot, where you know they're going to find it. They're already looking for this car. Then we we had our another car we bought in the name of what was the name of the guy it was. That was Michael Eckert. I was Michael Eckert in uh, Charlotte. So we've got a car in the name of Michael Eckert. We had a um, we got like five, four or five hundred thousand in cash and a duffel bag sitting in the back, and we had all the money out. And uh, yeah, that was it. That was it. We uh, and we abandoned everything. So we abandoned everything, and I'd say about a week or so after we left Atlanta to go to Charlotte, North Carolina, to do another scam. At that point, the Secret Service and the FBI showed up at the Atlant at the Alpharetta house and went and contacted the real Mike. Told him that hey, there's been this scam committed, and this, these guys just bought borrowed almost half a million dollars on your house and uh and we took off and that was it so that scam was like over now we were in charlotte north carolina and becky was using the name michelle joseph and i was using the name michael eckert and we i remember we got there and we had to we had to start buying like we we had a bunch of cash i think like whatever 400 over four hundred thousand dollars in cash so we started buying uh, we started buying furniture. Uh, we live in a really nice, like, uh, an apartment building in downtown Charlotte. And we started buying uh, furniture. Remember, we would go in, and I would pull out cash. And I remember the, like, I would pull out cash, and the guy would say, look, if you give me more than $10,000 in cash, like, do you have, they, they're like, do you have a credit card? Do you have a check? Do you have this? No, because we had just opened, like, we were just opening up bank accounts and things. And they were like, yeah, man, uh, if you don't have that stuff, then, you know, and you give me more than $10,000, I have to turn it in. So we were like, look, here's what we're going to do. We're going to buy 
these two pieces of furniture for $8,000 and I'll come back tomorrow. And the guy was like, cool. Come back the next day, I'd buy the couch for seven or 8,000. Come back the next day, we did this over the course of like a week. We got like whatever, $30,000, $40,000 worth of furniture. Um, I ended up getting an, a car. I bought an Infinity. Uh, Becky bought a... Did she have an Infinity also? I got a Nissan... Uh, the, the what is it the 350z or something like that and then we I, we also got an infinity we got the infinity whatever it was the 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 SUV uh listen we had we got we bought like three cars got a nice apartment and kind of started hanging out set it waiting to set up the next scam so we I think we ended up going to we ended up going to uh, Jamaica. I remember we went to Jamaica and uh, I had to get a passport, which wasn't difficult to do because once I had Michael Eckert's driver's license, like I had a state issue in, the, in North Carolina, I went into the state DMV and I got a state issue driver's license. So I have a driver's license in this guy's name. I had ordered all of his documents, you know, I had gotten all of his information uh, because I'd, I'd run an ad, like a buy here, uh, not buy here. It was a good credit, bad credit, no problem, uh, free app, free mortgage applications, call now. And so people would call up and I'd, I'd take all their information and then I'd order their documents. So I had all this guy's documents and I was, had already gotten a driver's license. So then I just walked in and I got a, a passport. Like they don't ask if you're a U.S. citizen, they don't ask for your 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 fingerprints or anything. To this day, they don't. I always have people say, oh, well, they don't do that anymore. Well, then you must be an idiot because, you know, like people will say, oh, well, uh, uh, they, they, they ask for fingerprints now. Really? Because I just got a, a passport and I'm, a, a, I'm a, a felon and I just went and got a passport and they didn't ask me for any fingerprints. So if you're a U.S. citizen, they didn't ask for them now, then they don't ask for them now. I had a per my birth certificate and a driver's license got myself a passport same thing um michelle michelle um joseph got hers michael eckert got his we went to um went to jamaica remember the first thing that becky did was we went to jamaica was she went out on the beach and got a bunch of pot uh, what else you know, we went on and we did all the thing. We, we drove four wheelers. We took out wave runners. We stayed for like 10 days. We hung out. It got boring after a while. She was driving me nuts. So, uh, then we came back. I mean, you know, we're, I'm walking through passport control or I'm, I'm walking through passport, you know, the, the uh, passport center with a, a fake, pa with a, oh, it's a real passport. I was issued by the state department, but you know, I walk up and you put the passport down and you say, you know, they say, Hey, you know, did you, you're, you know, welcome back to America. Did you, you know, was it business or pleasure? And you say, oh, I was, I was, a. they ask you going out and, or well, coming back in, they ask you, you say, oh, I was a pleasure. We just got back from Jamaica. They go, okay, you walk on in. So, you know, it's look, I mean, I'd love to, to lie and say that, Oh, the stress was killing me and I couldn't sleep at night. But the truth is, you know, it was pretty cool. It's pretty cool walking around fake pass. Well, passports, you've got false passports, you've got false driver's licenses. I'm driving a car in the name of the guy. I'm driving a sports car. At that time, it's a fifty, sixty thousand dollars sports car. Probably now they're probably eighty thousand dollars or a hundred thousand. So you know we're driving sports cars and SUVs. We're living in downtown Charlotte. We're we're living a pretty decent life, but we're blowing through the money pretty quick. At one point, we were driving, and I remember Becky said, "Look, you know we're stealing identities." And, you know, we're like, at some point we're going to have to get, she, she was like, she, she was like, you know, like we're stealing these guys' identities and stuff. Like, you know, are you worried it's ever going to catch up with you? And, oh, I know what it was, what I remember what, what keyed that in. I was driving one day and I was speeding because listen, if you don't give a crap about that, you're keeping your driver's license because you're only going to have it for six months or a year. You drive like a maniac. I'm driving like a maniac. And so I was speeding and this cop pulled me over like a 
a, a state trooper. He pulled me over, and I remember Becky f- was flipping out. Oh, my God, I'm so, are you worried? Oh, my God, oh, my God. I'm like, calm down. I've got a driver's license. So I give the guy the driver's license, and he asked me, you know, how fast were you going? I was like, ah, I have no idea how fast were you, ch- how long were you behind me? I got at one point I was like doing like 90, 95 miles an hour. And he just was like shocked. But I mean, what do I care? Write, write me the ticket. What is it? A $300 ticket? $400 ticket? I don't care. I've got 400,000 in cash or 300,000 probably by this point. We've blown through so, so much money. So the guy writes me the ticket and he leaves. And Becky says, you know, are you concerned about you're not concerned about these cops. Like, are you concerned about, you know, like what happened? Like getting, we don't, we need permanent, um, don't we need like a permanent, uh, uh, identities. And I, I remember I said, you know, we, we need permanent identities for sure. We're going to have to, I'm trying to figure that out now. Like I was just in my head, always kind of thinking about how to do this, how to do that. And I said, my problem is that what, what concerns me is not that the cop's going to figure out that I'm using a fake ID. Um, or uh, a false ID. What I'm concerned about is that the guy whose driver's license I now possess in my in his name, when I had interviewed him on the phone, he told me that he'd had a DUI like three or four years earlier, and he'd lost his license, but he had it again. Because when I asked him about it, I, one of the things I asked these guys was, "Do you, have you ever had a felony? And he said, no, um, I actually had my driver's license taken away for a DUI, like, whatever, three, four years ago, but it was for, like, a year, but I got it back. Like, I don't think that was a felony. And I was like, okay. My fear was, what if I'm driving around on this guy's driver's license and he's lost his license? Like, what if he got a felony? What, what if he got pulled over and got another DUI and his license was suspended and I'm driving around in another state with his driver's license? Like, the hub system that they use would probably tell the other states that this guy has a DUI. So I could be driving around on a suspended license and not know it. And I said, that's my fear. And I said, and she was like, well, what do you want to do about that? I said, well, we need to be able to get people's, get IDs and identification in people's names that are real people that aren't using those. And I remember she was like, like what? Like, uh, uh, like who, who do you want to get? Like, and I go, I don't know. She was like, like mental patients or something. And I was like, well, how are we going to get their information? And she goes, I don't know. What about, um, what about like prisoners or inmates or something? I thought, I don't know. What if my fear with that, I thought about that. My fear about getting like inmates information or prisoners information. Let's say some like that guy with a life sentence, like he's got a real social security card, date of birth or birth certificate, social security card. He's got all that stuff is out there and he's not ever going to use it again. He'd be perfect. But my fear with that was I didn't know that if I got pulled over and was using his license or even I could even go into the DMV, maybe for all I know, there's some kind of a, a check in there where they check your, you know, your, your criminal record or something. I didn't know. And what if I get arrested? Is this guy like there? Oh my God, this guy's supposed to be in prison and bam, they grab me. And then they put them, they fingerprint me, and then they figure out that I'm wanted. So I was like, I don't know. What if they run a check? I'm not sure. So we were, happened to be driving down. We were going to get like a, um, a lunch. And we were going to like a subway, you know, a subway sandwich place. We were driving down off the interstate, and I remember I was parked at or stopped at the interstate for the light, and I was about to turn and try and go go to the sandwich place. And I looked over, and there was a homeless guy, and he was holding one of those, you know, will work for food signs. And I looked over and I said, that guy, that's what we need. We need that guy's information. And Becky was like, are you serious? That guy? She's a homeless guy? And I was like, yeah. I was like, think about it. He's not using his information. And she's like, yeah, but what if he cleans himself up and this and that? I was like, I don't know. I said, I don't think these guys clean themselves up. Like, I think a lot of it's mental illness. And she's like, well, he probably lost his license. And I said, well, let's go find out. So I drove across the street, let her go in and get a sandwich. I walked across the street to the guy and I said, hey, bro, can I, can I talk to you for a second? I'll give you 20 bucks real quick. And he goes, oh, yeah, what's up, man? And so I gave him 20 bucks. I said, listen, dude. I said, I got some quick questions, man. I said, um, uh, and, and he goes, he goes well, what are you doing? You taking a survey or something? And I went, a, a survey? And I go, no. I remember I said, no, why? Like, you get a lot of surveyors out here? 
And he goes, well, I mean, we get homeless. We get a lot of, uh, you know, we get like social workers and stuff. And I thought, oh, okay, good to know. So he's used to people coming up to him, to asking him questions like social workers. So I said, well, first of all, I said, uh, when was the last time you were employed? And he said, man, it's been, I forget what he said, you know, it's been five, ten years or something, six years, seven years. I said, well, what happened? He said, I ah, lost my job and, you know, I'm a drunk. I said, he said, I, I drink and that's what I want to do. And I said, do you think there's any chance you're ever going to get it, get, be gainfully employed again, like get a job, working 40 hours a week? And he, I remember he looked around and he goes, nah, this is it for me. And I was like, okay. I go, do you have a driver's license? And he said, No. And I went, oh, I said, did you, is it suspended? Or he said, well, I, one, I, I don't have it. And two, he said, no, I just think it's probably um, expired or something. I said, would you get a DUI? Or he's like, how would I get a DUI? He goes, I don't drive, I don't have a car. I don't drive. And I was like, okay, do you have an address? And he looked around, he goes, no, man, I, he basically lives in the woods. And then I said, are you ever been in trouble before? He said, yeah, I've been arrested a few times for like vagrancy and, and loitering and being drunk in public and stuff. He said, but those are all misdemeanors. He goes, and they keep us, at, he has someone like me, they, they keep me in jail for 30 days and then they let me go. I go, are you, do you, you don't get probation? He's like, well, look around, bro. How, how can I do probation? I don't have a house. He said, so that, you know, I don't have anywhere to, I can't pay. So I can't pay my pro, state, like that would be a state probation thing. I can't pay state probation. I can't go to my probation officer. I can't, I don't have a, a, a gainful, I don't have a, an address that you can go to. I'm not gainfully employed. Like, you can't put me on probation. I don't meet any of the requirements. So he said, no, they, the judge will basically keep me in jail for 30 to 60 days, and then they just release me. And I thought, okay. So he's, he's got the ability to get a driver's license. He, he's probably never going to go out and get a DUI because he's never going to drive again. He's not planning on going out and cleaning his life up and, and getting a job. I mean, this guy wants to be an alcoholic and just drink and beg you know, for people to give him money, enough money to, to eat and, and drink. And so I thought, this guy's perfect. He's perfect because he does have a social, social security number and he does have a birth certificate somewhere. So I was like, okay, cool, man. I, I, I appreciate it. So I gave him 20 more bucks and I left. So I went home that night and I wrote up what I called a statistical survey um, statistical, statistical survey sheet or analysis sheet or something. I forget exactly what I, you know, form, statistical analysis form, whatever, you know. And I remember I put like the, the social security symbol. I copied it, you know, cut and paste it. And I put it in the middle and I put like statistical survey form over and over and over again, all the way across. And that was like a cover sheet, and then you flipped it, and on the second one, it was like form number 2207, and then it said, you know, uh, that it was printed in the government office, and I, I basically copied most of what's on, a, on an application, a basic, uh, um, like an, a mortgage application. So it looked very, the bottom, you have a bunch of numbers, and where it was printed, and uh, the form number, and a bunch of just junk. So I printed up all that, and then I wrote out 17 questions. And the questions were like, name date of birth, uh, where you were, you know, uh, where you were born, uh, the, the, the state, county, uh, what states have you had driver's uh, identification in? Have you ever had a, held a U.S. passport? Have you ever been in the U.S. military? Uh, what is your social security number? Um, what is your mother's maiden name? Uh, have you ever been arrested? Do you have a, a uh, uh, any felonies? Have you ever been? In, have you ever been in prison? You know, do you have any felonies? Like I, I had a whole list. You ever been in the military, the U.S. military? You know, whatever. I had a whole list of questions. Have you, are you currently on food stamps? Have you ever been on food stamps or you know government assistance of any kind? Blah blah blah. Are you on Medicare, Medicaid? You know, I went through everything. Do you receive housing from the government? You know, all kinds of stuff. I went over. Wrote up all the questions. Printed out a bunch of the forms. Went and bought a clipboard. Went and got a little plastic badge and put my face on the badge and I made what I thought maybe a um, Salvation Army little badge would look like. So I made it, it said Statistical Surveyor and it said, you know, Salvation Army and it had some made up name. Actually, I think it said Michael Eckert and then it had my picture. I actually used the picture that was on uh, my wanted poster. So I put that picture on. So I, I put it, I put it on my belt and I took my little 
my little, um, you know, clipboard with my sheets and I went out and I drove around until I found a bunch of homeless guys. And I just walked up to him and I said, Hey man, I'm, I'm doing a survey for the Salvation Army. We're trying to figure out where we, where we're going to place our next indigent facility. And they were like indigent. And I was like, well, homeless facility. And they were like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, nah, man, I'm not interested. Uh, I said, would you mind taking a survey? And they were like, well, I'm not interested. And I said, Hey bro. I said, it pays, it pays 20 bucks cash right now. Cash right now. You're going to be 20 bucks cash right now. I said, right now cash. And they were like, yeah, bro, well, what do you need? So you have to think, I, you got to drive around a long time to find a a guy, a, a white guy and a white woman in their early 30s. That's a lot of driving around. So I ended up surveying multiple people within the day, maybe three or four or five people a day. You know, it doesn't, you know, it's a few hours. It takes a couple hours here. Mostly you're just driving around looking. And, you know, of course, the first thing I say is one of the one of those questions right away was, you know, just, you know, are you do you have an address where you receive mail? Are you homeless? You know, that sort of thing. And if they were homeless, bam, it was on. So I start asking them the questions. Boom, 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 boom. Get their information. And go to the next one. Go to the next one. Uh, so once I got their information, I would then order their documents. I would order their social security cards, I'd order their birth certificates, I'd get all the information, I, I'd register to vote in their name, I would order their high school transcripts, that was one of the things I asked was where they, if they had graduated high school, if so, where, do you, you have a college degree, Degree, if so, where, so I'd get their high school transcripts, I would get, so I would order every document that I could think of. Once I got those documents in, of course, then I would I would go into the local DMV. I, I, of course, I, I obviously had to make sure I couldn't go into a, a local a DMV in a state they'd had a driver's license in, which is why I always asked, what states have you had a, a license in or, or an ID in? So if I, talked, if I drove into South Carolina and talked to people in South Carolina, I would get an ID in North Carolina or wherever, you know, Tennessee or Alabama or Texas or, you know, whatever. Uh, Florida. So I ended up surveying a bunch of guys in North Carolina and then I got IDs in South Carolina and Alabama. I, so, let me think what, oh yeah. So I'm trying to think of, because we got a bunch of IDs and we were opening up bank accounts. Here's what it, what happened was I was trying to think of where I got this one guy. So I then ended up driving. Becky wanted to go see her son and her parents. So we drove to, we ended up driving to, uh, gosh, where did we drive? I'm trying to think if I went to New Orleans before this. Yeah, I think we'd already gone to New Orleans. Uh, anyway. Yeah, we'd already gone to New Orleans by this point. So we drove to we drove to Las Vegas. And we go to Las Vegas, and I'm walking around Las Vegas. Did I ever tell this story? No, I couldn't have because we were in North Carolina when this happened. So we drive to Las Vegas, and we go to Las Vegas, and Becky goes and she sees her 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 uh, her mom and her and her stepfather. And she sees her son, and we went and we bought them a bunch of, uh, bought her son a, like like a thousand, two thousand dollars worth of presents. And I remember we gave her. I'm trying to think of how much money we found. We went and got her ex husband, who was raising her son, and we gave him maybe twenty grand, ten or twenty grand. I forget exactly how much, but we gave him a. a chunk of money I went up to him he was a valet at like a at a hotel and I just walked up to him and I and he I said his name and he turned around and he looked at me I forget his name now and I said you know whatever his name was you know Tim or whatever I was like hey Tim and he's like yeah what can I do for you I go my name's Matt Cox I said do you know who I am and he was like whole he was like uh yeah what's going on and he said he goes how's Becky he goes how's how's Becky and I go Becky's fine I said she's standing over there and I said she wants to give you some money to tip for her son and so we gave him like 20 or 30 grand. I forget what it was, 10, 20, whatever. Let's say 20. So it was 20 grand in cash or 30 grand in cash. And he took the money and we, uh, Becky 
went and hung out for the day with her son and talked to her parents and and then we went around while we were there like you know we were there for days and she blew a ton of money gambling like she's not a good gambler of course you know she was a gambling junkie so you know I played blackjack twice the first hand I won the second one I lost I said I'm done like I don't like to lose so um and and so uh we drove around looking for homeless people in in Las Vegas. So we get out and I remember we had gone to a couple places, but man, there were so many homeless people. And I was afraid to get out and go into a crowd of homeless people and start pulling out twenties. There were that many of them. So I was like, wow, I was like, there's a fucking ton of them. Like I'd rather find some guys by themselves. And so she goes, I know exactly where we need to go. So we drove down a few streets and there was, there was a white, uh, there was a two, three white guys sitting on like a park bench. And I was like, oh, they're perfect. So I jump out of the car and I walk over and one of the guys comes walking over and he's like, hey, what can I do for you? He goes, what do you need? And I said, um, I'm taking a survey for the Salvation Army and I was wondering if I could ask you some quick questions. And he goes, nah, I'm not interested. I said, well, hey man, it pays 20 bucks right now. He goes, you're gonna give me 20 bucks cash right now. I said, absolutely. And I showed him the money, you know, like I pull out the money, I got it right now. And he goes, I put it in my pocket. He's like, okay. And he said, uh, what, what do you need to know? And I said, well, What's your name? He's like, uh, you know, Gary. I mean, you know, so it was Gary Sullivan. I write down Gary Sullivan. And, you know, where were you born? Uh, you know, like, uh, how old are you? Uh, where were you born? What's your mother's name? Uh, name, uh, Maiden name. And so I go down the list. And when I get to the question of, um, I said, have you ever been arrested? And he said, yeah, I've been arrested. I go, okay. I said, is it a, do you have any felonies? And he went, he said, no, no, I've been arrested for, I've been arrested for prostitution several times. He said, but it's not, he said, but it's not a felony here in, in, you know, in Nevada. And I went, you mean solicitation? Because to me, you know, prostitution is women get charged with prostitution. Men get charged with soliciting them. And, and, you know, so that was my first, I go, you mean solicitation? And he goes, no, no, he's a prostitution. He said, I, I offered to blow, uh, an undercover cop for 20 bucks. And I went, oh, you're a, you're a male prostitute. And he goes, yeah. He said, well, I mean, a girl's got to do what a girl's got to do. And he like suddenly just kind of went, woo. Like he was like turned, went straight, very flamboyant. And I was like, oh, wow. I was like, I did, totally didn't see that. And I was like, okay. So I write down the information. I, I write down all the information. Give him his 20 bucks and he leaves. And anyway, I remember turning around and looking at, at Becky and she was laughing her ass off. So I go and I get in the car and I was like, did you know, and she, she goes, what'd your boyfriend say? And I said, did you know that this, is, what is this? She goes, this is an area. I'd asked him, actually. I'd asked him. I said, oh, is that what you're, that's, he goes, that's what I'm doing out here. I said, I said, does everybody know that this is an, is this like an area for like, like sex workers? And he, and he goes, yeah, everybody knows that. I was like, oh, okay. So when I got in the car, Becky was like, um, oh, what'd your boyfriend say? And I said, I said, man, you motherfucker. I, and she started laughing and she was like, she's like, oh, I knew it when we got here. I knew those were, uh, those guys were prostitutes. So we drove off. We went back to, we drove all the way back to Charlotte, to North Carolina. And I ordered, I, I'd gotten several, you know, several people's information. So I ordered all of their information and I ended up getting Gary Sullivan stuff in and I, went to South Carolina, to Columbia, South Carolina. I set up a, a UPS box and I went to, where did I go? I set up a UPS box and then I went and I got, I applied, I'd already applied for a bunch of stuff and I, I ended up making up a lease. I think I had a lease there. So I made a lease and I went into the local DMV and I got, a, I got an ID. So I walk in with with Gary Sullivan's birth certificate, his social security card, and a copy of his lease agreement for the UPS box. So they thought it was an apartment. So, you know, I, instead of putting, like they always tell you you can't do this, you put down um, where, you, where the box number, instead of putting, you know, box number, you put, you know, apartment number. And they always say, oh, you can't do that. Well, yeah, you can. You you know what you can't do? This is the only times I ever had a problem with that at like the DMV or opening up a 
opening up like a, a um like a, a bank account was if the UPS store or mailboxes etc store had been around for four or five or six years but if you went to a new one it wasn't in the system so if it had just opened six months or a year ago you could do that and they wouldn't the system wouldn't catch it so I went to this place where it had been open recently probably within like the last year or so and I called the I had called around like I would call around like hey how long have you been open oh we opened about eight months ago or oh we opened about 16 months ago or so I went to one got the information went into the DMV, got an idea, or wrote up a, a lease agreement for an apartment lease, but put that address on it. Went in, gave it to them. I have the birth certificate. I have the social security card. I have my proof of residency, which is my lease agreement. Tell them I lost my driver's license in the move here. I've been here about two weeks and I need an ID. I'll come back and get a driver's license. And they said, no problem. Stand over there. Stood over there. They took my picture. I get the ID. I leave. So now I have an ID in the name Gary Sullivan. So at this point, I'm in South Carolina. I'm in Columbia, South Carolina. And I have assumed... I started up. I started a scam with uh, using the name Gary Lee Sullivan. Or Gary Sullivan, which was a, a transient that I had met in a homeless... Um, he was also a, a, a male prostitute that I'd met in Nevada, uh, in Las Vegas. And I already, I'd gotten an, a, an ID in his name in South Carolina and was starting a scam, uh, in his name. So, uh, let's see. So here's, so I wrote a book called Shark in the Housing Pool. Here's what I want to mention is every once in a while, I'll see one of these quotes that I put in the book. And the quote is Cox and Hauk disappeared from Georgia last summer, then resurfaced in South Carolina and Columbia, South Carolina for more of the same. Using false IDs and forged documents and setting up a phony loan company to snare more than a million dollars in fraudulent loans, the Chicago Tribune. Bro, what the hell, you know? Like it's 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 ridiculous. And then this is one from Fortune magazine wrote Cox has the ability to dramatically alter his appearance. He frequents tanning salons and has had numerous co uh, cosmetic surgeries, which is true. At this point, I have had a nose job. So I had a nose, because uh, look, my, my, my picture was, you know, I was on the Secret Service's most wanted list. The FBI's looking for me. The U.S. Marshals are looking for me. I got, you know, there's posters of me. Like, I know they're looking for me. There's all these articles that are coming out. And I, you know, I know they're, they're, it's bad. So I ended up getting a nose job. I had a, I had a couple different liposuction surgeries. And, you know, I had lost weight. I had two hair transplants or two, um, they call them hair grafts, whatever. They're not plugs. So uh, two hair grafts where they actually cut the hair out of the back of your head, like the little seeds that make your hair grow, and they implant them in your your hair. Because I, when I left Tampa, I was, you know, was thinning, and I, my hairline was receding. So I had that done. I had what was called what's called a, a mini facelift. So by this point, I look drastically different. You know, I mean, it's still me, but I definitely it, it's questionable. I've lost weight. I'm tanning, I'm wearing my hair different, and I have an ID in the name Gary Lee Sullivan. I go to South Carolina, and we're, we're, now keep in mind that Becky Houck and I are living in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I haven't done these in a while. I mentioned Becky, right? Yeah, yeah, she was, okay. Okay, so, yeah, of course I mentioned her. Anyway, so we are living in Charlotte, North Carolina, but I'm going to run a scam in Columbia, no, in Columbia, South Carolina. So I'm in Columbia, and the first thing I do is I, after I get the ID, I go to a corporate lawyer, and I set up a, a couple of um, shell companies. You know, I, I tell him that I'm a, a lender, and I need to open a couple corporations, so we open a few corporations, and then I go around, after I've got the corporations opened, I go to several different banks, and I open up corporate bank accounts. Then I go to several other banks and I open up a 
personal accounts for Gary Lee Sullivan. Uh, the other thing I did was, you know, there's a lot of things that like in the book I don't mention. Uh, one of the things is that what I did was uh, I, 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 when I pulled Sullivan's credit, he had a bunch of medical collections. So I had to contact those, his medical collection people, and I paid off probably about $20,000 worth of medical collections. I also, of course, got a few secured credit cards in his name, so he had some semblance of somebody who's kind of rebuilding his life. You know, you've got the medical collections that were paid off. You've got a few new credit cards. And then I turned around, and I, of course, I got a, a business card made. I set up a website for uh, Labor on Demand, which was supposedly his uh, the company he worked for. I set up a what's called a, they call them HQs, which are like a virtual offices. You can actually rent real offices. They typically have them almost everywhere. They have them in, in Atlanta, downtown Atlanta, Charlotte, uh, Columbia. They have them in most major cities, um, you know, Orlando, Miami, whatever. I'm not sure Columbia is a, would be considered a major city, but anyway, they had one. So you could call and They'll give you a phone number, so you could put that on your business card. So if somebody called the business, it would go, it would be answered by a real person, and they would either take a message and then email you, or they would reroute the phone call to you. So you, you have to understand. So I've got all of this stuff set up in the name of Gary Sullivan, and I have corporations set up, I have bank accounts, I have everything. So then I turn around and I contact a a realtor. I remember, I want to say his name was Griffin. Anyway, I contact uh, this realtor, and I tell him, hey, I want to buy a house. I want to buy a, a piece of property, owner-occupied. I'm sorry. God, what am I saying? I want to buy a, a, a house you know, to buy, but it, it has to be, um, you know, I want to buy the house to live in it, but I want to buy a house, uh, and I need the owner to owner finance it. Like, I'll put down 10%. But I need them to owner finance it. And so we, he and I drive around. We look at like probably five or six houses the first day. And I come back and I say, I, I find, a, a, actually, I, we put like five contracts down on probably out of the six houses. I think we put five contracts down on, on these houses where I put my, like $1,000 down. And I said, look, write up a contract asking them, telling them I'll put down 10% and they have to hold a 90% mortgage and it's called what's called a wraparound. Like even if you, they have a first mortgage, you, they can still hold a mortgage on the house and they just wrap their mortgage around the first mortgage. So they're still in technically in first mortgage position kind of, and that I would make my payments to them and then they could pay their current mortgage, their current mortgage uh, company. And, you know, look, not all real estate agents even know how to do this. Uh, so, but I explained it to Griffin. He kind of explained it. He ended up, uh, what was his name, bro? What's the guy's name? Griffin. Um, shoot. Anyway, whatever. So, uh, we end up getting two, two of the homeowners come back and they say, okay, fine. No problem, we'll uh, we'll do the uh, we'll do the owner financing. And one of those cup uh, one of those guys was a guy that sold. He sold. What did he sell? Uh, he sold uh, chemicals. He was like a chemical uh, salesperson that sold some kind of chemicals for to pesticides and stuff like that. So the, and and he was selling his house, and he was actually behind on his mortgage. So part of my down payment went to catch up his mortgage with his mortgage company. Second guy was a doctor and I ended up going, uh, he, he agreed to owner finance that property. So I met with both of them, you know, obviously they want to know the story. They're like, well, why can't you go to a bank? And of course I would say, you know, I can't go to a bank because, you know, I was in a car accident or something, you know, several years ago, or I, I forget exactly what the story was. I told them, but I it was some bullshit and they never asked me anyway. I told the I had ended up telling the the real estate agent that I had, and he would tell them. So it was something along the lines of, I'd been in an accident or something, and I had, you know, several years ago, and I had a bunch of medical collections, which fit with Gary Sullivan, and then I was rebuilding my my credit. 
And I, I couldn't get a loan from a bank. You know, I, I worked for the same company for five years and I gave him my business card. And, and so he then conveyed that information to the homeowners. Homeowners agreed to go ahead and owner finance the properties. I went to two different closings, bought the one property from the one guy. It was cheap. It was like $110,000. It was it wasn't a big deal. The other property was w- worth about $230,000, the one that the doctor owned. And the doctor, they were trying to, they were moving to Atlanta, Georgia. So I go to the closing and I close on the property and that's great. It's great. It works out great. Uh, I've got, I've got the properties or I, I now am in possession of both the properties. And here's the thing. Like if you borrow money on a house, the bank will lend you more money if you live in the house. So I went, so Becky and I drove around and we ended up getting a bunch of boxes. Uh, and we, 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 uh, you know, like we got boxes and we just opened all the boxes and just piled them up. Right. So it looked like we, I just moved in. I went and I got furniture and uh, real cheap furniture and had it delivered plastics on it. Didn't even take the plastic off, bought a bunch of cheap, cheap frames, um, I mean, just ton, like really filled this house up with a lot of cheap furniture, but it's wrapped up in plastic and it, it, who knows? You don't even know that it's cheap. Like if you're an appraiser, you come to the house and you walk in, it looks like I live there. Bought a, uh, bought a be- couple of beds, put the beds in, just lean them up against the wall. Like, I mean, it looks like I'm, I live here. Like I just moved in uh, and boxes were like, we wrote like kitchen and put all a bunch of boxes in the kitchen that said kitchen, put, you know, just a bunch of junk. I mean, we spent like all day just doing this. And so the one house definitely looks like, like I live in the one house. Uh, the other house, uh, we did the same thing in the other house. Um, so I then turned around and I went downtown. I waited about a week or so. And I went downtown and I found, I, I went to public records downtown for real estate. And I found the recorded deed. I'm sorry. And I found all of, I found all the, the recorded, the deed to both houses and I found the mortgages on both houses. So I satisfy the loans that these people had on their, on their homes. I satisfy the loans for both of my, I create a satisfaction, what's called a satisfaction of mortgage. I fill it out. I get it notarized. I I didn't get it notarized. I notarized it myself because I had a notary stamp. So I notarized the document. I go back downtown and I file it in public records. And that basically satisfies the mortgages that are currently on the house in the other people's names. Now keep in mind, these guys also put first mortgages on the properties also in their name. It's called a wraparound. I then went back, got a copy of those documents, made satisfaction of mortgages for those documents, went back downtown and satisfied those loans on both the houses. So now I own these two houses. It's basically 200 and almost 250, 200, I'm sorry, $350,000 $350,000 worth of real estate I own free and clear. I don't technically. Technically, I have mortgages on them. I mean, it looks, appears I have mortgages, but, well, I have mortgages, but it appears I don't. And keep in mind, too, because I had owner financed these properties, they don't show up on Gary Sullivan's credit. So I then turn around and I go to, I don't want to say six or seven different banks, and I apply for loans on those properties. I get, I want to say like eight or nine loan mortgages on these properties. I close one on one ha- on the on the smaller of the two houses, the one that's going for like one ten. I close like four or five loans on that one, and I get like half because these these guys are only lending me like ninety six thousand or ninety thousand or a hundred thousand dollars on the property, and I close four or five like like half a million dollars on that property. But I'm going to focus more on the on the larger property, which was the one owned by the doctor. So I I then turn around and I I close on like five loans on that property, and those loans are like keep in mind I have a mortgage on on the properties too. So the money's not going directly to me. Some of the money's going to me. Some of the money's going to the corporations, so I can deposit those checks into the corporate accounts, because you know. Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac guidelines at the time, I don't know what they are now, probably the same. They they have an issue with just 
cutting you a check for a, more than $100,000. So what I did was I would have like $190,000 going to a corporation that appeared to be a mortgage company. And maybe five or $10,000 would go to me personally. And so, but either way, I'm getting the money because I'm in control of both of those two entities. So I would then take the money out of those entities and deposit, kind of spread it out amongst all of my bank accounts. And then I'd start removing that money in, in cash. And that's what I was in the middle of doing. I was slowly removing that money in, in cash. Listen, this, this whole time, you have to understand this whole time, Becky and I are going everywhere. We're going to... Um, Bermuda, we're going to Mexico, we're going to Jamaica, we're, we're flying all over the place. And I remember one time we had gone to, we'd actually gone to uh, New Orleans, and there was a, a, there was a, I think I did tell say this, where there was a, um, we went to New Orleans and stayed um, on like Royale Street, which is right next to Bourbon Street, and when we were there, uh, you know, we hung out there for like a week or 10 days or something. Then we went home. And I later found out when I ordered documents on myself, I found out that the U.S. Marshals had actually been there the same time we were there. There was a there was a famous artist by the name of Matthew Cox. Now, I'm also an artist. And what ended up happening was because I'm an artist, the U.S. Marshals had found out that there was a guy named Matt Cox who was having a, a gallery, like a showing and so they sent two U.S. Marshals to the gallery to ask them if the Matt Cox, who was doing the um, having a, a art exhibit or showing, whatever you want to call it, they showed him my picture and said, is this the Matt Cox that's the artist here? And the guy, the owner, looked at it and said, listen, I've known Matt Cox for whatever, whatever he said, five years or something. That's not him. But they happened to be, and by the way, that gallery was only like two streets away from where we were staying. Just so happens that they... Two marshals were there at the same time I was there. And I may have told that story earlier, but I always thought that was amazing. Like when I got the documents from Freedom of Information Act, I was like, oh my God, that's amazing. Back to um, Columbia, South Carolina. So I've got these, these two loans and I'm pulling money out of the properties. And I'm, but I'm staying in Charlotte. So one morning, I'm... And keep in mind, when I did these closings, I would close like within a day or two. So what happens is you close these loans on the, let's say I close four loans on a property or five loans on a property. The title company would then, you'd you'd sign, you go to five different title companies or four different ones or six different ones. So no one title company knows about the other loans. And what happened is, is I would sign the documents and the title company gets it. Then they put together a package. Then they mail that, those documents to public records. Then they just get recorded. Like the person in public records doesn't know, doesn't realize that there shouldn't be six loans on this one house. They have no idea. They're just, all their job is to get the loan document, scan a copy of it into public records, and then that's it. So it's not a big deal. I'm steadily pulling cash out, $8,000, $9,000, $4,000, you know, slowly pulling cash out of all these different bank accounts. And what ends up happening is, one day I'm sitting at home in Charlotte, in my apartment in Charlotte, and I get a phone call. And the phone, or I don't, Gary Sullivan gets a phone call because I'm actually living in Charlotte as a guy named Michael Eckert. And I get a phone call from a lawyer with, I want to say it was Washington Mutual Bank. I'm going to say Washington Mutual. Anyway, from Washington Mutual Bank, the guy calls me up and he's like, listen, hey, is this Gary Sullivan? I mean, is this, is this Gary Sullivan? I'm like, yeah, this is Gary Sullivan. And he says, hi, this is whatever his name was from uh, Washington Mutual Bank. I'm a lawyer. And he says, uh, we have a problem. And I go, what's that? He said, the problem is that um, we got a phone call from one of the title companies that says that you – that we're we have a first lien position on this property, but somebody else is in front of us. So he's saying we're supposed to be in first position on the title, and we're not. There apparently there's another loan in front of ours. We don't know how this happened, but it's it's it appears to be some kind of a scam or something. And you know we're thinking about calling the FBI, and we're not really sure. What's happening? So we we're hoping you could kind of explain it. And I said, whoa, 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 whoa. Listen, bro. 
I said, let's not call the FBI. Hey, you haven't called anybody, have you? And he was like, no, I haven't called anybody. And he said, but apparently, he said, I, I feel like this is maybe a, there's some kind of a scam happening here. I don't know what you're what you're up to. I said, well, listen, let me do me a favor. I said, give me about an hour or so. Let me go to talk to my corporate lawyer, and I'm gonna have give you a call back. Is that cool? And he goes, yeah. I go, don't call anybody till you hear from me. He said, no problem. I'll give you a couple hours. So I then jump in my car and I drive to Columbia, South Carolina. On my way there, I call the corporate lawyer who set up all these corporations for me. I call him and I explain to him what happened. He goes, wow, you know, Gary, this sounds like it could be a criminal action. My partner handles all of the law firm's criminal work. I'm going to have him here when you get here. So I show up and I say, listen, here's what's going on. I explain the situation. He says, and I tell him that I've actually borrowed like five mortgages on this property. And he says, you know, Wow. So the, both the lawyers are, are you serious? I don't know if it was four or five. Anyway, so let's say five. And I said, yeah, I've got five mortgages. And he goes, they go, oh my God. They go, what, what were you thinking? And I said, look, I just needed the money. And I, I, you know, I think I told him them, look, I, I went to a couple of different loan officers at the banks and they said that they could, they could fix it, fix this whole thing. And they were like, look, and I said, look, man, I, I, I need to, I need to pay off this Washington mutual. So I need you to call. So the criminal lawyer's like, well, what do you want to do? I said, I want you to call him and get him to sign something saying that he agrees that they're not going to contact law enforcement. And I remember he said, well, I don't know why he would contact law enforcement. He said, this is just a a, a, a um, creative financing error. This isn't criminal. He's like, we're not going to admit that this is this is not criminal. What you did was just a creating creative creative financing error. And so I started, I was like, okay, which I was pretty sure that I was not a creative financing error since obviously my name's not Gary Sullivan and the FBI and Secret Service weren't chasing me around the country because of creative financing. It was clearly fraud, but that's what he wanted to go with. So that's fine. And so he calls up Washington Mutual's lawyer and Washington Mutual's lawyer says, okay, look, I can, you know, if this guy can give us the money back, and really, it wasn't that much money. It was one of the. It was on the smaller house, which was like a hundred thousand dollars. So he said, "Does he have the hundred thousand dollars?" And I was like, "Yeah, I got that." And he goes, "Do you still have it?" And I said, "Of course I have. Yeah, I have it." And he says, "Okay." He goes, "He said if he can just give us the hundred thousand back, we'll we won't contact anybody." And I was like, "Okay, cool." So first they said he wanted me to go get a cashier's check and bring it to Washington Mutual ba- uh, Bank and deposit and have the manager call me. And I was like, listen, bro, I'm not going into a bank. Like my buddy Travis had been arrested going back to a bank when we knew there was a problem. Like I'm not stupid. I'm not going into a bank when I know there's a problem. So I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'll bring the cashier's check here to you, to the lawyer. And the lawyer explained that to their lawyer. And my lawyer explained it to their lawyer and their lawyer was like, okay, that's fine. So that's what happened. I, I got up and I went and I, um, I remember, I got up and I, just as I was about to get up, the, the two lawyers were like, Gary, wait, we have to talk to you about something. I said, what's that? And they said, listen, they said, okay, we have an, this is just one bank. You've got like four more mortgages on this property. What are we going to do about those? I said, well, my, my immediate problem is just paying off these people. And they said, yeah, but listen, there's four more mortgages. Like, what are you going to do? Like, what, what are you going to do if they find out about the other mortgages? And I went, well, that's when I leave town. And so they both laughed. They were like, oh, Gary, Gary, listen. They said, don't you understand? You can't just leave town. Like, they have your name, your social security number, your date of birth. Like, they'll find you. I mean, they, you know, this, is, this could be a real problem. And I looked at, I remember I looked at both of them and I said, you're assuming my name's Gary Sullivan. And they both like were like, whoa. And I remember thinking to myself, they don't meet a lot of guys like me. And I said, they said, well, uh, I remember that the corporate lawyer goes, I mean, sorry, the um, criminal lawyer goes, uh, well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. I said, right. I said, my immediate problem is paying these guys off. I said, I'll be back with a cashier's check. I go, I jump in my car. I go get a cashier's check. I come back. Um, when I come back, I give it to them, 
And he calls them and says, look, we have the cashier's check. He reads off the the whole thing. He faxes them a copy. He says, we'll have the money wired to you in the next day or two. And so that's that's done. I'm, I'm good with that. And I remember the, the lawyer looked at me and said, well, we need to discuss our, our fee. And I went, okay. Um, you know, which was funny because like you'd think you'd want to discuss their fee before they did all this work. And he go and I said, okay, well, what do you think's fair? And he said, well, you know, I, mean, I said you got a couple hours in this at this point. And he goes, yeah, I know, but you know, it's a, a lot of phone calls and it's a it's a dicey situation. And he said, um, he goes, I'm thinking fifteen hundred bucks. And I went, okay. And I pulled out, pulled out, you know, some money out of my pocket and I start counting out fifteen hundred dollars in cash. And he goes, no, no, no. He said, well, Gary, we don't we don't typically take cash. We we typically take a check. And I looked at him and I go, after what you just heard, I've done. You take a check from me. And he goes, yeah, um, yeah, you know what? Go ahead and give me cash. So I counted out the cash, gave him the cashier's check, of course, and I left his office. Went straight to a bank and removed more money. Went to another bank, removed more money. Remo- went to another bank. So, I mean, it was going to take, I had about 1.3. At this point, I still had like 1.3 million, 1.2 million maybe. No, I had 1.3 million after I gave him the 100,000 back. So I was pulling out cash. I knew it was going to take about a month or so for me to get all the cash because I was removing it slowly. I was also getting cashier's checks and having and depositing the cashier's checks in other bank accounts. That way the balances just didn't you didn't have like 300,000 in one account is just drained. I was doing it so that the banks the the balances would go up and down up and down so i was taking i would go in and i'd deposit a cashier's check for thirty thousand dollars and i'd ask for eight thousand dollars back and they would they, they would uh you know they would cut me the check it's funny that whole time i only got a, a i only got a two or three suspicious activity reports filed on me uh never got a cc uh, a ctr filed on me I, and i found all this out later when i got eventually get caught so i'm removing money no big deal uh, I remember, wow, I remember at this point, Becky and I were just at each other's throats. I mean, she was miserable. She was, she was stoned all the time. She was, it, it was, it was just horrible. Like living with her, like bringing her with me was just the biggest mistake ever. You know, and we have different identities. We have fake identities. You know, she's got a bunch of friends, but she doesn't have a job. Like, I remember telling her, maybe you should get a job because she was someone that, like, if she didn't have something to do, she was like a child. Like, she would just get into trouble, and she was stoned all the time or drunk, and, you know, I don't really go out. Like, I'm not a, a, a guy that goes out. I'm not a flashy person. I, we, we did have – we had nice vehicles. You know, obviously, we were both driving sports cars, and I think – and she had a, a – she had like an infinity, the S, infinity SUV, and we have, we had nice vehicles. You know, we're going on vacation. We're I'm trying to keep her occupied. Uh, we're we're doing rock climbing and and going on these, you know, going out uh, as much as I was willing to go out. And she had a bunch of friends, but you know, periodically she she was she was bipolar, so she was have she would have these mood swings, and 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 I remember one night, and she started screaming. This actually happened about, I only talk about, I think, two different occasions in the book. But this happened like three times where she just was, was screaming and hollering about how you ruined my life and I can't believe you did this to me. And I was like, like, I don't even know you. You begged to come with me. And I kept telling her, you really haven't done anything wrong yet. Well, you can go home. Like, I'll get $100,000. We'll, I'll put you, get $100,000, $200,000 and we'll put it aside for you and you can get a lawyer. And you're like, I'm trying to get rid of her. And I remember one time she screamed so much that I knew it was in the middle of the night. And she just lost it. I remember thinking the, the cops are coming. So I, I just left. I grabbed a bag, threw a bunch of stuff in a duffel bag and left. And I got in the car and started driving. And she calls me up. She called, must have called me like 50 times. And by the time she, I finally answered the phone, I remember the cops had just gotten there. And the cops told her, listen, if this guy, like one of the neighbors had called. Because she was screaming so loud. They, and the cops said, listen, had this guy been here, one of the two of you would have had to have gone to prison or go, gone to jail. So, I mean, this, this chick's going to get me caught. It, she's, just, she's a lunatic. Um, 
what else had I done uh, at this point? God, I remember this point. I was living as Michael Eckert, and I got his, I had his name changed to Michael Johnson just to see if I could do it, you know, see what the process was because I was trying to figure out how to kind of create a whole synthetic identity by kind of altering a, a, a person so much that they became their own person. Like I was already able to get passports and and I, I had, God, I had like at this point probably half a dozen, no, more than that, probably a dozen passports at this point. When I get caught, eventually I got caught, I had like two dozen passports. By this point, I, pr I probably have like maybe a dozen passports and we're traveling all the time. So Becky's a lunatic. She's spending money like you can't believe. She got a bunch of plastic surgery. She got a boob job. She got liposuction. She had two tummy, two tummy tucks. Listen, she looked amazing. She did. She looked amazing by the time she had all the surgery. Um, all right. At this point, I. Um, at this point, things are going good. I think I have six or seven hundred thousand dollars I've pulled out of the bank. Plus, we still have some money left over. But the way Becky's spending money, it's outrageous. I came home one day and she had bought a new a new SUV. Like it was just ridiculous, and I was like, well, "What you know? What 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 are you what are you fucking doing?" Like I started going, "What are you doing? You're blowing all the money. You just you're you're pissing away all the money on on stuff that we really, you know, I, I wasn't sure exactly how we were going to get the money back. You bought a brand new SUV, and when you've already got a sports car, and she was like, "Oh, the sports car wasn't big enough for all of her friends to go out." And, you know, and listen, she's she's going she's going on little vacations with her friends. So she screamed. I remember the one time she got the cops called. I wouldn't come back until she agreed to get her own apartment. So we, I had her go and get an apartment at a building right down the street, like from her. And I remember from her balcony, she could see my apartment into my apartment. She was crazy. So here's what happens. I one day I go to Columbia and I'm removing money. What I didn't know was this: was that one of the loans that I had applied for, the woman that I applied for the loan with had gone on vacation and had never put the title work in. So when she got back from vacation, she called me and said, look, we can probably close next week. And I said, and by that point, I'd already closed like five loans on the property. So I didn't want to, I didn't want to close her loan because I knew there were other loans were going to, were already showing up in public records. So I didn't want her to continue her loan process because I knew when when the title company that she used searched public records, they were going to see those those other recorded mortgages. So when she called me, I said, cancel the loan. I've already refinanced with my bank. She said, oh gosh, um, I'm sorry, Gary. I didn't realize you were in a hurry. And I said, yeah, well, it's not a big deal. I said, but do me a favor. I said, make sure to cancel the, the title work being done. I don't want anybody to go down to public records and spend all that time searching the title, you know. And she goes, oh, it's not a big deal. I understand. I'll cancel it. She didn't cancel it. What ended up happening was somebody went to public records, an abstractor went to public records, an abstractor is a person that goes and does all the uh, title work for the title companies. An abstractor went to public records. They saw that there were three mortgages on the property. There were actually four or five, including the two that I'd satisfied. However, they only saw three for some reason. So they immediately contacted the bank. They said, oh, this is fraud. There's three mortgages on this thing. Like something's up. And this guy's trying to borrow another mortgage. Like something's wrong. So they made a few phone calls and immediately there was an investigation launched. The The company that was in charge of that investigation was Wachovia's fraud department. So I go into the bank one day to pull out like $8,000 in cash. Like I'm doing every other day. Sometimes it's 4,000, sometimes it's nine, whatever. So I walk in one day, you know, with my Gary Sullivan ID and, um, I go in and I said, and, and this is interesting. So by the way, when I would, whenever I would withdraw money, I, Becky, I would tell Becky, hey, I'm going into the bank. She'd go, okay, no problem. And I remember this happened many, many times. Becky would say, hey, what if you get arrested? 
And I would say, if I get arrested, I'm going to need, uh, all you have to do is call a lawyer, a local lawyer, and have him get me out on bond. Because if I get arrested, it won't be as Matthew Cox, it will be as whatever ID I'm using. Because I'm not typically the kind of guy that walks around. I don't have multiple IDs. I would walk in with a couple credit cards and an ID, pocket lint, everything as the person I'm, I am, who I am. So they would typically just arrest me, and, and I would have a valid ID or driver's license or passport. So they, my identity wouldn't be in question, so they wouldn't run me right away. And, and I, I, I said, so you get me an, a lawyer, and they'll be able to get me out before I'm ID'd because typically they don't try and ID you if you have identification, especially if it's identification issued by that state. So no problem. I go into the bank. I walk into the bank. This was well a Wachovia bank. I walked into Wachovia bank, and I put my ID down, and I said, hey, I'd like to remove, I forget what it was, eight grand or something, seven grand. And the woman goes, okay, hold on. And she walks in the back, which wasn't a big deal because I, I had, you know, every time I went in there, they would go in the back and they'd make a few phone calls because, you know, I'm withdrawing cash. And it's, a, it's an account that was open less than 90 days ago. So I'm waiting and waiting. It's not a big deal. And all of a sudden, somebody reaches over my arm and grabs me by the hand and pulls my hand back. I go to turn and somebody grabs me from the other side, pulls the other arm behind my back, and boom, I feel the handcuffs on me. You know that noise they make? And and I go, I turn around, and there are two massive, massive sheriff's deputies from, I want to say it's Richland County. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, well it's, it says Columbus, but it's actually Richland County. So I think they're Richland County sheriff's deputies. So they turn around, they look at me, and they said, Mr. Sullivan, sorry, you're being detained. And they walk me into an into the manager's office and sit me down and i mean i listen let me tell you something i mean i'm just like numb i'm just going holy shit like this is it they've got me uh and i'm waiting i'm waiting they and i said what's going on what's happening the guy the guy goes well we don't really know we were just told to 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 keep you here and detain you until the detective gets here. And I kept thinking to myself, because he said detective, I remember thinking, like, I don't know the difference between an officer, a deputy, an agent, a detective. Like, I don't know these things at the time. And I was like, oh, okay. So I thought the FBI was showing up or the Secret Service. So I'm waiting and waiting. And all of a sudden, this guy walks in, probably in his late, probably early 30s, mid 30s, let's say. I don't remember exactly. And he walks in. He's got his nice gray suit. And he walks in. He says, hey, uh, Mr. Sullivan, uh, my name is Detective whatever his name was. And he says, my name is Detective whatever. And um, we've got a phone call. We have a complaint filed by Wachovia, the head of Wachovia's security department, and you know their fraud department, and they're saying that you're running some kind of a scam. And I went, Really? And he goes, yeah, apparently he said you have three mortgages on your, on your piece of property. Now, that was the, the Willow, I think it was Willow property. Anyway, that was the one that was like 230000 So there's like half a million dollars in mortgages that they've just discovered. Now, they only discovered three because there were multiple, several more. And so I went, and he, he said, yeah, apparently you have three mortgages on this property. And I went, is that illegal? And the guy goes... The detective went, you know, I don't know. And I remember thinking, oh, I'm walking out of here. I'm walking out of here. What do you mean you don't know? So I was like, oh, okay. He said, let me let me call uh, Wachovia. So he gets on the phone, and he calls Wachovia, the, their, the head of their fraud department. So he gets the guy on the phone, and the guy, and he's like, hey, I have Gary Sullivan here. And so he's kind of explaining, and he, and he goes, oh, what is the problem? He's like, I'm not even sure what to arrest this guy for. Like, he, he came in, he borrowed a mortgage. Like, what's the problem? And the guy said... He's running a shotgunning scam, which is exactly the type of scam that I was running. Like, the Wachovia knows exactly what I'm doing. <clears throat> and I'm like, uh, and, and so I could hear him on the phone. And he said, he's pulling money out in cash. He's this, and he looks at me, he looks at me and he says, he says, you're not, you have three mortgages. I go, right. 
I said, I have three mortgages. And he goes, yeah, he says that's fine. He goes, yeah, there are three first mortgages. And I went, no. I said, one was a first mortgage, one is a second mortgage, and one is a, a, a HELOC, a home equity line of, of uh, credit, which isn't true, by the way. They were all first mortgages. But nowhere on the document does a first mortgage say it's a first mortgage. It just says it's a mortgage. It's just a lien placed on your property, right? So I know that it could easily, that there's no way that he knows that I know that. And so I explain it's a first mortgage, second mortgage, and it's a HELOC. And so the guy from Wachovia goes, they're all first mortgages. And I say, listen, man, I read those documents. None of them even said they were first mortgages. Like I, I, I and he goes, and so he says, okay, he's, he goes, why, why is he, why would he go to three different companies? And he goes, why would you go to three different companies, Gary? And I went, okay, look, I said, I came into Wachovia because Wachovia obviously knows they're a first, they have a first mortgage. I go, I came into Wachovia, I applied for a first mortgage to re, uh, refinance my property. I refinanced it. I told them that I needed some, I told the loan officer here, hey, I really need to borrow a, about three or $400,000. And the loan officer said, look, we can't give you that much money, but I have a friend that can probably get you a second mortgage and another friend that can probably get you a HELOC. And so, and keep in mind, I don't even know what mortgages they know about. And I remember the detective goes, he flips open and he goes, oh, so that would be Fieldstone Mortgage and SunTrust Bank. And I went, right. Like literally he just told me who, what the mortgages are. I don't even know. And I was like, exactly. I got a second mortgage from Fieldstone and a, and a HELOC from SunTrust. SunTrust at the time was big on HELOCs. They did a lot of HELOCs. Guy from Wachovia screaming, that's not true. And he says, he's, and he, listen, he even had to tell, the detective even had to tell Wachovia's fraud guy, to keep his mouth, to, to lower his voice, like calm down. He's telling him, he's telling him, arrest him. And so then he says, why is he removing all the money in cash? And he looks at me and he says, why are you removing all the money in cash? And I said, look, I said, I work for a labor company. Okay. Now, by the, by the way, by this point, the, the detective had told me you're not under arrest. And I showed him my cuffs and I said, I feel like I'm under arrest. And he, he told me, he told the the deputy take the handcuffs off him. So they took, so I don't even have handcuffs on at this point. So I said, bro, I said, honestly, I work for a labor company. So I pull out, I pull out my business card and I hand him my business card and it says labor on demand. And I said, I work for a labor company. All right. I said, we provide a lot of labor for um, commercial projects. I said, and a lot of our laborers are undocumented. They don't have they, they don't actually have bank accounts, and they typically will go, have to go to some kind of a, a person that cashes their check, and they'll take like 10%. I said, I know the checks are good, so typically what I do is I pull out cash, and I give them, I cash their checks for them for free because I feel bad for them. And he looked at me, and he goes, no, that, that's, that's, I go, is that illegal? I, mean, I don't think that's illegal. And he goes, no, no, that's not illegal. That's actually very nice of you, and it, it makes sense. And, and he said, no, that's, that's a good thing. I don't, he said, yeah. And he explains it to the guy from Wachovia. He's losing it, losing it. So then he says, it, this guy is running a scam. He goes, he's running a scam. His name isn't even Gary Sullivan. He's using a fake ID. So the funny thing about that is, as he's yelling at that, and which is absolutely true, but my ID had been issued by South Carolina DMV. So he starts yelling. This guy, by the way, the, the guy from Wachovia is in California. He starts saying, look at the ID. It starts with 000. And the detective says, no, our IDs start with 000. Trust me, this guy's Gary Sullivan. I even ran an NCIC report, which is they, he ran me through the national credit or national credit, national criminal uh, um, a database. So he said, trust me, his name's this is Gary Sullivan. So I remember I looked at the detective and I go, are you serious, bro? I go, now I'm not even Gary Sullivan. I go, come on, man. What are we doing here? And he goes, I know, Gary. I know. I know. So listen, I've totally won over the detective. At this point, the detective tells the guy from Wachovia, he says, listen, he says, I don't even know what this guy's done wrong. You know, he said, I don't even know what to charge him with. He goes, I'm going to have him follow me downtown and I'm going to have him fill out a report. And then honestly, he said, I'm going to I'm going to wait until I talk to the district attorney to see if he's even committed a crime. Listen, the guy from Wachovia is losing it. So he ends up hanging up the phone uh, from the, the guy from the uh, Wachovia fraud guy. 
and I stand up, and he says to me, Gary, he said, do you have your, do you have a, a driver's license? And I went, well, yeah, I do, but it's, it's in Nevada. And he goes, oh, that's right, you're from Nevada. And he glances at the two sheriff's deputies, and they all grin at each other. And I immediately realized that he ran me through NCIC, which means he knows that the transient that I had was using his information, I'd stolen his ID, he had been arrested twice for prostitution. So these guys think that I've been arrested twice for prostitution. And they all kind of grin at each other. And I'm like, oh, fuck. So, you know, like a little embarrassed, but I have bigger problems. So anyway, he says, would you have your ID with you? And I said, um, actually, I said the... I said, the deputy's got my ID. So he pulls the ID out and he goes, yeah, yeah, I got his ID. And he says, is your, do, you have, he goes, do you have a valid driver's license? I said, well, I mean, I think so. I think it's valid. And the deputy says, well, I'll check. So he walks out to his police car to check and see if Gary Sullivan has a valid ID. I had no idea if Gary Sullivan has a valid ID. I, he was a homeless guy that I'd met in, in Nevada. Who fucking knows? He didn't even have a house. He didn't even have a place to stay. So what, what ends up happening is the detective said, uh, so the deputy comes back in and he hands me the ID and he goes, yeah, he's got a, he's got a valid ID. And he goes, oh, okay, cool. He said, he said, it, 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 he said, it, it, um, he said, it's valid. He goes, yeah, it's valid. He goes, well, it says he's five foot 10. And they all look at me and I'm like five foot six. And they all look at me and I go, well, fellas, I go with a good pair of shoes. And they all start laughing. <laughs> Gary, follow me. And he lets me walk out, get into my car. Which, by the way, my car was registered in the name Michael um, Eckert. Which was registered to the address I was living at in Charlotte, North Carolina. So I get in the car and I follow him back to the police station. I go inside, I fill out a police report, and then when I'm done with the police report... He asked me, "Can you go? Go? Can you stand in the hallway? I can't." He couldn't leave me in his cubicle for some reason. While he went and got his lieutenant to sign off on it, so I stand in the um, in the hallway. And while I'm in the hallway, there's a bunch of of uh, wanted posters, and there must have been fifty or eighty of them, right? And there was only one that was in full color, and it was my Secret Service's most wanted poster. So, uh. I, I ended up before I by the way before I walked in there on my way back to the police on my way to the police station Becky had called me and she she must have called me 50 times like I had like 50 missed messages so I get the phone and I'm like oh my god so she it was ringing as soon as I got in the car and I go hey what's up she goes oh my god where have you been I was like um I said listen man I got I got I got issues I said I just got questioned by the police I'm on my way back to the police station back to I'm on my way to the police station right now and um, she goes, oh, my God, oh, my God. She goes, I just checked the Internet. You're number one on the Secret Service's most wanted list. And I was like, oh, man. I said, look, I got bigger problems. I said, I got to go in the police station and fill out a police report. She goes, don't go in the police station. Get on the interstate and, and get out of there. And I went, I can't. There's a cop car behind me, and there's, there's a sheriff's, there's a cruiser was, like, in front of me, and, like, the cop car was behind me. I said, I, I'm boxed in. I can't. I have to play this out. And I said, look, worst case scenario is this. If I get arrested, I'll be arrested as Gary Sullivan. You can get me a lawyer. And before I could say anything, she goes, I'm not getting you a lawyer. I'm not getting you out on bond. You, I'm not going to risk everything I've got for you. She probably had six or $700,000 in cash. So I was like, well, I guess I better not get arrested. And I hang up the phone. I go into the police station. I fill out the police report while I'm waiting in the hallway I see my Secret Service's most wanted poster. The deputy walks up behind me while I'm looking, while I'm glancing at it. He walks up and says, hey, Gary, you ready to go? And I was like, absolutely terrified me. Like I jumped and, and totally flipped out. So I was like, oh, my God. And he says, uh, hey, you ready to go? And I said, yeah, everything, everything fine. He said, yeah, yeah. Well, he said, my lieutenant signed off on it. No big deal. We're going to look into it. I'm not sure you've done anything wrong. We'll have to check into it. We get in the elevator, and as I'm walking out, he goes, do me a favor, though. He goes, don't, don't go anywhere. Like, don't, don't leave the, the area because we do have some questions, and I might want to talk to you again. I said, yeah, no problem, bro. I go, I own a couple houses in this area, so I'm not going anywhere. I work in this area. He goes, okay, cool. So I leave. I go straight to two more banks and get out more cash. 
And then when I walk into the third bank, somebody in the bank, like literally, they, they see me and two women almost bump into each other trying to get to the telephone. And I knew right then something else, something was up. Like I didn't know if there was just like a, a red notice or something, some kind of a, a warning or something to, if they saw me to call call the police or something. So I saw them. I was like, ah, oh, shit. So I, I realized what was happening. I turned around, got back in my car, drove off, got on the interstate, and drove um, drove back to uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I remember Becky had called me, and she was like, oh, my God, thank God you're okay. Are you okay? Are you okay? I was like, you bitch. You were going to leave me here. And she's like, no, I was packing a bag. I was going to come get you. I was going to come get you. But she was never going to come get me. So... I ended up leaving, um, yeah, I ended up leaving and driving back to, uh, back to Charlotte. When I got to Charlotte, <clears throat> keep in mind, when I got to Charlotte, Becky and I had, we already knew that we were leaving the area. So I was just pulling out a bunch of money out of that scam. I was going to get the $1.3 million, and then we were leaving anyway. So Becky wasn't in Charlotte anymore. She had moved to Houston, Texas. She'd gotten an ID. She'd gotten an apartment. She was living in a condo in downtown Houston. So, of course, when I got back to Charlotte, I immediately packed up all, all my stuff. Put it. In, or I had two guys. She actually had two guys meet me the next day. They packed up a U-Haul van. And I got in the U-Haul van, and I left my car in the parking lot in our my apartment uh, in downtown Charlotte. And then I, I left, and I drove all the way to Houston, Texas. When I got to Houston, it was, you know, an issue. Uh, as soon as I got there, we unloaded the vehicle. Well, we had a couple of uh, – she had a couple of Mexican laborers meet she and I – at a U storage and we unloaded the U-Haul and then we took the U-Haul and I like parked it on like the outside of her, her apartment building. She had a great apartment. Uh, and so I was going to stay there with her until I got my own place basically. So we went down, we had, I remember we had something to eat and we were driving around and as she was like showing me the area, she's like, Oh my gosh, it's a great area. There's a sushi place here and there's this and there's that. And she's pointing out the whole place. I remember I, I, I said, Hey, I had seen a, like a, a for sale sign in the front of this townhouse. And it was, you know, it was in one of those for sale signs. It had one, there was one of those, uh, those plastic, clear plastic, uh, um, flyer things. So I, I go, hey, stop the car, stop the car. And I jumped out and I grabbed the, I pulled a flyer out of it. And I got back in the car and I was reading about the townhouse. And I remember Becky said, oh my God, you know, what, uh, what are you doing? And I went, well, keep in mind, she's bipolar and she's not taking her medication. Like I had sent her to a psychiatrist. She had been prescribed Zoloft. She would take the Zoloft for a month or so, and then she just stopped taking it. And she would always say that, well, I, I felt better. I thought it was, it was okay. I didn't think I needed it. I don't like the way it makes me feel. You know, it, it was a mood stabilizer, and it, it would keep her from getting too manic, but it also, you know, it kept her from getting too low and depressed, but it also kept her from getting too manic. So she didn't like it, and so she'd stop taking it. So anyway, as soon as I got back in the car, she immediately said, you know, what are you doing? Like, well, why why'd you get that flyer? She goes, you're not going to run a scam here, are you? I don't want to run a scam here. She goes, I, I like it here. I want to stay here. And I went, I'm not going to run a scam here. I said, but I need to find a place to live. I can't stay with you. She just went nuts. She immediately started screaming, what, I'm so disgusting that you can't stay around me. You don't care about me. I mean, just went just nuts. And so I remember saying to her, did you... Are you still taking your medication? That sent her off again. I'm not taking my medication. Fuck you. I don't want to take that shit. I don't, there is nothing wrong with me. It's you. And I was like, oh, wow. So we go back to her place, get into the elevator, go up in the elevator. I remember, this is funny because I remember 
there was this really hot chick that got into the elevator. And I remember being in the elevator staring at the ground because I remember thinking, don't even look at this chick. Don't even glance at her because Becky's staring at me and I'm trying not to stare at this chick. As soon as we get up to Becky's floor and the door opens, I bolt off the elevator immediately. And I remember as we were walking off, Becky said, I bet you'd love to fuck that little skank. And immediately as the elevator doors were closing, I heard the girl go, hey, <laughs> just cracked me up. So I get to her apartment, we go inside, and all I can think about is like, this chick is going to get me arrested. Like I, I'd known it before, and I wanted to keep her, you know, I, I wanted to do the right thing by Becky. I didn't want to leave her. But it's just at this point, you know, she just one. I knew I couldn't rely on her because she had she had told me she was not going to come pick me up at, at the police station when I was I was in the at the video before this one. I explained that I'd gotten caught and I'd gone to the police station. And Becky had told me like, if you get arrested, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get you out on bond. I'm not gonna help you. So I was you know I, I just realized like th- there's just no reason for me to stick it out with this chick anymore at all. She was planning on taking the money and just keeping the money and leaving me in prison. Like this is this is not a girl that's worth staying for. So I I but when I had gotten there, I she had taken the money that I showed up with. She had taken like I had all the money in like a it was it was in a you know, a, a duffel bag. And she had taken it and put it somewhere in the apartment. And I didn't know where it was. This was a, a big apartment. She had a lot of stuff. It was a nice place. And I thought, how am I going to figure out where the money is? So I still had like, I don't know what it was, ten or $15,000 in cash. So I pulled the money out and I, and I handed her the money. I said, hey, by the way, I said, this is what I got out of the bank. Here you go. And I gave her the money. She took the money and she goes, she, you know, she's ready to fight. And she just kind of like looked at me and just shrugged and walked off, leaving me like in the kitchen. So I remember, so I, as she walked into her bedroom, I immediately ran up to the door and looked where she was going. And she walked in the closet, stuck the money in a, in a, like a shoe box, a Prada shoe box. I remember she stuck it in the Prada shoe box and turned around and I bolted back to the kitchen. She walked out and I said, listen. I said, we need to talk about just splitting up the money and going our separate ways. And she was like, um, well, you know, well, you know, you can leave and, but I'm not leaving and you're not getting any money. And so we start getting into this huge argument about the money. And at one point she said, you know, you're not getting any of the money. And I said, listen, let me explain something. I said, we're splitting the money up. And I said, cause when I asked her what she thought I deserved, she said, nothing. She says, you don't deserve anything. I want to keep all, I'll, I'll keep the money. She said, I can't go do what you're doing. So I need all the money. You can go run another scam. I go, yeah, but I don't have anything. You're telling me nothing. I don't deserve anything. She says, no, you don't deserve anything. I mean, she was just a fucking bitch. And I was like, I, I said, listen, I said, let me explain something. I said, we're splitting up the money. I'm getting something. I said, or I'll take all of it. And she said, with what? She goes, you don't even know where it is. I said, it's in the sh- it's in the Prada shoe box that's sitting in your closet. And she was like, she immediately was like, oh, uh, okay, you can see it in her face. And I said, I said, so either I take all the money or we come up with something reasonable. And she goes, even she she said, take all the money and do what? She said, you're gonna what? She said, drive off in that U-Haul van. She is in the ID that that the police are gonna be looking for. And the funny thing is, is that like, she was right, like. I didn't have ID. We'd put all my IDs in the storage unit. Like, I didn't have anything. And I didn't have anything that she didn't know about. So I couldn't use any of those IDs. Because she made it perfectly clear, like, she's going to call the police. Tell them, hey, there's this guy. He's in a U-Haul van. Here's who he is. Like, what am I going to do? So we argue, and we end up arguing. And I I said, look, give me $100,000 in cash. You keep the rest of the money. So she gave me 100000 in cash, and I left. And I remember when I left, I left my cell phone on the kitchen counter because the, 
times that I had left her before, she'd always called me and called me and called me until I eventually answered the phone, and then she would talk me back into coming back. Like she'd cry and beg and plead, and I'd end up turning around and coming back. So I took the phone, I put the phone down, I grabbed my duffel bag, I grabbed the 100000 I walked out, got into the van, and just started driving. And never, uh, you know, never went back. So I was somewhere around um, going through Louisiana, through Baton Rouge. I forget the interstate that cuts through there, but I was going through there, and I had stopped to get a track phone. So I got this track phone. It's like a burner phone. So, you know, I got the phone just so I could call home. I called my mom. I called my ex-wife. I ended up calling a friend of mine named Susan, who was also one of my former mortgage brokers. And I called Susan, and she had said, look, like every, like the FBI is looking for you. Like they've, they've been, they're knocking on doors. They're banging on everybody's, uh, um, everybody's door. They're, they're staking out people's houses. They've interviewed almost everybody. Like they, it's done. Like it, you're done. Everybody's cooperating, which included Susan. And she said, you need to turn yourself in. She said, the FBI's, uh, the agent's name is Candace Calderon. She's the lead agent. And she wants, she said that if I ever talk to you to have you call her, I have her phone number and I didn't want to do it, but I was like, you know, I give me, I was like, eh, I don't know. So she was just call her and hear her out. So I got her phone number and I called the, I called the agent and, um, I talked to her on the phone and I was like, Hey, my name's Matt Cox. I said, you know, she answered the phone and I, is this, you know, agent called her on and she said, yeah. And I said, this is Matt Cox. And she was like, Oh wow, Mr. Cox, how'd you get my phone number? I told her Susan gave it to me. She told you me, you wanted to talk to me. And she goes, yeah. I said, well, what can I do for you? And she said, well, I want you to turn yourself in. I said, yeah, that's not going to happen. And, and she said, well, let's not be too hasty. Uh, she said, maybe we can work something out. And I said, okay, well, what are we working out? I said, how much time am I looking at? And she goes, that's not how it works. You have to turn yourself in and we'll take that into consideration. I was like, yeah, I'm not doing that. So she and I went back and forth and we started arguing back and forth. And, and she was like, look, you're going to get caught. And, I, and she said, we're going to catch you eventually. You're, we're, we're definitely going to catch you. You'll never get away with this. And I, by this point, it had been like a year and a half. And I was like, well, what do you mean you're going to catch me? I said, I mean, what's taking you so long? Like, if you know, you know where I'm at, come get me. And she said, Remember she said, we're, we're 90% as sure of where you are. And I said, well, only 100% counts. And so, you know, we had done stuff like we had left. When we, we, we abandoned a car one time, this Audi that I had, we abandoned it. When we left Atlanta, we left that car in Atlanta in a police substation. And in the car, we left Lyra and the book Spanish for Dummies. So, and a brochure for like a, span, a, a, a hotel in Spain. So, you know, they then you would read the newspaper and like CNN would say, and the CNN website would say that they're believed to be in Spain, you know, so, you know, or they're believed to be in Cuba or, you know, that kind of thing. So we, we were leaving like these these blind alleys. Like they had no idea where, where we were. And, so I'm I'm talking to her and I said, "Look, you're you're never going to you're not going to catch me." And she was like, "Well, you're cocky, you know, aren't you?" And I said, "Listen, I said I'm I'm so that I'm, I'm I I am cocky, but I'm not stupid enough to just turn myself in and hope for the best." So I remember she said, "At some point, you're going to go back to you're going to go back to Tampa or somebody's going to recognize you and they're going to turn you in." And, and I said, listen, I said, there's nobody in Tampa that I'm, I'm, I want to go back to see. I said, I'm not, she, oh, and she said, or you're going to get pulled over and the police are going to uh, arrest you. I said, I said, there's nobody I'm planning on going back to seeing it in Tampa. I said, and as far as someone recognized me, I said, nobody's going to recognize me. I've had tons of plastic surgery. I don't even look like the same person. I said, and on top of that, I said, I just, I said, I've already gotten like five different tickets from police. I went to traffic school as another guy one time because I was gonna. I'd gotten so many tickets in his name and his driver's license. He was gonna lose his. He was gonna lose his license. So I said, "You're not." I said, and as far as some cop, I said, somebody recognized me. I said, "Man, I've got passports." I said, "I, I just got back from a trip. I've, I've been in and out of the country. Like you're never gonna talk to me in person, ever, unless we work out a deal." So, she said, "Give me some time. Let me call the U.S. attorney. I'll find out." 
what, what I can get you. And I said, okay. And she said, what's your phone number? I'll call you back. Which was funny because, you know, obviously she had my phone number. I was just like, I said, yeah, listen. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm just going to shut off the phone. I go, you're probably like triangulating this call right now. And I remember she said, she goes, get over yourself. You're not that important. And I remember thinking, yeah, bro, like, like this isn't CSI. Like they're not tracking your phone call. Like, what, what, what are you even thinking? Like, that's just silliness. You're not, you're nobody. But something in me told me, you know what? Just shut the phone off. And I went, you know, I said, I'll call you back in, a, in like an hour. She goes, okay. And I shut the phone off and turned it off. Now, I later found out she immediately called the U.S. Marshals. They immediately tracked the phone. They called the local Mar- U.S. Marshals office. They found out that the phone had just been, that it was shut off, but it had just been sold at a, um, at a gas station. And in the gas station there was a subway station, you know, subway subs, you know, and I was actually sitting in the subway sandwich station, uh, subway stand, uh, subway sandwich shop, eating a subway sandwich, playing on my laptop while I was talking to her. So they immediately had two agent, two, uh, two U.S. marshals jump in a car and head that way. I waited there another, I'd say 30, 45 minutes. I finally gotten. I finally thought, you know what? I'm gonna call her, but I'll call her from the road. So I got in my in the U-Haul and I started driving, and I was driving down the road. And they, those two U.S. Marshals, showed up, and I had just left. I was on the interstate headed towards North Carolina, and the reason I was going to North Carolina was like I'm driving a U-Haul truck. I needed to get a vehicle, and I had a vehicle in my apartment complex, so I was just gonna get that vehicle, even though. I knew that the police in South Carolina knew what kind of vehicle I was driving. And by this point, I knew they had, they had figured out where that vehicle was registered to. And they probably knew the address. But the vehicle was in the parking garage. So I thought I could get to it. I wasn't going to the apartment. So I'm still driving the car. And I call, back the, call the FBI agent back. Because by this point, she should have talked to the U.S. attorney. So I call her up and she says, she actually hadn't talked to the U.S. attorney. I, I actually had to call her back. But regardless, when I eventually talked to her, I talked to her and I said, hey, what's going on? She said, okay, I talked to Robert Mazakowski. That was the name of the uh, U.S. attorney in Tampa. And he said he can get you seven years if you cooperate. And I was like, seven years? And I was like, listen, that was seven years for what I had done in Tampa. And I said, does that include... Atlanta and some other stuff. I was thinking South Carolina, which she didn't even know about. I said that some other stuff I've done, like, you know, in Atlanta, is that including Atlanta and some other stuff? She goes, look, you show up and, and, and we'll, we'll work it out. I said, okay, well, she said seven years. I go, seven years for everything? She said, look, she said, if you, when you come, she goes, I can meet you at your parents' house and I can arrange for you to see your, your, your parents and your son. And then I went, Okay, well, I, I appreciate that. She goes, I'll let you hang out there for like a couple hours so you guys can all spend some time together before we put you in custody. I said, okay, um, I don't know. She said, look, she said, you know, everybody's already cooperated against you. And I said, yeah. I said, and this is going to include everything. She said, look, what's important is that, you know, you have to turn yourself in before this gets out of control. Somebody might try and apprehend you. You could get hurt. And I was like, oh, I'm not worried about that. And I said, look, why don't I go to Atlanta? I said, I'm closer to Atlanta than I am Florida. I said, and we need to work on the seven years. You got to call this guy back. I can't do seven years. And she said, look, you have to turn yourself in in Tampa. And I went, okay, but Atlanta's closer. Like I would hate to be on my way back to Tampa and get pulled over and get arrested. And she said, no. She said, you, you can't go to Atlanta. And I went, well, what, are they, what, what am I? I said, you know what? I, it dawned on me. I said, you know, I've asked you like three different times if this deal includes everything. You said it did. No, I, I said, I, I said, but you haven't, you haven't said it, it includes everything. I said, I'm asking, does this deal include Atlanta and some stuff, a few million dollars in fraud that you don't even know about yet? Does it all include all of it? I said, I keep asking you this and you haven't said yes. And she went, 
listen, we're going to catch you eventually. And I went, oh, fuck. I said, well, what does the deal include? She goes, it just includes Tampa. But I can call the other districts. I can call the, the uh, I can call the, the, call it the Atlanta U.S. attorney. And I realized they wanted seven years for the $11.5 million I'd stolen in Tampa. Didn't include the money, the half a million dollars that I'd stolen in, um, in, uh, in Atlanta. It certainly didn't include the, you know, 1.3 million I just you know defrauded uh, the banks out of in in Columbia, South Carolina. So I mean that's almost two million dollars more money. Like I've got some it's, there's some issues. Like I'm going to do way more than seven years at this point, you know. And I'd been on the run for a year and a half, and God knows how much more money they'd figured out now that they'd been investigating everybody. Like the eleven one of my scams was 11 million, but that didn't include all the money that was all the money all the fraud that we had done at the mortgage company, which ended up being about 40 or $50 million more money that I was luckily never charged with. So I was, I just, I remember thinking, this is nuts. Like they're going to give me 10 or 15 years. And I went, are you fucking serious? And she goes, look, she said, I can call the Atlanta prosecutor. I can work this out. I said, you know what, lady? I said, I wouldn't believe you if you told me water was wet. And I threw the phone out the window. So I drove all the way to Charlotte. I got to Charlotte. I I remember I dropped off the uh, dropped off the um, U-Haul and got a taxi back to the apartment. They didn't have Uber back then, so I got a taxi back to my apartment in uh, downtown Charlotte. And I remember thinking to myself, I was going to retrieve my vehicle. I had an infinity. I was going to I was going to re- retrieve the infinity and I, I remember thinking that by now they've got to know where I am. Like the FBI has to know where I am. So I end up going into the apartment building and I go up to the, I go up to the garage and I'm staring at my car, I'm like looking at all the other cars because I really felt like there was going to they were watching the car. But I kind of walked around a little bit and looked, and nobody was there. I got in the car, backed it out, and drove down the parking garage and drove right out on the street. And I was like, yes, I'm good. I'm clear. There's nobody here. So I pull up, and I park right in front of a Starbucks that was kind of catty corner to the apartment complex. It was kind of right around the corner. And I was like, I got to – things are good. Things are looking up. I've got a, I've got a parking space right in front of Starbucks. Let me get some Starbucks, and then I'm going to head out of, uh, of Charlotte. So I go in the Starbucks and I, I ring up, or I go in the Starbucks and I, I order a, a, I order a, a, a coffee and or whatever, like a latte or whatever you want to call it, a grande or venti vanilla latte or something. Anyway, so I order a cup of coffee. They ring it up and I pay. And as I'm waiting, I notice that there's two people from the apartment complex staring right at me, and they're looking at me and they're they're like chattering away. They look very nervous. And I remember this is like the fourth or the fifth of the month, and I hadn't paid my rent because I I was abandoning the apartment. So I'm not paying a thousand or two thousand dollars worth of rent someplace for a one bedroom or two bedroom, whatever it was. It was like a two bedroom. Uh, I wasn't gonna pay that uh, when I'm abandoning it. But they're freaking out. So I'm like, oh, they they recognize me, and all of a sudden the girl, the woman, bolts out the back of the Starbucks. So what I didn't know was that the U.S. Marshals were actually interviewing people at the apartment complex, and they just interviewed those two people, and then they left and came to get coffee. So the Marshals were still at the apartment complex. She runs back to the apartment complex, and and, and the Marshals are there and says, he's across the street at the Starbucks, and she tells them where the Starbucks is. And they they run out of there, and they, they start running towards the Starbucks. I get my coffee. The guy from the apartment complex gets his coffee. He follows me outside. I get in my car, and he's standing on the sidewalk staring at me. He's like holding like a bunch of a tray full of a bunch of coffees, and he's just staring at me. I remember I put my seatbelt on. Like, I don't know what's going on. I put my seatbelt on, put my coffee up. I checked the, you know, checked the, 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 remember CDs? There were CDs. So I checked the CDs. I get a CD going. I, you know, I'm checking my lights. I look down, make sure there's no cars coming. I'm about to pull out. And all of a sudden, the guy on the, on the sidewalk starts screaming. He's right here. He's right here. He's right here. He actually drops 
the cup of coffee while he's pointing. Drops the co- all the coffees. They hit the fucking ground. I look in the rearview mirror, and there's two U.S. Marshals. And they actually weren't even dressed. They were dressed in, like, suits. Like, whenever you see them in TV, on TV, like, they always have, like, a, a windbreaker or something on. These guys were actually in suits. And they're running down the street towards the back of my car. And just so happened, I just checked the street. Nobody was coming. And I, I realized, like, I don't know who they are. I thought they were FBI or Secret Service or something. I hit the gas. Boom. Take off and shoot in, shoot into, uh, down the road and into traffic, and boom, I'm gone. I didn't know who those people were until later when I ordered the Freedom of Information Act, and I actually got the U.S. Marshal report that says that they were there and that they'd almost apprehended me. And they immediately called in a bolo on my vehicle, and I like it has the vehicle tag and everything. Like they're looking for the vehicle. I ended up driving straight down the street, about two miles down the street, and there was a homeless place. I As I'm driving by the homeless place, I see these three white guys in their 30s. That's hard to come by. So I swing around. I park, jump out with my clipboard, which I had in the back of the car, and I walk over, and I immediately survey those three homeless guys, and I end up getting their information. And one of those guys' name was – God, his name was Joseph Carter – no, Joseph Marion Carter Jr., and I got his information. I got all three of their information. But as as Joseph Marion Carter Jr., I went to to I went to Nashville, Tennessee, and I got there, and I immediately went and got business. I immediately went and got a cell phone, got business cards made for as a like as a I forget what I said I was. I was like a acquisition acquisition specialist and that I worked for a company called manufactured funding group and I got an HQ account an address a cell phone I got business cards made I drove through this really nice neighborhood and I saw an old guy I remember I saw an old guy who was putting a sign in his front yard that said apartment for rent and this was a nice this is an area called um green hills in uh, nashville it's where like all the uh celebrities live just happened to be renting out an apartment uh in a duplex that was beside his house and i pulled in in my car and i got out and i said hey i'm i'm interested in uh possibly renting the duplex or the 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 apartment two bedroom two and a half bath little townhouse side by side town like a townhouse style duplex there was two units Walked in, looked at it, came back, and I said, hey, looks great, and uh, I'll definitely, I'll take it. And I said, "Uh, do you need to pull my credit, or what do you need to do? And he looked at me, he looked me up and down, he looked at my vehicle, and he said, nah, I'll take first month and last month deposit. He goes, you look like a nice young man. You look trustworthy. And I said, okay. And I remember thinking, I'm going to like Nashville. They're very trusting here. So I just rented a duplex from the old man in Green Hills, and I was still driving. I was still driving my Infinity. That's right. So I I remember I ordered Marion Carter. I remember Carter's. I got Carter's birth certificate, and I got his. Um, I went and got. I went and got a new social security number in his name and I ordered some secured credit cards, but I didn't have a driver's license. So, but, but I did, I registered to vote in his name and I had a lease in his name. So I have a lease. I've got a lease. I've got his birth certificate. I have a social security card. I've registered to vote in his name. I have his transcripts for his driving record. And I took all of that and I went to the local DMV and I got a driver's license. I remember I had to take the driving test. I had to take the driving test in the Infinity. Did I say Lexus? It was Infinity. It was an Infinity. So in the Infinity that was the that the police were currently looking for. I even took the driving test and I almost failed the driving test. I remember I was clicking through because, you know, every I've taken driving tests in a bunch of different states, but every every state's different 
and they asked several questions on for like uh, driving while intoxicated. And I remember I missed several questions. I also missed the question where it shows a picture of a sign and it has people walking. And I thought, oh, that's pedestrian. It's a pedestrian zone. But it wasn't because of some, one of the guys had a briefcase and it was a business zone. Missed that. So I missed like three or four questions. I was like, oh, my God, I almost failed. I remember when I went up to get my license, I go, I, I told the woman, I said, I almost failed. And she goes, I know. She goes, you were one, point, one question away. So I got my driver's license. I then jumped into the Infinity, and I drove the Infinity all the way back to— th- Now, keep in mind, the police are looking for the Infinity now. There's a bolo out for the Infinity. I drove all the way back to Nashville and I left it in long-term parking because I didn't want it to be found in Nashville. All the way back to Charlotte, North Carolina. I didn't want it to be found in Nashville. I wanted the car to be found in Charlotte in long-term parking. So I, I parked it. I then waited a little bit and I, I bought a ticket and flew back to Nashville. Uh, and then I went to, I don't, I think it was, it was like CarMax or nations or something they they have these diff- they had, they had, it was like carmax anyway i went to this dealership and i walked in keep in mind this guy i i've got three secured credit cards in his name i've ordered them but i i hadn't even gotten the cards yet like we're talking about within days i just ordered the cards so he's got a credit profile but there's no credit at all but it's not bad credit i went to like whatever it was like nations cars or car car max or something i walk in there and i said listen man i need to get an suv and i need some kind of first time buyers program they go well we have one you have to put down 20 percent, and you cannot buy a vehicle for more than twenty thousand dollars i said let's go find one so we went and found one and it was a nissan pathfinder or something so i got like a twenty thousand dollar nissan pathfinder i put down four thousand dollars i gave him a w i gave him a w2 and a pay stub They called to verify my employment. I answered the cell phone, verified my own employment, and they gave me a, uh, I got the car right then. So I drove the car home. So I drove the car home. I'm now, I've now got a new vehicle. I've got an apartment. I've got a driver's license. I applied for a passport. I got my passport. I've got, but I'm, I'm burning through the money quick. I remember I got some furniture. And I realize, of course, you know, at this rate, um, I'm burn- already burning through money. I don't have a job, so I don't have a lot to do. I don't know anybody in Nashville. Uh, I'm working out, you know, once or twice a day. I'm, you know, I, I don't have much. To, I, I don't have anything to do. I'm you know, going to Starbucks. I go work out. I walk around the mall. I come back. I, I mean, there's just nothing to do, right? So I start driving around and looking at real estate. Because I figure I'm going to run another scam. I'm going to get a few million dollars and just, I was just going to leave. Like, I was just going to leave the United States and just, at this point, things are bad. Like, if you punched in Matthew Cox into into Google, everything that came up was, you know, fraud, fraud, fraud. And, And by this point, there were several articles about me having been caught in South Carolina by the police and that they they let me go. That wasn't good. There was more and more articles about that. It was becoming more and more sensational. The Chicago Tribune started running a series called The Fugitive. Uh, It it was just not good. It's not a good situation. So I I, I ended up dating, though. I was bored, so I ended up going on a couple of dating websites, and I started dating a bunch of different women. I dated a chick named uh, Brittany Sutherland. I dated a bunch of different girls. Like I go over it in the book. I think I I have like a whole chapter on just the insane women I started dating. This went on for like four or five months. Well, while that was happening, I also went and I started, I found an area of Nashville that I liked where the houses were going for, I mean, they were just dirt cheap. They're going for they're going for forty thousand. If they were renovated, if a house was renovated, you could get it for sixty-five or seventy thousand dollars. It was just that. That was how bad this area was. So I go in the area. I end up talking one owner into owner financing me the property. Her house was so bad it was going for like 
she won like 19 grand or 15 grand, 15, 16 grand, 19 grand. I forget. It was cheap. I have the, the exact numbers in, in my book. But I ended up getting her to own her fine. I gave her like four or five, like three or $4,000 down and have her finance like something like 10 or $15,000. So then I find another guy who buys and sells houses. He flips houses. I buy, convince him to own or finance three houses. You have to understand, I convinced them to own or finance the house by saying, look, I'll give you 5% down or 10% down or 20% down. But I tell them, like, I don't want to buy your house. Like this one guy, his houses were renovated. They were all selling for about $65,000. One was going for $75,000. So I think it was like two were $65,000, one was $75,000, regardless. I say, look, I'll, I need you to own or finance the, the houses. For him, I said, I need to close on all three houses on one, on one HUD statement. That way, all of the houses end up getting recorded for like $210,000 or something outrageous. Was that the one I did that with? No, that was another transaction. Anyway, for him, I, I, for the woman that I got to do it, I told her I wanted to record the sale of the home at like $150,000, even though I was buying it for like twenty. dollars So for, let's say, $150,000, and I wanted to, um, I wanted a construction credit on the house for like 130 thousand, and I would pay the doc stamps. So it gets recorded for 150 thousand dollars. I paid the extra doc stamp. So in sa the sale ends up showing up in public records as being a sale for 150 thousand dollars. And I think it was like 152 or 154. It was roughly around there. The other three properties, I get this guy. I end up. I didn't do them all in one closing statement. I had each one I added like a hundred and some odd thousand dollars to each sale, so one got one was came in at like a hundred and ninety thousand. One came in at like one hundred and seventy five, and the other ones came in at like one seventy five. Well, I did all of these houses were within about three or four blocks of each other. So what obviously, if you've been watching, what that ended up doing was I could now use that one property, you know, each house. I could use the other houses as comparable sales. I immediately refinance those houses and pull out like a hundred thousand on this house, hundred and twenty on this one, ninety thousand on this house. So I, I refinance those houses. Now I'm flush with cash again. I have like thirty I mean, I'm sorry, thirty. I have like three hundred, three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So now I'm 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 doing okay. So I start buying more houses in the area because, you know, I don't have anything else to do and it's just what I do. So I, and I need to get a few million. So I need to buy 20 or 30 properties. I figure I can refinance all those properties in multiple names. At this point, I'm starting to build additional credit profiles for additional synthetic identities. But I'm also dating. I end up meeting this girl named Amanda Gardner. So I, I meet Amanda, and Amanda and I start dating. And she she thinks I'm like this just super successful real estate guy. So... I ended up buying a house in that same neighborhood where I was buying all the other houses. I buy this one this one house and I renovate it. I renovate it. It's super nice. I've got hardwood floors. It's really, really nice. And but I'm, I'm buying other houses too. I'm continuing to drive the value of this area up through the roof while I'm building other identities. I end up meeting Amanda. Amanda and I hit it off right away. I mean, what's not to hit out? What's not to like? I mean, she's she sees me. I've I'm a decent looking guy. I've got a ton of money. She had just gotten out of the military. She had a son named Cameron. Uh, he was a cute little kid. Um, he you know he liked me. Amanda loved me. She moved in with me right away. I mean, right away within weeks or months, she was living in my house. And keep in mind too, she's she's broke, so I, I look like a savior to her. And I'm buying her whatever she wants. Uh, I got her and bought her a new car. She's got new clothes. Granted, we live in a shit in a shithole area, but we also I I also own at this point eight to ten houses in the area. I'm buying vacant lots. Within six months, I'm I'm building brand new houses. And and she she quit her job. She's helping me now. So I I remember. One of the houses, like the, really to be honest, this is funny. The, one of the first houses I refinanced, one of the first houses I, I, I refinanced. So going back a little bit, I, I remember I had bought these houses 
just the first four houses I bought before I refinanced anything. Bought the houses, recorded the value high. And what was so funny about that was um, I ended up um, I ended up putting these signs on the houses. I put these I made these banners that said Nashville Restoration Project. So I made these banners and I stuck them on every one of the houses. I renovated the houses so they looked really good on the outside. Like they didn't look great inside. They look like crap. But I put these banners and the banners said, you know, Nashville Restoration Project, Nashville Restoration Project over and over again. And then along the side of it, it would have like Nashville Restoration Project.com. And then I designed a website. I got a ton of before and after photos from properties. I took pictures of the entire neighborhood. I really dressed up the website. I mean, it looked great. I even used the same exact color scheme as as uh, the city's future comp plan. So every city has a future comprehensive plan for what they want their city to look like in the future. And typically they work in conjunction with different developers. So I basically said I was one of those developers. The other thing I said on the website was that this area in Nashville was called J.C. Napier. That was the na- subdivision. That was the name of the area. And it was right next to the J.C. Napier projects. So the problem with that is that um, there, was the, there was obviously this is right next to the project. So you can imagine the kind of area this is. So on my website, I specifically said that the projects were scheduled to come down within the next two years. They were currently vacating the the projects so if you went if you looked up nashville restoration project or you went to the website you got all this information that said this entire area was being was going through gentrification or being revitalized the city was dumping a ton of money into it developers were coming in there it was work we were working in conjunction with the with the future comp plan with the city and that the projects were coming down within the next year or two 18 months to two years. So, uh, and and there's a ton of photos of all these houses being renovated. Anyway, uh, what I ended up doing was I refinanced one of the houses and I can't, and when the appraiser comes out, I go to meet him at one of the houses. So I go out there and I said, so, uh, you know, we, we, he measures the whole house. I said, well, what do you think? And he looks at the house and he was a grumpy old guy and he kind of looked at the house and he goes, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's not too bad. And I said, what do you think it's going to come in? What do you think it's worth? He goes, what did you pay for it? And I said, I paid like a hundred and I think I paid like $180,000 for it. And he looked at the house and he goes, you know, a year ago, I would have said this thing was worth 50 or 60,000. I went, really? He said, yeah, but you know, since the, he has, since the, uh, the Nashville restoration project has come in this area. He is, this whole area is going up through the roof. There's comparable sales popping up all over the place. There's, um, he is, there's, he is, there's comparable sales popping up all over the place. Uh, it's, he said the whole, he said the, the, the whole area is going up through the roof. He goes, I, I'd say this, this thing's worth at least 180, 185,000, whatever he ended up saying. And I just remember thinking, fuck, that's awesome. It was great because he bought it. He'd, He'd obviously, go, and I knew he went to the website because he told me, he goes, you know, the projects are coming down. And I was like, really? And he goes, yeah. He said, the projects are coming down. And then I remember, I'll never forget, he said this. He said, you know, I said, Jace, I said, Nashville Restoration Project. I said, really? I said, and what is that anyway? And he goes, yeah, it's, it's one of these big developers. They work with the city. They come in, they revitalize an entire area. He said, you know, they did the same thing in Germantown about 10 years ago. I go, really? He's, oh, yeah, Nashville Restoration Project went in there. They revitalized the entire area. You can't buy anything in Germantown now that's not worth less of a million dollars. He goes, you hold on to this place. You're going to easily double your money in the next year or two. I was like, wow, thanks. Like, he totally added that whole thing. Like, that wasn't anything I said. I didn't know about Germantown. I didn't know anything even about the area. He threw that in there. So... That house, that's one of the first houses I refinanced, which I always thought was hilarious because what I did was I went into that area, bought up all those houses, and put signs on every single house that said Nashville Restoration Project. And then, of course, I kept recording the value of these houses higher and higher. So within a couple of – within a year, 
These things are everywhere. There's 20 properties that are worth over $200,000. I can refinance these things anytime and get two or $3 million easily. So I'm dating Amanda. Everything's going good. Um, I've built up several synthetic identities and we'd been dating about a year and the relationship was going great. Uh, we start seeing, so this is what's comical. One of the chicks that I had gone on a date with was a chick named uh, Trina. I went on a date with Trina and we went out one time and I just wasn't interested. She had, like, typically I like a southern accent, but she had this really, really bad, almost like a Kentucky southern accent, which is way different than a Florida or Georgia southern accent, which to me I find sexy. Trina's was not sexy. And so we went out. We went to, uh, I remember we went to go see the movie The Dukes of Hazards, which she wanted to go see. So we went to go see it, and afterwards, like, I didn't even try and kiss her or anything. I just wanted to get out of there. I wasn't interested. I got my car and left. Well, Amanda and I were dating, and at one point, Amanda says to me, "You know, you know, at, you know how it is. You you're sleeping with a chick, and you've been sleeping with her for a while, and uh, six months or something." And and she, Amanda, ended up saying, "Have you ever thought about being with another woman? You know, me and another woman?" And I was like, "Yeah, I I mean, I guess I I would be willing to do that. You know, out of love for you." Um, so she says, "Well, I would be interested." And so Amanda, you know, Amanda starts looking. Amanda starts looking on the website, um, shit, it's called uh, Match.com. She starts looking for other women. So she comes across Tr uh, Trina. And I remember looking at Trina's profile and being like, holy shit, I went out with that girl. And she says, no, you didn't. I said, I swear to God, I went out with her. I said, flip through her pictures. There's a picture of her leaning against a Corvette and another one where she's running a marathon. Sure enough, that was her. And I was like, I went out with her. She goes, what happened? I told her, ah, I kind of blew her off. She sent me a couple of emails at, or a couple of text messages afterward, and I just never responded. So Amanda hits her up, asks her if she wants to meet. They go to a lesbian bar because it turns out that Trina was, was gay. They go to a lesbian bar. Amanda and her end up making out in, a car, in the car. She mentions me asks if she would be interested in all of us getting together. Trina says yes. We all end up going to dinner. Trina comes back home. You can imagine what happens. So what ends up happening is we all we all start to hang out together, right? Like we're going to festivals. We're going to movies. Trina's coming over every once in a while. Like things are good. Life is good. Uh, I've got tons of money. We're building new houses. We're reno renovating houses. And... Everything is going good. Well, then one day, Amanda ends up going online. Well, I'm, okay, that's not how it happened. So here's what happened is at one point, Amanda ends up finding... I had a corporate lawyer that had incorporated all of these several uh, corporations because obviously I can't just dump all this money in my account. You have to kind of launder it through different accounts. So, and, I, and those accounts actually were in Amanda's name. So what ends up happening is I, the corporate lawyer contacted me one day and asked me to send her something. I sent it to her, never heard, or, you know, she never got it for some reason. So she called back and she called Amanda and said, hey, I never got this document. So I told Amanda, go on my computer and look in Word, here's the name of the document. Well, when Amanda did that, she ended up seeing a, finding a letter that I, the letter that I had written to my parents the day I left Tampa. Two years earlier, two and a half years earlier, she finds that letter. She reads the letter. She looks up who Matt Cox is. She sees a ton of, ton of articles. She spends the whole day reading articles. By the time I get home that night, I walk in. I'm like, hey, what's going on? And she's like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine. She says nothing. I end up going on my computer. And when I go to, do, to close out all of the programs, I see that Word is open. When I go to click on Word to close it, I see the last thing that had been open was the letter to my parents. And obviously I hadn't opened it in a year and a half, two, in like two years. So 
I was, I realized, holy shit, she read it. So then I go and I look at my history and boom, there's nothing but all these articles on Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox, Matt Cox, wanted, wanted, wanted. So I, I go in and I said, Jesus, God almighty. I said, did you, what did you do? And she was like, and she, she immediately realizes that I know she breaks down. She starts crying. She says, I'm sorry. I had no idea. I, I didn't mean to. I said, well, I have to leave. So I can't stay here if you know who I am. If anybody knows who I am, like it's dangerous for me. She begs and pleads and cries and says, please don't leave. Please don't leave. I'll never, I'll never tell anybody. I'll never tell anybody. And the truth is I was like totally in love with this chick. I thought she was amazing. She was great. So I stayed. So she knows my name, true name is Matt Cox, not Carter, not Joseph Carter, which is bad for me. Um, we end up seeing Trina. Everything's going good. One day, Amanda goes online. She was checking on Google. Just randomly, she would check my name. So she checks my name, and she sees something on Dateline. Turns out that Dateline was, was about to do an article on me. I'm sorry, an article. Dateline was about to do a news program on me. At this point, I've already been in Bloomberg Magazine has already done two articles. One about just about me, and two. the second article was when they caught Becky, because they had caught Becky at this point. Then I had been in Fortune Magazine had done an article on me, like a 6,000-word article. Horrible. Uh, then... So, so then she went online and she found this article about, not to mention all the St. Pete Times articles, all the Chicago Tribune, all the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. There was just one article after another. So she finds this thing about Dateline, and there's a blog about Dateline, how they're interviewing people that, have, that knew me or that know me. And they're going to do a, a one-hour episode on me. So I now know I'm going to be on Dateline. That's not good. Like... Local newspapers aren't a big deal. Even a national magazine or two, like the kind of people that I hang... First of all, I don't have a big circle of friends. The kind of people that know me or that I associate with aren't reading Fortune magazine. These are con contractors. Like, I'm not concerned about them stumbling across my photo in Fortune or Bloomberg. But this is Dateline. It's a tabloid. And your average blue-collar worker watches Dateline. Dateline, I don't even know if it's still out, but so I realize I'm going to be in, in living rooms everywhere and somebody's going to recognize me. I'm somebody working at Starbucks or working at Home Depot is going to say, holy shit, that guy comes in here all the time. They're going to catch me like it's a problem. So Amanda tells me about it and I go, Jesus, oh my God, this is, this is really bad. I can't stay in the United States anymore. So she and I, decide we've got a month or two about two months couple months before it comes out we decide we're going to refinance all the houses pull out a few million dollars and leave the united states and at this point we started researching where to go we figure we're going to go to uh to australia and it, the nice thing about australia was australia would allow you to go to australia if you had a Okay, you, if you showed up in, in Australia with like $200,000 and a business plan to open a business in Australia, you could go there and you could be a permanent resident alien. They would give you a driver's license. They'd allow you to buy property. They would allow you to stay in their country and open a business. You could not go to Australia and get a job, but you could go there and open a, a business and hire Aussies. So I can't go there and become a citizen because if you were to go and become a citizen, they wanted you to do a background check. But I could go there and become a, with U.S. documents, if I showed up with my U.S. passport, I could become a permanent resident alien. And keep in mind, I'm, I'm living as a homeless person. I can easily become a permanent resident alien in Australia and he'll never be notified. And then if he dies someday, they're not going to turn around and notify Australia that I died. So we decide we're going to Australia. Amanda's researched the whole thing. I start refinancing properties. I start pulling out cash. 
As we're pulling out cash, we start asking people like my general contractor, his name was Tracy. I ask him, hey, can, would you do me a favor and could you cash some checks for me? And I, he's like, yeah, sure. So I have him cash a check for like 8,000, then another check for 6,000, another check for 9,000. Then I have another guy that we worked with cash a check for 4,000, 3,000, 9,000. And then I have, so Amanda ends up giving Trina a check uh, of several checks and asks her to asks her to to cash those checks i remember amanda and i had gone we had a couple of friends uh, one was Brittany, another chick that i had dated and her new boyfriend which they just gotten married his name uh his name was brian so brian and Brittany, we went with them on their honeymoon to to venice to italy we went there for like 10 days. We did a 10-day trip. So we were gone for two, three weeks. We left and we went to Croatia. We went to Greece. Like we hung out. We went on this cruise, European cruise. And I remember we'd come back. And as soon as we came back, we hadn't been home more than a few weeks when we started asking everybody to cash checks to start pulling out money. So we're pulling out money. And we had pulled out a few hundred thousand dollars. One day I'm at home and suddenly I hear this BAM! Somebody had kicked in the front door. And it was like, oh my God. And I had I had cameras all over my house. I had cameras in the living room, dining room, outside the house. But I would go to walk out to see what happened because I remember it was so loud. I remember thinking maybe the TV had fallen. Like the flat, we had a big flat screen TV, and I thought maybe Cameron had pulled the, knocked the TV over some. I don't know. But as soon as I walked, started walking out of the the bedroom, this fucking guy, these two black guys, had kicked in the front door, comes running in, and he sticks a gun in my face, and he goes, "Get on the ground, get on the ground." So I go, "Oh Jesus!" So I get on the ground. They lead Amanda in the room. She gets on the ground. Cameron gets on the ground. They throw a blanket over us. They rob the whole house. They grab some, I, I, I mean, literally, I'm like, bro, what do you want? You know, they're, they're, they're like, shut up, shut up. I'm like, what do you want? And they said, you know, where's the money? Where's the money? I said, bro, there's money here. Like I told them where there's some money here. There's some money here. We had some money in the refrigerator or in the freezer. I didn't say that. I told them to get the money out of that. They, we had a, a, a gun safe, which was Amanda's gun. And they grabbed the gun safe. They grabbed our Rolexes. They grabbed a couple of, uh, Cartier watches and stuff and some jewelry. And then they grabbed, oh, they grabbed the keys to, I think, Amanda's truck. And they jumped in her truck and took off. No, did they take my truck? I don't know. They stole one of our vehicles. So we immediately sit up. And uh, as soon as they're gone, we call the police. Police show up. And the guy, the cop's like, I'm like, hey, I got a video of it. But they had ski masks on. Um, so the cop comes and he's, I remember he told me, look, you need to find another place to live. You, you can't, you, you, you guys can't stay here. Like you can't stay in this neighborhood. You know, I said, I, I told him I own like 20 houses in the neighborhood. I own another five or six lots. We build new houses. He's, I don't care. He goes, what these guys didn't steal this time, they'll just come back and steal. So I said, okay. So we ended up going to a hotel. Well, I didn't, they had taken my, my wallet. So I didn't have my driver's license or my, they took my, a bunch of stuff. I didn't have anything in my name. So they took all my stuff. All I had was a passport in the name Walter Holcomb. So they took my Joseph Carter stuff. So I got a passport as Walter Holcomb and a driver's license in Walter Holcomb's name. So when we go and we check into a hotel, we were there maybe a day or two. We didn't go back to the house. We were, gonna, we were just going to buy a new house and stay in the hotel. It was a really nice hotel. So we stay in the hotel. And while that's happening, Trina is calling because they took our cell phones. So we get our new cell phones back. And I remember Trina, as soon as I got it back and mine was back on, like we got a phone call. I, I got a phone call from Trina. And she was like, oh, my God, what have you, where have you guys been? What are you doing? What's going on? Where's Amanda? What's happening? I said, Trina, calm down. I said, look, we had a home invasion, and we're staying in a hotel. And, and I said, uh, she goes, what hotel? And I went, 
I remember thinking, what? Like, she didn't say, like, are you okay? How's it? Oh, my God, that's horrible. She goes, what hotel are you at? And I was like, I'm, I'm at the whatever hotel it was. I just told her the name of the hotel. I forget, like, the, fuck, I don't remember what it was, the, the Westing or something. So I tell her, yeah, it was this hotel. And she goes, okay, well, tell Amanda to call me because Amanda was in the shower. I go, okay, no problem. So I hang up the phone. Uh, what had happened was a couple days earlier, Trina had called the Secret Service and turned us in. And the Secret Service had gone to my old ha- my house where we weren't staying and had staked out the house for the like the day at, the day we left that night, the next day they showed up and started staking out the house. So they've been staking it out for two days and we weren't there. So she was calling to try and find out where we were. So she called the Secret Service back. She said, this is where they are. They sent Secret Service sent a team sent themselves and the marshals went to the hotel where we were and they asked, is Joseph Carter staying here? And they said, no, because I wasn't. I was staying there as Walter Holcomb. So then Trina calls back and says, I called the hotel. You're not there. You're not there. And I was like, it was weird. I was like, what? And at that point I wasn't at the hotel. I, I was at the, at our office. We had rented like a, a 10,000 square foot warehouse and I said, look, I'm not there. I'm, she goes, are you there now? I said, no, I'm at the warehouse. Amanda was dropping off her son. And she goes, well, okay, so you're there now. Is Amanda with you? And I went, no, Amanda's dropping off Cameron. And she goes, okay, uh, I got to go. And she hangs up the phone. Like a couple minutes later, Amanda calls me. And I go, hey, what's up? She goes, Trina just called me. She goes, and I go, okay, well, what's going on? She goes, I don't know, Matt, I'm worried. I said, uh, not Matt. She said, uh, uh, Carter. She goes, I don't know, Carter. I'm worried. And I said, why? And she goes, I'm worried because she is, it, she, she said some stuff. Like she told me how much she loves me and cares about me. And she goes, it was just weird. And I go, she goes, I'm, I'm concerned. I go, what are you concerned about? I go, if she doesn't know anything, what are you worried about? And she goes, oh God, Matt, I'm so sorry. And by this point, I'm, I'm concerned. Because by this point, I got a phone call from the local police, and the local police asked me if I could meet them, if I could meet them at the house. So I'm, dri- I'm now driving to the house because they wanted me to meet them at the house because they said they wanted the video of the home invasion. So I'm driving to the house. And when Amanda called, and, she's, and I'm getting in the car, I'm driving, and I'm like, yeah, well, what are you worried about? And she goes, oh, my God, man, I'm so sorry. I'm worried. I'm worried. I go, what, what are you worried about? So at that point, I had just pulled up to the house because our, our place was only a couple blocks away, our office. So I pull up to the house, and I'm like, well, if you're not worried, I mean, if, if you're worried, you must be worried about something. What are you worried about? If she doesn't know anything, there's no reason to be worried. And she's like, I, I, you know, she didn't want to tell me what had happened. But she goes, I think I might have fucked up. And I go, how did you fuck up? What are you, what are you trying to say? Like, what are you going on? And by this point, I'm getting out of my car walking to the front to my house and a black SUV pulls up, another SUV pulls up, another car pulls up, another one pulls up and they all lock up their brakes and I'm standing there in the middle of the street holding my cell phone when the Secret Service jumps out of their vehicles screaming, get on the ground, get on the ground, get on the ground and obviously at that point I realized what the issue is. Amanda... I I later found out Amanda had told Trina who I was and Trina had called the Secret Service and turned me in. And when Trina called Amanda, she was basically just making sure that she wasn't with me, that she wanted her to know how much she loved her and cared about her and was trying to kind of distance herself from the situation. And I, uh, I end up getting arrested. So the Secret Service runs up to me, and I remember, you know, I remember at first I thought I was getting robbed again until I saw the Secret. They have these white, they're, they're all in black. But they have these white things that say Secret Service on them. So there was Secret Service was there. And uh, they throw me on the ground. They're like, get on the ground, get on the ground. And I was just like numbed. I get on the ground, they handcuffed me, pulled me off, pulled me up, dust me off. And I remember they're holding me, and I'm just standing there. They're like, Matt Cox, are you Matt Cox? Mr. Cox. And I'm just staring at him, and I'm not saying anything. And the guy looks at, he has a clipboard with my wanted poster on it, 
and he holds it up and he's looking and another officer comes up and I remember he looked at me and he goes, is that him? Is it him? He goes, no, I don't think it is. Oh shit, I don't think it's him, bro. And he looks at me and he goes, no, it's him, it's him. He goes, look at his eyes, it's him. And he looks at me and he goes, hey, Mr. Cox, he goes, we've been looking for you. And, I, and he goes, you are Mr. Cox, you are Matthew Cox, right? And I went, yeah, yeah, I'm Matt Cox. I mean, at that point, I, you know, I'm done, right? That officer told me, that agent told me when they had arrested, when they arrested Becky, Rebecca Halk, when they arrested her in Houston six months earlier, they said she didn't admit who she was until they put her hand on the scanner. They said she complained the whole 30-minute drive back to – they arrested her, by the way. They arrested her at school. They arrested her, and they brought her all the way back to the Secret Service's office. And she, the whole time she was there being driven there, she goes, you guys fucked up. You're going to lose your job. I'm going to sue. You've embarrassed me. She said, they said, he goes, she didn't break until we put her hand on the scanner. And she goes, okay, I'm, I'm Rebecca Halk. So I broke immediately. Yeah, you got me. Yes, I know I'm done. So they bring me back. They handcuff me to a table. I wait. They fly the Secret Service agent from Atlanta in. She flies in. I'm there for hours. And uh, they come in and they read me, you know, they, of course they read you your rights, they tell you what you're charged with, and they say, we're going to bring you back to uh, Atlanta. And uh, they brought me back to Atlanta, and I went all the way back to Atlanta, and that was an ordeal. And what's funny is when they called Amanda, this was weird, like Amanda, when she found out that they had caught me, she immediately drove to the bank, went to our safety deposit box. First of all, there was cash in the box. So she doesn't pull out. She pulls out the cash, but she pulls out the passports. She keeps all the cash in the ice box, and she keeps the cash in the, in the um, safety deposit box. She grabs all the fake passports that I had and driver's licenses, and she brings those to the Secret Service's office, and she gives them to them immediately and says, I just found these. I don't know anything. I was completely duped and don't have a clue about what who this person is. I thought his name was Joseph Carter. And she gives them all my driver's licenses and IDs and everything. She later tells them that she did know who I was, but she didn't think it was a big deal. Like she, like she waits till she gets a lawyer. When she gets a lawyer, she goes in and she cooperates and she tells him who I was and what I was doing, but she had nothing to do with it. She didn't really know what was going on and it was all me and, you know, which is fine because it was pretty much all me. Um, anyway, yeah, I go back to, uh, I go back to Atlanta and I get a lawyer and I fly on Con Air, which is nothing like Con Air in the movie. And uh, it takes about a month, month and a half to get me all the way back to Atlanta because they bring you from one prison. They bring you one county jail where or U.S. Marshals holdover where they hold you for two weeks and they hold you here for a week. Then they hold you here for two weeks and they hold you here for five days. And then, so you keep getting bussed from one place to another till you're eventually flown back to Atlanta. And I was flown back to Atlanta and I was held in the, uh, I was held in uh, Atlanta in two different jails. And uh, I get my attorney, and I remember when I got my attorney, she told me I was looking at a, a bunch of time. She didn't really know how much time, but she said, you're looking at like 15, 20 years. She didn't really know. She said that I was responsible for like 25 or $26 million in loss. The Secret Service was saying something like $40 million, 40 or $50 million in, in uh, fraud at my mortgage company. And the numbers were all over the place. And, uh, yeah, so I end up taking a, a plea. I end up pleading to 26 years, and I end up getting sentenced to 26 years in prison, and yeah, that uh, I get a, a PSI for 26. Uh, well, actually, my, my pre-sentence report said I was 34 years 
or 30, yeah, 30, 32 years, 32 years of life is what my pre-sentence report said when it eventually came out. I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. Uh, I mean, I was trying to help myself. I cooperated fully, told them everything I could think of. That By this point, they'd already indicted me in, in Atlanta, in Tampa, and in, uh, in Nashville. I'm there. My lawyer and I have been talking. Uh, I've got a pre-sentence report that says I've got. I'm getting 26 years. The government has. I've. All, I'm being. Inter, I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the U.S. Secret Service and U.S. Marshals. What am I saying? I was interviewed by the Secret Service and the FBI. When I was interviewed by the Secret Service, that was actually comical because when I was interviewed by the Secret Service. When I first sat down, my lawyer and I sat down with the Secret Service, there were two agents there. One was Agent, agent Peacock, who's a female agent, Andrea Peacock. And the other guy was Dan Brunzowski, I think his name was. Dan Brunzowski? Brunzowski? I don't know. It's, it's in my book. It's long. It's a long one. I remember they sat down, and we hadn't been there maybe five or ten minutes when we finally they had their stuff all arranged, and they started qu questioning me. And one of the first things that Dan said was, listen, he said, I, I, we, first thing we need to go over is we need to know where all the money is. And I said, you've got all the money. What are you talking about? And he said, no, no, we know you've hidden money. And I went, hidden money? what are you talking about? Like, I haven't hidden any money. And he said, you know, we know for a fact that you have money hidden in an account. Now you're about to get an obstruction of justice charge unless you come clean with us right now. So I remember my lawyer was like, her name is Millie. Millie, she leaned and she goes, do we need to talk about this? I said, no. I said, I've gave them all the money. I gave them money in, you know, there was money in, in, God, in a bunch of different bank accounts that I had already given them. And I said, what are you talking about? And he pulled out several bank statements and put them in front of me. Boom. And he said, you have, I think it was 200000 roughly two hundred. You have $200,000 in Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And I looked down and he had these, these bank statements. And the funny thing about the bank statements is... Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville was one of the banks that I had created. So this is a bank and bank statements that don't even, even exist. It's, it's, it's complete forgery. He goes, we know you've got $200,000 in that bank in the name of Walter Holcomb. And I looked at him and I went, did you call the bank? And he said, yeah, I called the bank. He goes, I've, I've left several messages. He goes, we've already subpoenaed the records. And I go, did you go to the website? And he went, yeah, I went to the website. And I go, what'd you think? He goes, what do you mean? I go, what'd you think of the website? And he goes, it's a bank website. I go, yeah, but it was, it's professional. Like, I mean, it's, you know, convincing. And he looked at me and he goes, oh, Jesus Christ. He goes, I, are you serious? He goes, I, and, and so at that point, the U.S. attorney and the other agents, my lawyer, they go, what are you talking about? And he looked at me and he goes, he goes, it's bullshit. It's all bullshit. I go, it's all an illusion. I said, the bank doesn't exist. And he said, he goes, I can't believe, it. are you serious? I go, who did you call? He goes, I, I, I said, did any, nobody answer? He goes, no, I left messages. And I was like, I haven't paid the voicemail in months. Like I'd been arrested. By this point, I'd been arrested for several months. So I was like, who, how did you even leave a voicemail? And he's like, I, I left several. And I, who did you subpoena? He goes, I looked it up. It's a real bank. Now it was there was a Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. I actually had opened an account there at one time in one of my fake identities' names. So I had a check that had the routing number for Southern Exchange Bank. And I had used that on all the fake checks that I'd made. And I'd used that on everything. So that was the number he looked up. And he saw that there really was a Southern Exchange Bank. But it wasn't Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville. And so my... The website I had created was southernexchangebankofclarksville.com. So he thought that Southern Exchange Bank and Southern Exchange Bank of Clarksville were the same thing, and he thought it was a real bank, and he actually subpoenaed Southern Exchange Bank's main office, which didn't even exist anymore because the bank had been sold to 
Sun Trust Bank or something. So, you know, he was waiting for these bank statements. So I just looked at him. And I just was like, bro, what, what's going on? And I remember he go, he said, oh, I can't believe that. And I looked at him and I remember I said, bro, you're the secret service. And I was like, I can't believe you believe this. I mean, and that was the first time I was actually embarrassed that they'd caught me. So at that point, we ended up talking. He was like, hey, who was involved? Who helped you here? Who helped you there? At, with the Secret Service, I, I wasn't able to really tell them anything, to be honest. There was very little I could tell them because they didn't enter the picture until I was on the run. So once I was on the run, it was really just me and Rebecca Houck, and she'd already told them everything. Now, there were people in Nashville that knew what I was doing, a little here, a little there, but not a ton. And, you know, I, and I did say, look, this person and this person and this person, but they had been interviewing these people, and most of these people had either already cooperated or, or they'd said they didn't know anything, and that wasn't true. But nobody in, in Nashville, I think, ended up getting indicted. So that actually was Secret Service. That went on for several days. I was interviewed with them by them for several days. So then weeks later, I was interviewed by the FBI. And that's when I met Aunt, uh, Agent Candace Calderon with the FBI. And she was the woman that I called when I was driving back from um, Texas. She was the one that I talked to on the phone. She despised me. And so she came in, and I'll never forget when I, I had the handcuffs on, right? I'd been shackled and chained and walked up to the, to the um, U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was in a, uh, in a room where they, you know, debrief you. And I remember she un, they, un, they took the chains off me, and I was rubbing my wrists, and, I, and she goes, your wrists hurt? And I was like, yeah. And she goes, get used to it. I mean, it's like she was constantly making these little snide comments. And uh, so I interviewed her, and I remember one of the first things they wanted to know was that I had actually, when I was in Tampa, I'd actually bribed a politician named uh, Michael White. And I'd also used the name, well, this guy's name was Kevin White. I'd used the name Michael Kevin White. Because I'd seen this guy, I'd met this guy, and I'd seen his uh, signs all over the place. And so I thought it was funny because I was using all these color-coded names like red, blue, silver. And I saw white, I saw Kevin White, so I used the name Michael Kevin White. And then I ended up meeting that guy. And I ended up bribing that guy and got him elected to city council. Now, I got him elected to city council. That's a long story in and of itself, but... The point is, is I got him elected and he was going to rezone all of my vacant lots in Ybor City. But I took off on the run before any of that could happen. So they immediately were like, look, we've got tons of checks from you and these color-coded names and their accounts going to his campaign contribution. And they had already talked to one of my business partners, which was a guy named David Walker. And Dave Walker had told the FBI that I had bribed this guy and helped get him elected to city council. Well, to, to the county commission. No, not county commission. City council. City council. To city council. So, um, so they asked me about that. And I was like, yeah, I mean, they've got the checks. Yeah, this is what happened. I bribed the guy. I mean, I got him elected and explained all that. And she was like, did he know this? Did he know that? Yeah, he knew all that. So we talked about that. We talked about uh, the various people that were involved in the scam. Most of those people had already been indicted. Uh, my actual conspir my actual indictment in Tampa has a bunch of names with initials. So it's like my name and then a, it's a bunch of initials. They're unnamed co-conspirators because these are people that were cooperating. And so they indict indicted me, but they don't want to show that to anybody. So they use them. So technically they'd been indicted. Um, but all these people were also cooperating against me. So, you know, they already knew a ton of stuff. I explained exactly what happened, told them everything that happened. And that interview went on for like three days, two or three days, or maybe four days. Like, I think I was interviewed by the FBI for like three or four days. So then I go back to, you know, I go back to my cell. Uh, after the three or four days, I go back and um, the eventually I get my PSI. My PSI says 36, it says 32 years to life is what it says. 
Now, I'd also been interviewed by Dateline. At this point, Dateline had come out. The one-hour special came out, and it was horrible. It was called The Thief of Hearts. And it was the person they mainly interviewed was uh, Rebecca Halk. Rebecca basically said, look, Matt Cox is a, is a con man. He convinced me to commit crimes. I'm innocent. I didn't really know what I was doing. He's a Don Juan. He, he forced me to fall in love with him. Uh, you know, it, just, it, was just, it was just complete bullshit. But the one thing that was true that she said was, I'm charismatic, which is true. I'm very charismatic. Charming. She said charming. Charming came up a lot. Anyway, uh, so what, what happened with that was that Dateline had come out, but Dateline also, I'd been caught. So they wanted to interview me. So they came, they got the U.S. attorney to, um, uh, they got the U.S. attorney to be interviewed, the Secret Service agent, and they came into the prison and they interviewed me. The U.S. attorney's office asked me to be interviewed by Dateline, which I was, inv- inter- I was interviewed by them. I didn't want to be interviewed, but they told me if you're interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. Substantial assistance means you've cooperated with the government and they can reduce your sentence as a result of it. They said if you're interviewed, we'll consider it substantial assistance. So I was interviewed by them. I was also interviewed by the FBI and the Secret Service, which also was supposed to be considered substantial assistance. They said we'll consider that substantial assistance. Fine. So the night before... I'm about to be sentenced. I call my lawyer and I said, hey, what's going on? How much time am I going to get? Because I have a pre-sentence report that says 32 years to life. Now, we had negotiated after I got that 32 years to life. I was like, well, I'm not going to plead guilty. I want to take my plea back because I might as well go to trial. That's the maximum sentence you can give me is 30 years is bank fraud. Maximum you can get on bank fraud is 30 years. Max, and then I got an extra two years for aggravated identity theft. So it's 32 years to life. I'm like, the maximum sentence you can give me 32 years. So why would I plead guilty? I might as well go to trial. I, if, if I lose, I can only get 32 years to life. So they said, look, what do you think doesn't apply to you? So they actually sent the Secret Service agent down to the prison with my lawyer and we argued for about 30 minutes to get it from 32 years down to 26 years and four months. But my lawyer kept telling me, don't worry when we get in front of the judge, I'm going to argue these enhancements and I'm going to get them taken off and you're going to end up with 13 years, 12, 10, 12 to 13 years. Okay. So the night before my sentencing, we've already agreed to 26 years and four months. But I'm supposed to get, I'm also supposed to get a sentence reduction and my lawyer is going to argue to reduce my enhancements. So I call her up and I said, hey, what did the U.S. attorney say? And she says, oh, Matt, I'm so sorry. They're not going to recommend a reduction in your sentence. They're going to recommend you get 26 years and four months. But don't worry. I'm going to argue the enhancements and you're probably going to end up with 12 or 13 years. I was like, why wouldn't, why aren't they going to recommend that I get a reduction? I was interviewed by the FBI, by the Secret Service, and I was interviewed by Dateline. And she said, I know, but Matt, nobody's been arrested. And that's really what a reduction is, where you cooperate and someone's been, someone's been arrested. And nobody's been arrested on your case by in, based on anything that you said. But don't worry, they're going to investigate and those people will be arrested. And at that time, they'll reduce your sentence. So tomorrow, you're probably going to end up with 12 or 13 years. And then later, when you get to prison, your sentence will probably be cut down again, maybe even by half. And I thought, oh, my God. I mean, first of all, it doesn't really matter what I thought. That's what was happening. Like, you can't say, oh, forget it. I don't want to be sentenced. No, you're going to sentencing tomorrow. So you just deal with it. So the next day, I go to sentencing. I'm led into the courtroom. The U.S. attorney goes on and on and on about all of these. Mr. Cox did this. Mr. Cox did that. She provides like a 40-page timeline of all these things that I had done. Once I went on the run, it's 42 pages of fraud, not including a small summary of three or four pages from when I was in Tampa. And that's the bulk of my crime was in Tampa. So, plus I got my PSI. My PSI is like 52 pages, which is massive. Most PSIs are five pages, 10. Um, anyway, I get in front of the judge. 
U.S. attorney says that I'm a complete scoundrel, scumbag, uh, con man, can't be trusted, have to be taken out of society to protect society. My attorney gets up and says that he's really just he's just a misunderstood guy. Uh, and, uh, you know, the judge read some letters from my friends and family. I remember my uncle wrote a letter. And he's a lawyer. And I remember he said to the judge that Mr. Cox is an extremely disturbed person. <laughs> and, then, and I remember thinking... Like, when my lawyer read it, she was like, Mr. Cox has always had problems. He's always had um, issues with, like, he, he, like, this is a guy that I saw once a year, maybe. And he starts explaining that I've had, I've always had uh, emotional problems. I've always had learning disabilities. I've struggled growing up, struggled in school, and that I, I'm an extremely, and, and that I, from what he can tell, I'm a disturbed person. But out of love for his sister, my mother, he's writing this letter and asking for a lenient sentence. And I mean, it was like, it was like, it was the worst letter this is a defense attorney it was the worst letter you could have possibly written from an officer of the court saying this guy has problems <laughs> that's my uncle he's a douchebag and just a complete scoundrel and scumbag and always has been really to be honest did you know this is a guy by the way this is a guy that graduated first in his class in law school Ended up being a bottom of the barrel attorney, really. Like doing wills. He does wills. He does real estate. He does some some criminal law. He does some like it's like you were the top of your class, and you were doing bottom of the barrel law work. And he wrote this fucking letter that just was horrible. Like my attorney was like, you know, I don't even think I want to send this to the judge. She's like, I talked to him on the phone, like. I don't understand. I tried to, she tried to call, talk to him and be like, what did you write? Like she called, she was so bad. My public, my, 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 um, public defender called him to be like, what did you do? This is your letter? Anyway, and she gave it to the, to the judge though. She did give it to the judge. I mean, look, it didn't matter. It didn't matter what he said because I was done. So the judge has read all these letters and the judge, I remember the judge said, that Mr. Cox, what Mr. Cox did was borderline sociopathic in nature. Oh, I mean, he, listen, I wish I had the transcript. It was scathing what he said to me. And honestly, probably pretty accurate. But that's not the point. Point, it was harsh. It was harsh. It was, you know, you see that guy on TikTok, there's emotional damage. That guy that, you know, emotion. that's how I felt. Like, oh my God, this is a federal judge. Like he really, whew, he was bad. Anyway, I ended up not getting the reduction and I ended up getting, um, I got 26 years and four months. I typically don't say 20, the four months. I typically say I got 26 years because if you say 26 years and four months, it, it sounds like I'm whining. You know, it's saying like, oh, 20, like four months, like that was overkill. But really, the 26 years in general was overkill. So I got 26 years and four months. And um, yeah, I tried to, uh, you know, I've, obviously I stood up and I gave him my little, hey, oh God, did I, I didn't even tell you about my aunt. My aunt stood up and spoke for me. My aunt said it was a, wa she was a taxpayer and it was a waste of taxpayer money to put me in jail for, for that long. I mean, that's not really an argument. That I'm a taxpayer, Your Honor, and it's a waste of taxpayer of my tax dollars to put him in jail. <laughs> what? What? I look. She's also has a lot of money. She does. She and my my uncle uh, is extremely wealthy, and she very much feels like anyone that works for the government is like um, a servant. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Yeah, is is subservient, or they are someone who works for her. Like. She, these are not people that, you know, people of means feel like you, the, the people that work for the government are subservient. So she's basically lecture, almost kind of came off like a lecture to the judge. Like, Your Honor, it's a waste of my money. Like, 
you, you need to listen up. I'm <laughs> anyway. Yeah, it was bad. Uh, so that didn't help. Uh, really, I had nobody that really helped me. Nothing. Any, it wouldn't have mattered. It, it, the per, anybody could have stood up. They could have been perfectly eloquent. It didn't matter. My PSI said 26 years. You get 26 years. So he gave me 26 years and four months. Um, I tried to talk. I cried like a fucking small child. Uh, then on my way, after I got the 26 years and I was leaving, I don't think I, I stopped crying. Until I got to the U to down to the to the um probably the the U.S. Marshals like the holding cell, and when I walked in, I remember there was this there's a bunch of you know there's a bunch of tough guys, but there was this one guy that was like, uh, a, just this flamboyant gay guy, and when I walked in, I had just got control of myself, and I walked in, and one of the guys goes, "How much you get?" Like, they, like you go to a holding cell where you're waiting to be put on the bus to be driven back to the U.S. Marshal, to the Marshal holdover. And he looks at me and goes, what'd they, what'd they give you? And I go, Tw over 26 years. And the gay guy goes, oh my God. They, <laughs> oh my God. They didn't, the, the judge didn't throw the book at you. He jumped over the, uh, he jumped over the bench and bludgeoned you to death with it. Oh my God. And I just was thinking... I mean, even even in the gay guy's voice, it sounded brutal. I mean, he did he he did the whole oh my you know, the whole way it was fucking it's just it's a, just a bad day. It was a bad day. Yeah, I got twenty six years, and uh, so then I go back to the. It's so funny too because when I went back to the to the marshals holdover, and they dropped me off and everything. Th this is funny because I remember I got. I was, we were all let in, in and there's like 10 of us and we're sitting there chained up. And I remember they were calling four o'clock count and they go, you know, Johnson, you know, Thomas. And when they got to me, they go, you know, Cox. And there was an officer Cox. Now keep in mind the staff in Atlanta, all the officers were black. So when they got to me and, and he goes, he goes, Cox. And I went here. And he goes, Cox, he goes, you're not related to Officer Cox, are you? And all the officers start laughing. And I go, well, my dad did get around a lot when he was younger. We may be related. Like that. And the officers all stopped laughing and all the inmates started laughing. Um, so, yeah, they, they called me out. They, they called out a roll call. They brought us upstairs. I walked into the unit once again. I was in control of myself again. And when I walked in, there's about 100 guys in that unit. And as soon as I walked in, everybody looks over at me because I'd just been on TV where they'd said I got 26 years and four months on television. Like they, they, my roommate told me, bro, they, they, it just went off television. Like the 6 o'clock news or the 5 o'clock news, it just said it. And as soon as it was done, they popped the door and we all walk in and they uh, like, we're talking about like a hundred guys looked at me at once, boom, and looked at me and they were just like shaking their head. Boom. I immediately start crying again, immediately hit me again. So I go to my cell, I walk in, I have like maybe 10 guys come in going, bro, it's going to be okay. It's okay. You're, you're going to be okay. You can appeal it. You can this, you can that. All of that's not true. Um, but you know, this is the things that people tell you to try and, you know, get you through it and make themselves feel better, I guess. Uh, so yeah, that was a bad day. About 10 days later, I was placed on a bus and I was driven to the medium security prison at Coleman, in Coleman, Florida. Coleman, Florida, the complex. There's a Coleman, Florida, it's a complex. And it's the largest prison complex in the United States. It's got two penitentiaries, which, you know, two pens. And it's got a medium security prison, a low security prison, and a camp which at that time was a, was for females. So it was all male except for the camp, which was females. It's now male. Uh, I was placed in the medium. This is funny. When I got there, I remember you know, they, inter they interview you, and they were interviewing me. And I remember the guy from SIS, which is internal security for them. They kind of, they're like the internal FBI for them. The guy was interviewing me, and he goes, yeah, bro. He's like, you shouldn't even be here. Like, you're at a medium security prison. Like, this is for violent inmates and stuff and guys that have life sentences. And he was like, yeah, you really shouldn't even be here, Cox. But you have so much time. You have to go to a medium. You have to. 
You have to be below 20 years to go to a low. And even with good time, my out date was 2030. Like I still had 24 years to go. With no good time, my out date was like 2035 or something. Or no, sorry, like 2032 or something like that. So my out date was 2030. And this was in 2006. No, 2007 because it took a year. So late 2007 was when I was sentenced. Um, I was arrested um, in 2000, late 2006. So this is late 2007. I'm at the medium. And I remember the guy said, I said, hey, can I call somebody? And I called my mother. This is what a gangster my mom is, bro. So this is my mom. When I called her, she said, I said, hi, mom. And she was like, oh, Matthew, how are, are you okay? I was like, I'm fine. I said, she goes, where are you? I said, I'm, I'm at Coleman Prison. And she goes, are you at the medium or are you at the low? What the fuck? Like, I didn't even know. I didn't know anything about Coleman. And she goes, are you at the medium or the low? And I went, I'm, I'm. I'm at the medium. And she goes, she goes, okay, I need you to look up your, your cousin Reese. His name is Reese Townsend. He's Jack's cousin. And I went, Jack has a cousin in prison? She goes, yes. She said, I said, well, he's not my cousin. And she goes, well, for, it, for all intensive purposes in this situation in prison, he's your cousin. So he works in, she goes, he works in, um, he works on the on the uh, he works in maintenance. She goes. He works in the maintenance crew. Uh, he's in one of the units. Ask ask around. You'll find him. He's gonna take care of you. And I was like, uh, okay. She goes, okay. I'll be up to see you in about a, in about a, a few weeks. I have to get placed on your visitation list. Like my mom knows how prison works better than I do. Within a couple of days, I find I tra- uh, Reese tracks me down. And uh, my mom shows up a couple weeks later. I remember the first day. I'll tell you the first day story, and then that that's then I gotta I gotta end this. The first day I'm there, I go to pill line, right? Because I'm I'm at this point I'm so stressed out and anxiety and and just I'm just dying. Like I'm taking Paxil. It's uh, like an anxiety drug. So I go to pill line, and I go there and I get my Paxil. You have to take a pill. They won't give you a bottle because you know we're your children. So I take the Paxil and I'm walking back and I go to walk in the unit and there's a Sally ports, right? So you have to stop, you go in one door and then they have to open the other door, let you in. So I'm standing there with this black guy and I, and this is how absurd the situation is. And this is how foreign it is to me, even though I've already been locked up a year, but this is how foreign the environment is and how unprepared I am. I, as I walk up, I go to grab the door and it's locked. And I, I pat my pants and I go, man, I don't have the key, my key. You got your key to the black guy. And he goes, man, I ain't no snitch. Motherfucker, I ain't no snitch. Boy, he said, I'll show my paperwork. I ain't no snitch, motherfucker. And I went, whoa, 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 whoa. I go, bro, what, 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 what are you talking about? And he's sitting there and he's looking at me and he goes, man, you, what are you trying to say? And I said, I, bro, I don't know what the deal is, man. And he looks at me and he goes, Man, you just get here? And I went, yeah, bro, I just got here today. And he looked at me and he goes, man, he said, I go, what did I say? And he goes, man, you asked me if I got the keys. And I went, yeah, because the door's locked. And he goes, nah, man, that's like you calling me a snitch. Only the police got the got the keys. Only Popo got the keys. I ain't got no keys. Only snitches got the keys. And I went, oh, wow, bro, listen, man, I got no, I had no idea. That's what, I didn't know how you were going to take that. I was just playing around. He goes, man, you got to watch yourself, man. You're going to get hurt. You're going to get hurt. Listen, bro, it, it was that bad. Like, I mean, I walked in and I had a celly. They assigned me a celly. And we're talking very quickly when I got there, very quickly, they start, they start screaming over the loudspeaker, recall, recall, and guys start running around the unit, grabbing stuff, doing this, microwaving stuff, screaming. The cops are screaming, get in your cell, get in your cell, and they walk to the front, first cell and lock it, second cell and lock it. Guys are running, and Scott, I'm standing there looking around while they're screaming, recall. Well, my celly was a Mexican. He comes running up to me and goes, he goes, hey, man, you got to get in the cell, Cox, we got to go in the, we got to go, he goes, bunky, bunky. We got to go to the cell. We got to go to the cell. And I'm like, what's going on? What's going on? He's somebody got stabbed in the yard, man. I go, oh my God, someone got killed in the yard. He goes, nah, man, they didn't get killed. They just got stabbed up a little bit. Let's go. And I thought, this is a place where he said, got stabbed up a little. They just stabbed him up a little bit. 
Like that's where you're at. You can get stabbed up over a gambling debt. Like somebody owes somebody $20 and won't pay him. He gets stabbed up a little bit in the yard. Like there's no little bit of stabbing in my opinion. So, or you say the wrong thing and some guy's ready to fight you because I was joking around saying, hey, do you have your keys? I mean, it was, it was such a foreign environment. And uh, ultimately, I get my sentence cut twice. And I'm going to do another segment of videos where I explain how I got my sentence cut. And it is extremely interesting and devious and, um, yeah, it's, uh, and, and telling. So if you like the video, do me a favor and, uh, subscribe, hit the bell. So you get notified, leave me a comment and I'm going to go back to the beginning and watch them all over again. We're going to put them in a, um, in a playlist so that you can watch the videos and I appreciate you watching. And basically that's my story up until the point where I got to prison and really appreciate you watching and see ya.